Chapter One of the Old Tobacco Shop. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Old Tobacco Shop by William Bowen. Chapter One. Mr. Punch and the Clock Tower. When the little boy first went to the old tobacco shop, he stood a long while before going in, to look at the wooden figure which stood beside the door. His father was sitting at home in his carpet slippers, waiting for tobacco for his pipe, but when the little boy saw the wooden figure, he forgot all about hurrying. "'Now don't be long,' his mother had said, and his father had said, "'Hurry back!' But he forgot all about hurrying and stood and looked at the wooden figure a long time. A little hunchbacked man, not so very much taller than himself, on a low wooden box, holding out in one hand a packet of black wooden cigars. His back was terribly humped up between his shoulders. His face was square and bony, if wood can be said to be bony. He was bareheaded and bald-headed. He had a wide mouth, and his high nose curved down over it, and his pointed chin curved up under it, and his breast stuck out in front almost as much as his shoulders stuck out behind. The little boy's name was Freddy. His mother called him that, and his father usually called him Fred. But sometimes his father called him Frederick. In fact, whenever he didn't come back after he had been told to hurry, and then his father looked at him, you know that look, and said, frederick just like that but his mother never called him anything but freddy even when he was late he grasped his money tight in his hand as he had been told to do and stood and looked at the little hunchbacked wooden man holding out his packet of black wooden cigars i wonder thought freddy what makes him so crooked he walked around him and looked at his back he walked around in front of him again and wondered if the black cigars in his hand would smoke. He decided he would ask about it. The little man wore blue knee breeches and black stockings and buckled shoes, and his coat was cut away in front over his stomach, and he had two tails behind, down to his knees. It was easy to see that he wasn't a boy, though, even if he did wear knee breeches. You only had to look at his face, for he had the kind of hard boniness in his face that grown-ups have. Freddy made up his mind that he liked him anyway, and it must have been hard to have to stand out there all day without moving, rain or shine, and offer that bunch of cigars to all the people who went by, and never get a single soul to take them. Freddy put out his other hand, not the one with the money in it, towards the cigars, but he quickly drew it back for he looked at the little man's face at the same time, and there was something about his eyes. Anyhow, he stood back a little. "'Better be careful of Mr. Punch, young feller,' said a deep voice from the shop door. Freddy looked, and in the doorway, leaning against the doorpost, with his hands in his trousers' pockets and one foot crossed over the other, stood a little man, not so very much taller than himself, and certainly no taller than the figure on the stand who stared at Freddy as if he knew all about human boys, and he did not trust them out of his sight. Freddy looked at him, and then at the wooden figure beside the door. They might have been brothers. The little man had a hump on his back, and his breast stuck out in front. His head was big and square, and he had high cheekbones. His face was bony, and his mouth wide, and his big nose curved down, and his chin curved up but he did not wear knee-breeches. His trousers were the trousers of grown-ups, and his coat was a square coat, buttoned tight over his chest from top to bottom. He was bareheaded, and he had plenty of hair, brushed from the top of his head down towards his forehead. He looked as if he belonged to the tobacco shop, or perhaps the tobacco shop belonged to him. He stared at Freddy without blinking, and there was something in his eyes. Anyway, Freddy stepped back, and held his money tighter in his hand behind him. "'You'd better stay away from Mr. Punch,' said the hunchbacked man, without moving. "'Yes, sir,' said Freddy. "'Did you say why? Because you know I'm terrible deaf, and can't never hear boys when they talk down in their stomachs. I'll tell you why, as long as you ask me. 
Do you see that clock on the church tower over there? He nodded his big wooden head up the street without taking his hands from his pockets. Freddy looked, and there the clock was, plain enough. Well, said the hunchbacked man, and I'll tell you, seeing as you insist upon it, and won't take no for an answer, but you mustn't never tell it to no one. Do you promise me that? Cross your heart? Yes, sir, said Freddy. Done, said the hunchback. Mr. Punch's father lived up there behind that clock, and sometimes, just exactly when the two hands of that clock come together, one on top of the other, mind you, like you lay one stick along another, Mr. Punch's father comes out and stands on that there sill under the clock. He's a little old man with a long white beard, and he stands there and puts his hand to his mouth and calls down here to Mr. Punch, and Mr. Punch climbs down off his little perch and goes over to that church and climbs up the inside of that tower to the very top and meets his father. And I've heard tell they have regular high jinks up there all by themselves and victuals, more victuals and drinks than you have ever seen at one time. Yes, sir. A regular feast, as sure as you're born, and they don't only eat victuals. No, sir. If they can only get hold of a nice plump little boy or two with plenty of meat to him, that's what they like best. And if it happens to be night time, there's a lot of queer ones with them up there and all sorts of queer noises. You ask the sexton over there about it. He's heard them. And if you should just happen to be around when Mr. Punch climbs down off this here perch, you'd better look out, for he's just as likely as not to snatch you up and carry you off with him up there into that church tower to his father. And if he does that, that's the last of you. And your ma and your pa could cry their eyes out, and it wouldn't be no use. You'd be gone, and never come back no more. They say there's many a boy been took up into that tower by Mr. Punch here, when his father comes out and calls him. But he don't always come out when the hands of the clock come together. Nobody ever knows when he's going to do it. No, sirree. Mr. Punch himself never knows when his father's going to call him. Lord bless us, said the little hunchback, looking up again in alarm at the clock in the church tower. Lord bless us, look at that. Freddy stared at the clock. It was twenty-five minutes past five. He knew how to tell twelve o'clock and ten minutes to ten, but he had never got as far as twenty-five minutes past five. He could easily see, however, that the big hand was almost on top of the little hand. He edged away further from the wooden figure on the box. He was almost sure that the hand which held the cigars moved a little. The hunchbacked man in the doorway stood up straight on his two feet and took his hands out of his pockets. "'Look alive, young feller,' he said. "'It's pretty near time. In another minute. I can't help it if Mr. Punch's father comes out and... "'Quick, boy, come here to me before it's too late. I'll see if I can save you.' Freddy gave another look at the clock. The hands were surely almost together, and quick as a flash he he darted to the hunchback and hid behind him and held on to his coat, peeping around him through the doorway. The little man put his arm about Freddy and held him close. It was a strong, muscular arm, and Freddy felt quite safe. The little man could not have been laughing, for his face was as solemn and wooden-looking as ever, but Freddy could feel his body shaking all over. He couldn't tell why. "'You'd better come in and see Aunt Amanda,' he said, "'before it's too late. You'll be safe in there.' He took Freddy by the hand and drew him into the shop. The old tobacco shop stands at the corner of two streets, as you surely must know if you have ever been in the city that lies on the river called Patapsco, which runs along ever so far out of a great bay where ships sail from all over the world, called Chesapeake Bay. It is an old brick house, and you go into the shop by the door that opens in the side, just round the corner, not in the front, for there isn't any door at the front, but only a window with pipes and cigars and tobacco in it, and the stuffed head of a bulldog with a pipe in his mouth. The house is only one story and a half high, and has a steep gabled roof with two dormer windows in the slope of the roof above the side of the house, and the dormer window in the slope of the roof above the shop window in front, where the bulldog is. All the other houses fronting in the row are good high two-story houses. 
Why this corner house never grew up like the others, no one knows. When Freddy was standing at the corner of the street before he had seen the wooden figure offering his bundle of wooden cigars there beside the door, he looked down the street that runs along the side of the shop, across the street that crosses it, and saw the masts of tall ships in the harbour beside the wharves. Some with their sails up, some with their sails hanging most untidily, and some with their sails neatly rolled up and tied. And he would certainly have gone down there, only his father had told him to hurry. Freddy lived in a fine two-storey brick house in a row like this one, a long, long way off, three squares off. They say squares in that city when they mean a straight line between two streets, and not a square at all, down the same street on which the old tobacco shop fronts. And it really takes a good while to go all that way, for there is a boy halfway down, a big boy, who belongs to a gang, and likes to bully little boys, and you have to watch your chance to get out of his way. And there is a place with a knot hole in the fence where you can see all kinds of rusty springs and bed rails and bird cages and barrel hoops piled up inside the yard, and a tin can factory where you can pick up little round pieces of tin just as good as dollars, and a church where the clock is, with a fat old man sitting on the pavement in a chair tilted back against the church wall smoking a long pipe, who doesn't mind being stared at from the curbstone, and a street car track where you have to look out for the horse car, which is very dangerous when the horse begins to trot, and... But Freddy hadn't lived long in his fine two-story house in that street, and these things were new to him and took time. But the newest and biggest thing he had yet found, not that it was really big, you know, was the wooden hunchback outside the door of the old tobacco shop, and you have seen how much time that took. Freddy found himself inside the shop, and his hand grasped tight by the big strong hand of the hunchback, so tight that he wriggled a little to get loose, but the hunchback only held him tighter. "'Come along,' he said. you better come in here and see my Aunt Amanda, or Mr. Punch may step out and get you. And then where would you be?' Freddy looked back out of doors over his shoulder, but it did not seem as if Mr. Punch meant to step out that time. He breathed easier. The shop was a very little shop, with shelves on the wall behind the counter, and a window in front where he saw the back of the bulldog's head. The two showcases on the counter were full of pipes of all kinds, and cigars and tobacco and cigarettes. And piled on the shelves were boxes of cigars and jars and tins of tobacco. And on the wooden top of the counter between the two showcases stood a tobacco cutter, and a little pair of scales with a scoop lying beside it, and little iron weights in a box. The counter ran from the front window lengthwise to the back of the shop, and at the back, on your left as you went in, was a closed door. A wooden chair with arms stood beside the front window. You could get behind the counter only by a swinging gate at the back end. There was a delightful warm odour about the place, very much the same odour Freddy liked to smell when his father opened his old tobacco box on the mantelpiece in the sitting-room upstairs and filled his pipe. When he came home in the evening and put on his carpet slippers and spread out that everlasting newspaper that had no pictures in it, he could never understand why his mother opened all the windows the next morning. "'All right, young feller,' said the hunchback. "'We'll get on the other side of that door, and then we'll be safe. Here we are.' They reached the door at the back of the shop, and the hunchback opened it and pulled Freddy into the back room and closed the door behind him. Freddy hung back a little, but his hand was gripped tight, and he couldn't have got away if he had tugged with all his might. He was not so much afraid now of Mr. Punch and his father, but he didn't know what this little man was going to do with him, and besides, his father had told him to hurry. In this back room, near a window which looked out on the street, sat a lady. The hunchback marched Freddy up to her and stopped there before her, and wagged his head sideways towards the little boy. The hunchback and the little boy stood hand in hand, and the lady looked at them steadily. End of chapter 1「Chapter 2 of the Old Tobacco Shop This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Old Tobacco Shop by William Bowen Chapter 2 Aunt Amanda and the Two Old Codgers Here's Aunt Amanda, said the hunchback, standing before the lady who was sitting near the window and letting go of Freddy's hand. And here's a boy that Mr. Punch pretty near got hold of, if I hadn't come along just in time, and hustled him in here. Just look out of that window, Aunt Amanda, and see if Mr. Punch has moved yet. The lady did not look out of the window, but stared at Freddy with her mouth shut tight. She had very thin lips, and she pressed them tight together, and without opening them more than a wee mite, she said to the hunchback sternly, "'Oh, be lie lucky, you mump to on you ricks. Freddy could not understand this at all. He looked at her closely. She was very thin and had a high beaked nose and reddish hair and a reddish skin, and on the left side of her chin was a mole with three little reddish hairs sticking out of it. She wore a rusty black dress, very tight above the waist and very wide below, and in the bosom of this dress were sticking dozens, maybe hundreds, for all Freddy could tell, of pins and needles. She must have been very tall when she stood up. A cane leaned against the back of her chair. She was a little lame, not very lame, but enough to make her limp when she walked, and to make her cane useful in getting about. If she had had a stiff starched ruff about her neck and a lace thing on her head pointed in front, she would have done very well for Queen Elizabeth, the one you see the picture of in that history book. There was a thimble on the second finger of her right hand, and a pair of scissors hung by a tape at her waist, and around her neck she wore a measuring tape. On the floor at her feet lay a pile of goods, and some of it was in her lap, the kind of goods that Mother has around her when she is turning and making over that old blue serge, and gathers up out of Father's way when she hears him coming in towards the sitting-room. At Aunt Amanda's elbow stood an oval, marble-topped table, and beside a work-basket there were several fascinating things on it. In the centre was a glass dome, and under the glass dome was the most beautiful basket of wax flowers, calla lilies mostly, with a wonderful yellow spike like a finger sticking up out of each one. On one side of the wax flowers was a thick book with blue plush covers, and the word album across it in slanting gold letters. On the other side was a kind of a, well, it had a handle under a piece of wood to hold it up by, and a frame at one end to stick up a picture in, and two pieces of thick glass in a frame at the other end to look through at the picture and make the picture look all, you know, as if the people in the back were a long way behind and the people in front close up in front and all that. Freddy's father had one. The chairs in the room had thin, curved legs and those slippery horsehair seats which Freddy hated to sit on. On the walls were portraits in oval frames of men with chin whiskers and no moustaches, and ladies in shawls and bonnets. But there was one square frame, and it had no picture under the glass, but a sheaf of real wheat standing up as natural as life, with some kind of curly writing over it. It was simply beautiful. There was a clock on the marble mantelpiece, tall and square-cornered, with a clear circle in the glass below where you could see the round weight of the pendulum go back and forth, and a picture of the sun on the face, very red, with a big nose and eyes and stiff red hair floating off from it. Aunt Amanda stuck a pin in the goods in her lap and folded her hands. Freddy, after glancing around the room, looked at her again and wondered who she was. Plain sewing she was, that was sure, also an aunt, and besides that, though Freddy did not know it, she was an old, I hate to say it, though it wasn't anything really against her, if you come to that, an old, well, you know what you call them, behind their backs, or shout after them as they go down the street and then whip around the corner when they turn, just simply because they haven't ever been married, like mother. Well then, an old maid. Being an old maid, she of course wore no wedding ring, but on her wedding finger, the third finger of her left hand, there was a mark at the place where a wedding ring would have been, a kind of birthmark, ruby red, in shape and size like the ruby stone of a ring. Freddy looked at it often afterwards. 
"'Now you look here, Aunt Amanda,' said her nephew, taking hold of Freddy's hand again. "'You know well enough I can't understand you with all them pins.' Aunt Amanda put a hand to her lips and drew out of her mouth a pin and stuck it in the bosom of her dress. She put her hand to her lips again and drew forth another pin and stuck it in the bosom of her dress. She drew forth another and another and stuck each one in her dress. Freddy's eyes opened wide. Did this lady eat pins? Her mouth seemed to be full of them. Didn't they hurt? It didn't seem possible she could eat them. And yet, there they were. No wonder she couldn't talk plainly. There seemed to be no end to the pins. But there was, and at last her mouth was clear of them so that she could talk. Toby Littleback, said she, you're up to one of your tricks again. Ain't you ashamed of yourself? That was what she had meant by saying, Oh, belly lucky, you mupped one, Eurix, with her mouth full of pins. Toby was quite crestfallen. Well, he said, I guess it ain't no hanging matter. All I done was to bring the boy in to see you, and this is what I get for it every time. I ain't a-going to bring him in any more. That's flat. Let go of the child, said Aunt Amanda sharply. Can't you see you're hurting his hand? Come here, boy. Mr. Littleback dropped Freddy's hand and walked over to the table beside his aunt. Freddy came forward timidly and stood at Aunt Amanda's knee. She examined him carefully. "'It's the best one yet,' she said. "'Boy, do you know you're as pretty as a... "'Well, anyway, what is your name?' If there was one thing Freddy loathed, it was to be called pretty. He had heard it before in the parlour at home when he had been trotted out to be inspected by female visitors, and he had tried many a time to scrub off the rosy redness from his cheeks. But he had found it only made it worse.' He hung his head a little and could not find his voice. Aunt Amanda took his chin in her hand and gently held up his head. "'It's all right, my dear,' said she. "'What is your name now?' "'Fweddy,' said the little boy. "'It ain't neither,' cried Mr. Littleback. "'There ain't no such name. It's Freddy. Come on now, say Freddy.' "'Fweddy,' said the little boy. "'No, no,' cried Toby. "'Try it again now. Say Freddy.' Toby, said Aunt Amanda, shut up. Freddy, I haven't any little boy, and I don't get out very much, and I'd like you to come and see me sometimes. Would you like to do that? Freddy stared at her and said, Yes, sir. I hope you will, often. Be sure you do. I suppose you don't like gingerbread. Toby? The little hunchback went out briskly through a back door and returned with a slice of gingerbread. "'Baked today,' said his aunt. "'But what time is it? Quarter to six? Too near supper time. "'You mustn't eat it now, Freddy. Toby, wrap it up.' "'Toby went into the shop and returned with a paper sack, "'and putting the gingerbread into it gave it to Freddy. "'Now,' said Aunt Amanda, "'take it home with you and eat it after supper. "'Will you come to see me?' "'Yes, am said Freddy, as if he meant it. "'You couldn't get gingerbread at home between meals every day in the week.' "'That's a good boy. Now, run away home.' "'Please, sir,' said Freddy, holding out the money in his hand. "'My father wants half a pound of Cage Roach Michener. "'What?' "'Oh,' said Toby. "'I see. Half a pound of stagecoach mixture. "'All right, young feller. Come along into the shop.' "'Good-bye, Freddy, and don't break the gingerbread before you get home,' said Aunt Amanda." "'taking into her mouth a palm full of pins "'with a back toss of her head. "'Had she swallowed them?' "'Freddy stared at her in alarm. "'Ain't you never coming for the tobacco?' said Toby. "'I can't keep all them customers in the shop waiting all day.' "'Freddy followed him into the shop. "'You'll have to wait your turn, young feller, said Toby. "'I can't keep these customers waiting no longer. "'What shall you have, Mr. Applejohn?' "'Freddy looked around for Mr. Applejohn, but so far as he could see, there was no one in the shop but himself and Mr. Littleback. The hunchback went through the swinging gate and stood behind the counter, and looking over it, his head and shoulders just came over the top, at Mr. Applejohn. "'No,' said Toby, "'we're just out of it. Very sorry. But I have something just as good. No? Well, then, come around tomorrow. Yes, sir. Between ten and eleven. 
Now then, Tom, it's your turn. You want what? No, sir, I won't sell no cigarettes to no boy, so you can clear out. You ought to be ashamed of yourself smoking cigarettes at your age. No use arguing, I won't do it. You can get right out of here. The big wooden-looking head winked an eye at Freddy. That's the way I treat him. Did you see how it skipped off in a hurry? You saw him go, didn't you? Freddy looked at the door. He hadn't seen anybody, and after all that talk there must have been somebody there. He couldn't be sure. Probably he had been mistaken about it. Grown-up people ought to know what they were talking about. Perhaps he had seen somebody. He hesitated. I think so. I believe so. Yes, sir. Don't you fool yourself, young man. You can't smoke cigarettes if you ever want to grow up. Look at me. Do you see this? He turned his back and reached over his shoulder to his hump. Cigarettes. That's what done it. Cigarettes. I smoked em along with my bottle of milk regular when I was a kid. And look at me now, not much bigger than Mr. Punch out there. Cigarettes. Maybe you might think it was the bottle of milk done it instead of the cigarettes, being as they was at the same time. But don't you never believe it. Cigarettes, you keep off em. Now, pipe tobacco, that's a different thing. If only I'd stuck to a pipe along with that bottle of milk. Look how high I'd have been now. What kind of tobacco did you say your father wanted? Housewife's favourite? No, sir, said Freddy. My father wants a half a pound of cage roach minchner. That's it, said Toby. I don't see how I come to forget that name. Your father's a man of good common sense. Nothing like cage roach. Here it is. He turned to the shelf behind him and mounted a little ladder and took down a large tin. While he was scooping out the tobacco at the counter and weighing it on the scales and doing it up, he was singing to himself, and Freddy stared at him with rapt attention. Some day, said Mr. Littleback, without pausing in his work or looking at Freddy, them eyes o' yourn will pop right out of your head if you ain't careful. Did you ever hear that song? No, sir, said Freddy. Would you like to hear it? Yes, sir, said Freddy. It's about two old codgers, friends of mine. They come in here regular. One of them's a good customer and pays spot cash. The other one never buys nothing, and I can't say which one of them I like worse. Anyway, here's how it goes. Oh, there was an old codger, and he had a wooden leg, and he never bought tobacco when tobacco he could beg. Don't you never let yourself get into that habit, young man. Always buy your tobacco fair and square. I've known em, this feller, and many another one. Never have a grain of tobacco left in their pouch. Just use up the very last bit two minutes before, and always a begging a pipeful. I'm right here in my own shop, too, where I sell tobacco, mind you. I'd like em better if they sneaked in and stole it, I would, any day. But the other one? I don't know that I'd want to be him, neither, if I had to choose between em, however. Another old codger, as sly as a fox, and he always had tobacco in his old tobacco box. Count on him for that. He never begs no tobacco, nor gives away none either. However, he ain't such a general nuisance as the other one, and he pays spot cash. I'll have to say that much for him. But in spite of everything and all, I can't seem to make myself care for him much, anyway. Said the one old codger, when you give me a chew, said the other old codger, I'll be hanged if I do. They're a fine pair now, ain't they? One of them's a nuisance and the other one a grouch. You'll see em both here in my shop one of these days when you're visiting Aunt Amanda and one of them times. You see the way I bounce that boy that wanted cigarettes, didn't you? Well, that's what I'm going to do to them two old codgers one of these days. You watch and see if I don't. Yes, sir, both of em, as sure as I've got a hump on my back. But it's pretty good advice, after all, what the song says. So save up your pennies and put away your rock, and you'll always have tobacco in your old tobacco box. Here's your cage, Roach. Give me your money. There's your change. Five, ten, fifteen, seventeen. Now run along. Come back again. What did you say your name was? Freddy. You mean Freddy, don't you? Yes, sir. Why don't you say what you mean? Well, Freddy, there's plenty of tobacco left in this shop, so you can come in whenever the old tobacco box at home runs out. And don't forget to come in to see Aunt Amanda. Plenty of goods left in the shop whenever. You see all that? He pointed up towards the shelves. I'll tell you something I ain't told to, but mighty few people before. 
There's a jar of smoking tobacco up there that's just plain magic. Magic. You know what that means? Freddy started and looked up at the shelves in alarm. He nodded. It's that one. On the middle shelf. The Chinaman's head. Do you see it? He pointed to a white porcelain jar shaped like a human head. Freddy could see that it was the head of some foreign kind of man with a little round blue cap on top which was probably the lid that tobacco in that chinaman's head is magic as sure as you're alive i wouldn't smoke it if you give me all the plum puddings in this city next christmas no sir and i wouldn't allow nobody else to smoke it neither i just naturally wouldn't dare to do you know where that tobacco come from a sailor off one of them ships down there in the harbour that come all the way from china yes sir china give it to me once for a quid of plug cut what you might call broke he was and it wasn't any use to him because he didn't smoke but he did chew and he told me all about it he stole it from an old sorcerer in china where he'd just come from don't you never touch it i wouldn't want to be in your boots if you ever smoked that tobacco in that there chinaman's head you can steal anything else in this shop and it wouldn't do much harm to anybody but you keep your hands off that chinaman's tobacco mind what i'm telling you yes sir said freddy he had never thought about smoking before in connection with himself but now for the first time he began to wish he knew how to smoke it would be worth risking something to take a whiff or two of the magic tobacco in that chinaman's head just to see what would happen do you think you'd better go home now said mr littleback yes sir said freddy my father told me to hurry oh he did indeed the hunchback followed freddy to the door and they looked up together at the clock in the church tower ah said toby you're safe just six o'clock mr punch's father can't come out for about another half an hour yet freddy looked back as he crossed the street and saw the live hunchback leaning against the wooden hunchback with one foot crossed over the other he could hardly tell which was which except for the coat and breeches he went on up the street with his package of tobacco in one hand and his package of gingerbread in the other as he passed the church he lingered a moment to stare at the great fat man with spectacles who was sitting on the pavement in a chair tilted back against the church wall smoking a long pipe and reading a newspaper could this be the sextant of the church whom mr toby had mentioned and who had heard the queer noises from the top of the tower when mr punch and his father were up there having their high jinks he tried to get up his courage to ask the fat man about it but he could not get the words out he stared so long that the fat man finally put down his paper and took the pipe from his mouth and looked over his spectacles and said are you considering making a bid for the property young man i'll see what the senior church warden has to say about it how much do you offer no sir said freddy blushing in confusion and went on up the street he understood nothing of what the fat man had said but he caught the word church warden and remembered it he did not walk very fast for he had a good deal to think about so many things had never happened to him in one day before he dwelt especially in his mind on the two old codgers who were friends of mr toby and he supposed that his own father never saved up his pennies otherwise his old tobacco box would not be empty every now and then however he was glad that his father was a spendthrift because it would give him a chance to go to the old tobacco shop sometimes for more tobacco for the box and apart from aunt amanda and her gingerbread he was very anxious to look again at the chinaman's head in which lay the magic tobacco which he must not touch one thing was sure he would never go without looking carefully first at the hands of the clock he wished he knew how to smoke only not cigarettes he shivered when he thought of the terrible consequences when he came to the street car track the horse car was going past at least it was coming down the street and he did not want to be run over by that horse he had better wait for the horse was trotting his mother had warned him about it he sat down on the curb he had quite a moment or two to wait and there would be time to give a hasty glance at the gingerbread he laid the tobacco sack beside him on the curb and opened the other package the car horse had dropped into a walk and his bell was hardly jingling there was no hurry after all it would never do to cross in front of that horse even though he was walking he looked at the gingerbread 
It was fresh and soft, and its smell, when held close to the nose, was nothing less than heavenly. It was a pity it had to be hidden away again in the sack, but the horse was going by and the danger would soon be past. He held the gingerbread under his nose, merely to smell it. The edge of it touched his upper lip by chance, and there was something peculiar about the feel of it. He couldn't tell exactly what. It was very interesting. He touched it with the tip of his tongue, to see if it felt the same to his tongue as to his lip. It was just the same. Perhaps teeth would be different. His teeth sank into it, just for a trial. The horse was going by now, and the driver was looking at him. He forgot what he was about in watching the horse and his driver as they went on past him. The gingerbread completely slipped his mind, and when he turned his head back from the horse car and came to himself, he found, to his amazement, that his mouth was full of gingerbread. He wondered at first how it got there, but there was no use in wondering. There it was, and it had to be swallowed. His mother would never approve of his spitting it out, and so, to please his mother, he swallowed it. The horse car was nearly a square away. He could cross the track at any time now. There was no hurry. When he came into the two fine-story brick house where he lived, with only one package in his hand, his mother threw up her hands and said, "'Why, Freddy, where on earth have you been? Did you get lost? Are you hungry?' "'No, m'm. Yes, m'm,' said Freddy. "'Frederick?' said his father, looking at him with that look. "'Where have you been? Didn't I tell you to hurry?' "'Yes, sir, to Mr. Punch's, and I didn't see his father at all. But the hands comed right over the top of each other, and he didn't get down off his perch, he didn't. So Mr. Toby took me in to see Aunt Namanda, and she eats pins, and it's cigarettes that gives you that hump on the back. Only tobacco's all right, cause you smoke it in a pipe, and it doesn't do you any harm at all. And that's what Mr. Toby says, and he ought to know.' "'cause he's got one in his back his own self. "'But you mustn't touch that tobacco in the head, "'cause it's magic and the sailor said so, "'and here's the rage coach Michener. "'And that's all. "'You will notice that he said nothing about the gingerbread. "'End of chapter 2「ゴリラの森」「ゴリラの森」「インパクトゴリラの森」「インパクトゴリラの森」「インパクトゴリラの森」「インパクトゴリラの森」「インパクトゴリラの森」whether the tobacco box at home needed tobacco or not, for there were a good many things that drew him there, and he hardly knew which was the most fascinating. There was always a chance of gingerbread, and you could usually depend on seeing Aunt Amanda eat pins, and you could look through the two pieces of glass at the double picture and make it all one picture with the people in it standing out as if they were real, and Mr. Toby would often sing about his friends, the two old codgers and talk about their mean ways and mr punch was always waiting for his father outside the door so that you had to keep your eyes on the time or at least the clock which is different and sometimes mr toby would let you in behind the counter and let you scoop tobacco into a paper sack and when his back was turned you could stand under the chinaman's head with the magic tobacco in it and look up at it and wonder what would happen if he took just one or two little teeny whiffs but i forget what i started to tell you oh yes every time freddie visited the old tobacco shop mr toby would ask him his name in order to see if he was grown up yet what's your name today mr toby would say freddie would be the little boy's answer not yet mr toby would say shaking his head sadly You ain't grown up yet. I'm very sorry to have to tell you, son, but you've got to wait a while before you're grown up. I'll tell you what. I'll give you six months more, said Mr. Toby on one occasion. If you ain't grown up by that time, there's no hope for you. I hate to have to say it, but you might as well know it one time as another. And the very next time the little boy came, he said his name was Fweddy. And Mr. Toby said, Well, never mind. You've got five months and twenty-eight days left, 
and there's hope yet. I suppose you wouldn't want to be a little boy all the time and never grow up at all, would you? Freddy looked up at him in alarm and said, No, sir. Then, said Mr. Toby, you'd better mind your P's and Q's. Freddy wanted to ask about these P's and Q's, but you may have noticed that he was shy, and he could not make up his mind to do so. He knew all about P's and Q's in the alphabet book at home, but he did not know how to mind them. He knew how to mind his mother. Sometimes, but how could you mind letters in a book that could not ever say, don't do that, like mother? He was very anxious on this point, for he knew that his time was growing short, and the idea of never growing up was simply terrifying. He might as well smoke cigarettes and be done with it. In point of fact, he now had only about a week left, and he wasn't grown up yet. But one morning, when the hands of the church clock were wide apart, and all was safe, he passed by Mr. Punch and opened the shop door. Mr. Toby was standing behind the counter, tying up a parcel. He went on tying it up, and said, "'All right, young feller, it's your turn next. This here package is for the sly old codger, and he'll be back for it pretty soon. And if it ain't ready, phew, won't we get blown up, though? Now then, what'll you have? Pound a maiden's prayer?' "'No, sir,' said the little boy. "'I don't want anything. I just came.' "'Oh, you just came. "'By the way, young man, what is your name today?' "'Freddy,' said the little boy. "'Mr. Toby dropped his package and leaned across the counter in amazement. "'What's that you say?' "'Freddy,' cried the little boy, bursting with pride. "'Well, bless my soul, if I ever in my life, as sure as the world— "'Strike me dead if you didn't say it as plain as—' "'Young man,' said Mr. Toby solemnly, "'and he walked to the end of the counter, "'opened the swinging gate, came through, "'stood in front of Freddy, and shook him by the hand. "'Young man, I congratulate you. "'It's all right now, but you had an almighty close shave, "'I can tell you that. "'Allow me to congratulate you "'and accept the best wishes of your kind friend, "'Toby Littleback.' "'Please, sir,' said Freddy, opening his eyes wide. "'Am I grown up now?' Mr. Toby stared without speaking, and then threw out both his arms, and for a moment it looked as if he were going to hug the little boy, but he evidently thought better of it. "'Are you—' "'Why, of course you are. Ain't I been telling you? But don't you go and pursue on it too much, young feller. You don't think you can go and smoke cigarettes now?' "'Just because you're grown up, do you?' "'Oh, no, sir,' said Freddy earnestly. "'I should hope not. "'And that there Chinaman's head up there, "'you don't think you can go and smoke that magic tobacco now, do you? "'Because if you do—' "'No, sir,' said Freddy. "'But he said this a little doubtfully, "'and he looked at the Chinaman's head with more interest than ever. "'What was the use of being grown up "'if you couldn't take a little risk now and then?' "'All right, then.' cried Mr. Toby. We've got to have a little celebration over this here event, and we'd better go in and see Aunt Amanda about it right now. He grasped Freddy's hand again and pulled him to the back door and threw into the back room where Aunt Amanda was sitting by the table with the wax flowers, sewing. Quick, quick, tell Aunt Amanda your name now. Quick, what's your name? cried Mr. Toby. Freddy said the little boy, very distinctly, but looking down at the carpet, for fear he should seem proud. "'We've grown up today,' cried Mr. Toby, "'and we've got to celebrate.' Aunt Amanda raised her eyebrows in astonishment and said, "'Ash, here a bysart.' She put her hand to her mouth and somehow got out into her hand a good mouthful of pins. She laid them down on the table at her elbow and said, "'Bless the dear baby's heart!' "'And are you grown up now?' "'Yes, am said Freddy, looking up and then down again, "'for he did not wish to seem too proud. "'Aunt Amanda looked at him for a moment "'and took out her handkerchief and blew her nose very loud. "'Toby,' she said, "'what did you mean by a celebration?' "'Tomorrow's Saturday,' said he. "'Well, what of it?' "'Freddy could not understand very well what they were saying after that, except that he was concerned in it somehow, 
until he heard Aunt Amanda say, "'You'd better ask his mother, then.' "'Young man,' said Mr. Toby, "'if I write a letter to your ma, will you give it to her?' "'Yes, sir,' said Freddy, whereupon Mr. Toby sat down at the other side of the table, with pen and paper and ink, and commenced to write. First, said Aunt Amanda, there's some of that fruit cake from last Christmas still in the... Right you are, cried Toby, jumping up and going out into the kitchen. Freddy ate the fruit cake, sitting on a half-suck at Aunt Amanda's feet, while Toby went on with his letter. But in the midst of it, Toby went out again, and finally came back with a tall glass of ice-cold lemonade. Don't you go and spill it on the carpet, said he, as he sat down to his writing. No, sir, said Freddy. Aunt Amanda looked at him, as he sat so seriously on his hassock at her feet, munching his fruit cake and sipping his lemonade, and she pulled out her pocket handkerchief and blew her nose again, very loud. She appeared to have a cold. Toby paid no attention to her. His head was lying sidewise on his left arm on the table, and he was squinting at the sheet of paper, and every time his pen came down he closed his mouth tight, and every time his pen went up he opened his mouth wide. Freddy and Aunt Amanda had plenty of time to talk. Under the softening influence of fruit cake and lemonade, Freddy found his tongue. "'What's a church warden?' he said, suddenly into the lemonade glass, which was just under his nose. "'Bless the baby,' said Aunt Amanda." "'It's a long clay pipe, young man,' said Toby, chewing the end of his penholder, "'like you've seen in the case out there in the shop.' "'That ain't what he means,' said Aunt Amanda. "'You mean a man, don't you, Freddy?' "'Yes, am said Freddy, looking at the cake just going into his mouth. "'It's a man,' said Aunt Amanda. "'It's a man that belongs to a church, "'and he stands guard over the church property.' and sees to their repairs and beats little boys with a cane when they make a noise during service and takes care nobody don't run away with the collection money and how do you spell respectfully said toby scratching his head with a pen yours respectfully r e began aunt amanda s p e c k no that ain't right r e s "'There's one over at that church,' said Freddy, pointing towards the window. "'And he smokes one, too.' "'One what, Freddy?' said Aunt Amanda. "'A church warden. "'There's a church warden sits out on the pavement, "'and he smokes a church warden, he does.' "'Freddy was rather proud that he had mastered that difficult word, "'and he liked to hear himself say it. "'Oh,' said Toby, "'I reckon he means the sextant over there. "'Well,' "'Yours respectfully. I don't give a... hmm. How you spell it. There she goes. Done. Yours respectfully, Toby Littleback. It's blotted up some, by Cracky. That's a fact. But I ain't a-going to write all that over again, not by a jugful. And he took out his handkerchief and wiped the perspiration from his forehead. "'He's a church warden,' insisted Freddy, swallowing the last of the lemonade after the last of the cake. "'All right,' said Toby. "'Have it your own way. "'But a sextant's as good as a church warden, "'in my opinion, any day of the week, "'except Sunday, of course.' "'Aunt Amanda inspected the letter "'and declared herself horrified by the blots, "'but Toby positively refused to go through "'that exhausting labor again, "'so she passed it grudgingly "'and handed it to Freddy in an envelope "'and told him to give it to his mother "'as soon as he got home.' "'Do you want some more cake and lemonade?' said she. "'Yes, am said he. "'Well, you won't get it, so trot along home.' "'In the shop, Mr. Toby showed him the church warden pipes in the showcase. "'Freddy wondered how it would taste to smoke some of that magic tobacco "'in the Chinaman's head in a church warden pipe. "'As he passed the church on his way home, "'he looked for the fat old man who usually sat in his chair, "'tilted back against the wall, but he was not there.' Freddy wished to ask him about those noises up in the tower when Mr. Punch and his father were having their hijinks. He had never been able to screw up his courage to the point of asking about this, but now that he was grown up he thought he might be able. He gave the letter to his mother and she read it, 
but she said nothing to him about it. When his father came home in the evening, she showed the letter to him, and they talked about it, and Freddy could not understand very well what they were saying. Finally, his father said, "'Well, I don't think there would be any harm in it.' "'I suppose not,' said his mother. "'I'll see them in the morning. "'He had better wear his Sunday suit and his new shoes.' This was bad, because it sounded like Sunday school, and the shoes squeaked. Freddy thought he had better change the subject, so he said, "'I'm grown up. I can say Freddy. Mr. Toby says so.' His father laughed, but his mother took him up in her arms and hugged him close to her breast. The next day was in fact Saturday, and after lunch Freddy's mother helped him, or rather forced him, into his Sunday suit and his new shoes after a really outrageous piece of washing, which went not only behind the ears, but actually into them. She put his cap on his head, he always had to move it a trifle afterwards, looked at his fingernails again, pulled down his jacket in front and buttoned every button, straightened out each of the four wings of his bow tie, took off his cap to see if his hair was mussed and put it on again, pulled down his jacket in front, straightened his tie, altered the position of his cap, put both her arms around him and kissed him, and told him it was nearly two o'clock and he had better hurry. As soon as she had gone in, after watching him go off down the street, he unbuttoned every button of his jacket, put his cap on the back of his head, and in crossing the streetcar track, deliberately walked his shiny squeaking shoes into a pile of street sweepings. He then felt better and went on towards the old tobacco shop. As he came to the church, he stopped to look at the hands of the clock. He was in luck. The hands would not be together for ever so long, for it was ten minutes to two. The church warden was sitting in his chair, tilted back against the wall, keeping guard over his church, and he was smoking his church warden pipe. Freddy walked by very slowly, and his shoes squeaked aloud on the brick pavement. The fat old man gazed at him solemnly, and Freddy looked at the fat old man. The churchwarden's chair came down on the pavement with a thump. "'Look here,' he said. "'This ain't Sunday. What's the meaning of all this? It's against the rules to wear them squeaking shoes of a Saturday. The dean and chapter has made that rule, by and with the advice and consent of the city council. Don't you know that? And all that big red necktie, too. Did you think it was Sunday?' "'No, sir,' said Freddy, for he was always honest, even in the face of danger." I couldn't help it. I didn't want to, but Mother made me... Ah, that's it. I thought maybe you'd made a mistake in the day. Then it wouldn't have been so bad. Look here, it's my duty to report this here violation of the Sunday law, but as long as... You're sure you ain't... Particeps criminus? No, sir, said the little boy earnestly. My name's Freddy. Well, that makes it different. I thought you was another party... "'Young party, Seps. But if you ain't, why, here, you'll need something to show, in case you should meet the archdeacon, and he'd want to know why I hadn't reported you. Show him this, and he'll know it's all right.' The fat churchwarden fished in his vest pocket and drew out, between a fat thumb and a fat forefinger, a round, shining piece of metal, and put it in Freddy's hand. Freddy saw that it was a bright new five-cent piece, commonly called a nickel, he felt better. "'If you don't meet the archdeacon between here and Little Beck's tobacco shop,' went on the church warden, "'you don't need to keep it any longer. I don't care what you do with it then. Only not pickles, mind you.' "'No, sir,' said Freddy. This was his chance to inquire about Mr. Punch's father and the noises in the tower, but it was out of his power to stay longer. He was too glad to escape without being reported.' and he accordingly went off down the street, squeaking worse than ever, and positively hurrying. End of chapter 3 Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona Chapter 4 of The Old Tobacco Shop This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Walker, Kent, Connecticut. The Old Tobacco Shop by William Bowen.
chapter 4, in which Mr. Hanlon makes a great impression. Freddy found no one in the tobacco shop, so he knocked on the door of the back room, and it was instantly opened by Mr. Littleback himself, but a Mr. Littleback so resplendent that Freddy hardly knew him. The suit of clothes which Mr. Littleback wore was beyond any doubt a brand new suit. The ground color of it was a rich mauve, if you know what that is, not exactly purple nor violet, but somewhere in between. And up and down and across were stripes of brown, making good-sized squares all over him. It was extremely beautiful. His collar was a high white collar, very stiff, and it held up his chin in front like a whitewashed fence. His necktie was of a pale blue satin with little pink roses painted on it. Yes, sir, painted, mind you, by hand. It was not one of those troublesome things that come in a single long piece, and you take hours before the glass to twist and turn it over and under before you get them to look like a necktie. No, indeed, it was far better than that. It was tied already by somebody who could do it better than you ever could, and when you bought it, all you had to do was put it on, fasten those two rubber bands behind with a hook, and there you were, perfect. As to hair, the hand of the barber was yet upon him. His hair, parted on one side, was of a slickness which his own soap could never have accomplished. On the wide side, it lay flat down on his forehead, and there gave a sudden curl backward, like the curve of a hairpin, but much more graceful. It is only the most studious barbers who ever learned to do it just right. There were creases down the arms of Mr. Toby's coat and down the front of his trouser legs. A yellow silk handkerchief showed itself, not boldly, but quietly from the front breast pocket. As he let Freddy in, and in doing so, turned his back to Aunt Amanda, she screamed and cried out, Toby, look behind you, merciful heavens. Freddy, in the midst of his admiration of the magnificent creature, saw him whirl about and look behind himself in alarm. His aunt pointed at his coat and said sternly, Come here. Freddy saw on the back of Mr. Toby's coat, near the bottom, as he whirled about a little square white tag, Mr. Toby backed up to his aunt and stood before her, trying to look at his back over his shoulder while she took her scissors and clipped the threads by which the tag was sewed to the back of his coat. She held up the tag. It had numbers printed and written on it. Now ain't that just like you, Toby Littleback, she said. Going out with your tag on your back, with your size on it and your height and age too, for all I know. For anybody to see that you've got on a splittin' brand new suit right out of the shop, if you'd have gone out with that on your back, I'd have died with shame right here in this chair. Ain't you even able to dress yourself? By crickets, that would have been bad, said Toby, considerably upset. However, you caught me in time, so it ain't no use crying over it. Goodbye, aunt. Come along, Freddy, or we'll be late. "'Ain't you going to wear a hat?' said Aunt Amanda. "'I declare the man's so excited he don't know what he's doing.' "'Blamed if I didn't come near going out without a hat,' said Toby. "'Here she is.' He produced his hat from a cupboard in the room and put it on. It would have been a pity indeed for him to have gone out without it. It was a white derby. Yes, a white derby. It was the kind of a hat which was known in the city as a pinochle, pronounced pinochle, by all well-informed boys. With the mauve suit and the hand-painted necktie and the white-washed fence, the white derby set him off to perfection, especially as he wore it a little towards the back of his head so as to show the loveliest part of the plastered curl in his hair on the forehead. Aunt Amanda could not restrain her admiration. You'll do. I don't know that I've ever seen you look so genteel before. Toby, in the embarrassment of being considered genteel, put his hands in his trouser pockets. "'Take them hands out of your pockets,' said Aunt Amanda sharply, and he took them out in a hurry. "'Now, Freddy,' she said, "'come over here a minute, and I'll set you to rights.' Freddy stood before her knee, not very willingly, and she buttoned his jacket from top to bottom and put his cap squarely on his head. "'Now, you better be off,' she said." And I wish you were coming, too, said Toby, his hand on the doorknob. Goodbye, Freddy, said she. Goodbye, said Freddy. 
Goodbye what? said she. Aunt Amanda, said he. When they were out on the street and she heard Toby lock the shop door behind him, she took out her handkerchief and blew her nose. Her cold was evidently worse because she blew her nose several times, and then, tucking her handkerchief away in her dress, she put her head down on her arm on the table and cried. The first thing Freddy did as they went up the street was to put his cap back again on the back of his head, and the next thing he did was to unbutton every button of his jacket from top to bottom. The little hunchback was in a great hurry, and he dragged the little boy along by a hand so fast that he could hardly keep up. As they hurried along, several naughty boys observing Mr. Toby's white derby hat called after him very rudely, P-knuckle! P-knuckle! But Mr. Toby paid no attention and dragged Freddy along faster than ever. We don't want to miss any of it, said Mr. Toby. Hurry up, boy. They did not have far to go, only four or five squares. They stopped before a great, grimy brick building with a great, wide entranceway. Here we are, said Toby. What does that say up there, said Freddy. Blunt Street Theater, said Toby. Hurry up. Toby hung back before a signboard, on which was a picture of a slender man dressed in white clothing, very tight, with red and black squares on it. He was leaning against a table. His head and face were a dead white, except for red eyebrows, and a red spot in each cheek, and he had no hair, but a smooth, dead white skin from his forehead to the back of his neck. The peculiar thing was that his head was on the table beside him and not on his neck. Freddy pointed to the writing underneath the picture and said, What does that say? Hanlon Superba, said Toby, pulling him along. Hurry up, we'll be late. Mr. Littleback went to a little window in the wall inside the entranceway and spoke to a man in there, and evidently asked permission to go in, and evidently got it. And they did go in, up a flight of stairs, and found themselves suddenly among thousands and thousands of people, as it seemed, all sitting in chairs facing the same way, in a vast house lit up by gaslight so that it was almost as bright as day. And Toby and Freddy sat down in the very front row of these people and looked down over the railing in front of them on the heads of thousands and thousands, as it seemed, of other people, all sitting in chairs facing the same way. Everybody was facing towards a straight wall at the other side of the house, which had pictures painted on it. At the foot of this wall, in a kind of trench, there was a man at a piano, and there were other men with fiddles, big and little, and still others with brass things, and they were all playing a tremendous tune together. But just after Toby and Freddy had sat down, they stopped playing, and Toby nudged Freddy with his elbow and said, Now then, young feller, what do you think of this, eh? Just you wait. Keep your eye on that curtain. He had no sooner said this than somewhere in the house somebody gave a piercing whistle between his fingers, and in a minute there was such a racket that it was impossible to talk. There must have been people above them, and they must certainly have all been boys. For from up there, Freddy heard a clapping of hands and a stamping of feet all in a regular time, which spread to the whole house, and in the midst of it the boys up there began to shout and call and whistle, and in a few minutes there was such a hubbub as only boys can make, with whistling between their fingers, leading the riot. Toby nudged Freddy again with his elbow, and to Freddy's surprise began to clap his hands and stamp his feet with the rest. And Freddy thought he ought to be polite. He clapped his hands, too, though he did not know very well what it was all about. Suddenly, the men in the trench at the foot of the painted wall struck up again, and that quieted the other noise for a moment, but only for a moment. Someone whistled through his fingers, and in an instant those fiddlers might as well have been sawing away at their fiddles out at the park, for all you could hear them. And right in the midst of it all, while Freddy was trying to shout the words, Peanuts! into Toby's ear, Suddenly, the lights went out, and you could hear a pin drop. Now then, now then, whispered Mr. Toby in great excitement. Now you'll see. Watch the curtain. It's going up. From down there in that dark trench came the sound of a soft, twittery kind of music. And at the same time, the painted wall that Freddy had been looking at was rising, going up. And it went on up and up out of sight into the ceiling, and there behind it, in a dim light, there behind it, mysterious and fearsome and delicious, well, there was fairyland, 
just fairyland. I can't describe it to you. Freddy never forgot it. If you haven't seen Hamlin's Superba in some old Gaunt Street theater or other on a Saturday afternoon with the galleries wild with boys, you have not lived. When Freddy tried to tell his mother and father about it that night, it was such a whirling mass of wonders and glories that they could not make head nor tail of it. It is useless to speak of the Fairy Queen in her glittering white, coming to the rescue in the nick of time with her diamond scepter, or of the horrible demons, or the trouble and excitement they made for everybody, or the beautiful young lady who, and such leapings and twistings and climbings and tumblings as no mere human beings with bones in them could ever have performed. It is no use. It is best not to try to describe it. But there was one part which, although it may seem to you the most unlikely thing in the world, really had a good deal to do with Freddy afterwards. There was the same man whose picture he had seen outside on the signboard, and he could climb straight walls and leap through high windows and tumble across floors in a way which passed belief. But there was one thing he could not do. He could not talk. He never spoke a word from beginning to end. Once, after having escaped from a parcel of wicked red imps, he sat down, tired out and starved to death, before a table loaded with food, and he commenced to make a hearty meal. But just as he was about to sample each plate, it disappeared, vanished, completely out of sight, right under his nose. His distress was pitiable, and Freddy thought it cruel of everybody to laugh, as everybody did. On his plate were sausages, and he nearly got them, but just as he thought he had them, they actually jumped off the table and ran along the floor and up the wall, and the poor man had to climb the wall after them, which he did like a cat, and even then he never came up with them. He was terribly disappointed. And, to finish off his miseries, at last a wicked creature with a sword came up behind him as he was leaning his head down on the table in despair and cut off his head before your very eyes, really and truly cut it off. There was no doubt about it. The head was on the table, and the poor man was in the chair. Freddy was terrified and clutched Mr. Toby's arm. But when the wicked murderer had gone away, back popped his head onto the dead man's neck. His eyes opened, he grinned from ear to ear, and there he was on his feet, skipping and tumbling as lively as ever. And at that, Freddy and all the others in the house roared and shouted and clapped their hands. "'Is that Mr. Hanlon?' whispered Freddy into Mr. Toby's ear. "'I reckon it is,' said Toby, too excited himself to pay much attention to Freddy. But it could not last forever. Even the peanuts, which Toby bought for Freddy between the first and second acts, were all gone, and the curtain was down for the last time, and the crowd crushed through the doors, and Mr. Toby put on his white derby hat. They were in the street, and the speechless Mr. Hanlon was a thing of the past.' Freddy did not believe that he would ever see that dumb and loose-headed man again. But in that he was mistaken, as you shall see. Toby left him at the corner near his father's house. "'What I say is,' said Toby, three cheers for our grown-up party.' "'Yes,' said Freddy, "'and three cheers for Mr. Hanlon.'" End of Chapter 4 Chapter 5 of The Old Tobacco Shop. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jane Gray. The Old Tobacco Shop by William Bowen. Chapter 5 The Chinaman's Head. For a long time afterwards, Freddy dreamed at night of a hunchbacked man whose head came off and popped on again and wicked red demons who chased a poor man with a white face, who tried to cry for help and could not speak a word, and of a Chinaman's head without a body, smoking a long clay pipe. In the daytime, he thought a good deal about the people he was now acquainted with, Mr. Toby with his white derby hat, Aunt Amanda swallowing pins, 
the sailorman from China, Mr. Punch and his father, Mr. Hanlon with his head on the table, the church warden smoking his church warden pipe, and the two old codgers, one so sly and the other so beggarly, but that which occupied his mind more than anything else was the Chinaman's head on Mr. Toby's shelf. Freddy was older now, and as time went on, it might be thought that he would have grown accustomed to all these strange things, but he had not, far from it. He thought about them more and more, and most of all about the Chinaman's head and the magic tobacco. He really could not get that Chinaman's head out of his mind. Here was magic just within reach of your hand, and you were told that you mustn't touch it. You might as well have Aladdin's lamp in your bureau drawer and be told to keep away from the bureau. Even parents ought to know better than to expect such a thing. Anyway, what harm could just one or two little whiffs do? You didn't smoke a whole pipeful if you didn't want to. However, Mr. Toby would not be pleased, and Freddy did not intend to do anything to displease Mr. Toby. Still, it did seem a pity, with such a chance right over your head. Oh well, he would think no more about it. He fixed his mind on other things. He thought especially about a hymn they sang nearly every Sunday in Sunday school. It was a great help. He knew it by heart, and it went like this. Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you, some other to win. He resolved he would never think about the magic tobacco again. He went to sleep, saying over to himself, Yield not to temptation and dreamed all night about the Chinaman's head, and thought about it all the next day. In order to get it out of his mind, he called on Aunt Amanda. It was late in the afternoon. He sat on his hassock and watched Aunt Amanda sewing. Mr. Toby was in the shop waiting on customers. Freddy watched for a long time and then said, What are you doing? Basting, said Aunt Amanda. I thought that was what you did to a turkey, said Freddy. So it is, said Aunt Amanda. That isn't a turkey, said Freddy. No, said Aunt Amanda. You baste a turkey with gravy. That isn't gravy, said Freddy. It's different, said Aunt Amanda. You see, I have to sew this up with the needle and thread, and you sew up a turkey with the needle and thread too, said Freddy. But that's different, said Aunt Amanda. You couldn't baste a turkey with needle and thread, and you couldn't baste dressed goods with gravy. Why not, said Freddy. Well, said Aunt Amanda. Well, you see, they don't do it that way. It's different. It ain't the same thing at all. It's like this. When you baste a turkey... Have you ever had any children? said Freddy. Aunt Amanda put her hand to her heart suddenly, as if she had received a shot there and caught her breath. Then she looked out of the window, and then round at the wax flowers on the table, and then at the door, and she really seemed to be thinking of running away. But she was too lame to do that, and she at last clasped her fingers together tight in her lap, and looked hard at Freddy. He was gazing at her calmly, waiting for information. No, said Aunt Amanda, I have never had any children. Why not, said Freddy. I have never been married, said Aunt Amanda. Freddy thought about this for a moment. Didn't anybody ever want you, said he. No, she said. Nobody ever wanted me. Freddy was puzzled. But you're nice, said he. That ain't enough, said Aunt Amanda. What else do you have to be? You have to be pretty. Weren't you ever pretty? I thought so once, but... But I must have been mistaken. I guess I never was. Freddy thought it over and announced his decision seriously. I would want you anyway. Aunt Amanda stretched out a trembling hand to him and ran her fingers through his hair. Then she threw both her arms around him and pressed him against her knee. He was much annoyed. He was afraid she might be going to kiss him, but she did not. Instead, she pulled out her handkerchief and blew her nose. How many children were there that you didn't have, said Freddy, to change the subject. Aunt Amanda did not understand this at first, but she finally saw what he meant. What did he mean, you may say? What he meant was, well, it is perfectly clear, but it's hard to explain. Anyway, Aunt Amanda understood him. Three, she said. Bobby was the oldest, and Jenny next, and James was the littlest one. Did they all go to school? Oh dear, no, only Bobby. And once he played hooky and was gone all day, didn't come home till after dark, all muddy. I was terribly worried. He was a very mischievous boy, but he was his mother's own. Did he play marbles for keeps? Yes, but he went to Sunday school just as regular and liked it. And he liked it? Yes, of course. And he always took good care of Jenny. She had little yellow curls. They went to Sunday school together, hand in hand, and didn't even mind her carrying her dolly with her. She wouldn't go without it. He was so careful of her at street crossings. She loved her dollies. She used to pretend that James was one of them. Did James like that? Not very well, but he put up with it for quite a few minutes at a time. 
He couldn't be still very long, but he was pretty lonesome when Jenny had the measles. I've had the chicken pox. Did Bobby know how to mind his P's and Q's? He didn't mind anybody very well. Once I had a note from his teacher, and it said, But Freddie never learned what sin Bobby had committed in school. For at that moment, the shop door opened, and Mr. Toby thrust in his head and said, Just gotta get around to the barber shop right away this minute. Can't put it off no longer. Won't be gone twenty minutes. Freddie? Yes, sir, said Freddie, standing up. Do you think you could look after the shop for twenty minutes while I'm gone? Now Freddie did not know it, but this was in fact the most important question that had ever been put to him in his life. Everything depended on his answer. If he said no, we might as well stop this story right here. If he said yes, yes sir, said Freddie. All right, if anybody comes in, just tell him to wait. Freddie left Aunt Amanda sitting very still and gazing out of the window, with her hands folded in her lap, and followed Mr. Toby into the shop. All right, Sonny, said Mr. Toby. Make yourself comfortable. I'll be back in a jiffy. If anybody comes in, you tell him to wait. And with that, he went out of the door and up the street. Freddy was left alone in the shop. Everything was very quiet now, for it was beginning to be twilight, and all the people seemed to be indoors. He knew he ought to be going home, but he had promised to mind the shop, and it would never do to leave before Mr. Toby came back. The street door and the door to Aunt Amanda's room were both closed. He sat down on the chair by the front window and looked out across the bulldog's head. He thought of Bobby and his little sister in Sunday school, and that led him to think of the hymn that did him so much good, Yield Not to Temptation, for Yielding a Sin. He sang that tune to himself for a while, and he found himself singing other tunes, and finally one which began. There was an old codger, and he had a wooden leg, and he never bought tobacco when tobacco he could beg. Tobacco! There was a world of tobacco on those shelves, smoking tobacco and church warden pipes, he strolled around behind the counter and let down the back of the showcase. There were the churchwarden pipes. He selected one and took it out. It tasted cold and clammy when he put it in his mouth, and he wondered what it would taste like with tobacco in it. He brought the little ladder and got up on it, facing the shelves, and to his surprise, he found himself looking directly into the slanting eyes of the porcelain Chinaman's head. He stood there gazing thoughtfully into those eyes and singing to himself the verse which was always such a help to him. Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you, some other to win. It was growing a little darker now, and he could not examine the Chinaman's head very well without bringing it closer. He took the head in his hands, lifted it from the shelf, got down off the ladder, and sat down on the floor with his back against the counter. And while he was doing this, he hummed to himself the next part of his tune. Fight manfully onward, dark passions subdue. He put the head on his knees and took off the Chinaman's little round cap which proved to be, in fact, a lid. He put his hand inside and drew out a good fistful of absolutely black tobacco, fine and powdery, like cold dust. He held it to his nose, and it smelt very sweet, in fact, much like brown sugar. He wondered if it would taste like brown sugar through the pipe stem, and humming quietly to himself, each victory will help you. He poured the tobacco into the bowl of the pipe. He was disappointed, on sucking in through the pipe stem, to find there was no brown sugar taste at all. Of course, the only way to give tobacco any taste was to light it. He reached up and got a match off the counter behind him, and sitting down again, struck the match on the floor. It made a very pretty glow in the twilight, and he watched it as it burned away in his fingers. It would be burnt out in another second, so humming to himself those ever-helpful words, yield not to temptation, he put the pipe in his mouth and touched the lighted match to the tobacco. It is painful to have to tell these things, but it can't be helped, for the consequences were so strange and so important to Freddy and his friends that, anyway, he lit the pipe and drew in a long breath through the stem. He nearly choked to death. Smoke got into his nose and his eyes and his throat, and he coughed and coughed, but he remembered the words, fight manfully onward, and he determined that he would not give up so soon. He stopped coughing and pulled again at the pipe. This time he did not swallow the smoke, but blew it out of his mouth as he had seen it done a thousand times. He gave another pull and blew the smoke out again. It did indeed taste like brown sugar. It was extremely pleasant. He puffed again and again. He was astonished that he could have produced so much smoke in a few whiffs. There was quite a cloud over his head. He gave another puff, and when he blew out the smoke, the white cloud above him was so thick that he could not see through it. It began to settle down on him. He put the Chinaman's head on the floor and looked up into this cloud. It was growing thicker and thicker, and it was beginning to churn about as if in a whirlwind. It turned all sorts of colors, mostly yellow and green, 
and parts of it looked like barbarous poles revolving at a terrific speed. He became dizzy as he gazed at it. His head began to swim. The cloud was coming down closer and closer upon him and whirling about more and more wildly. He crouched down lower and became dizzier and dizzier. The counter and the shelves began to go round and round so that he had to put his hand on the floor. In another moment, the shop disappeared altogether and there was nothing under him but a little square of floor and nothing over him but the wild, churning cloud now sparkling with jets of fire. He felt himself falling, falling, as he came to the bottom with a crash. He heard the shop door open and close and found himself sitting on the floor with his back to the counter as before, with no smoke anywhere to be seen. And he was aware that a hoarse voice was speaking on the other side of the counter, and it was saying these words very loud and brisk. Avast there, belay that piping. All snug, sir. Hatches batten down, making way under sky sails and royals. Hands piped to quarters, and here's your humble servant ready for orders. Shiver my timbers, where's the skipper? Piped me up with a bassy pipe, he did, and where's he gone? Skipper ahoy! Come for orders, I be, and ever yours to command, Lemuel Mizzen, that's me. Freddy put the pipe down the floor, rose to his feet, and looked over the counter. Leaning on his elbow, on the other side of the counter, was a sailorman, with a wide blue collar open at the throat, a flat blue cap with a black ribbon on the back of his head, and a green patch over his right eye. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of the Old Tobacco Shop》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona.《The Old Tobacco Shop》by William Bowen. Chapter Six. Lemuel Mizzen, A. B. Freddy looked at the sailor man, and the sailor man straightened up and touched his cap. His face was brown as weathered oak, and creased like bark. His one eye was black and glittering. The hand which he raised to his cap was of the shape and nearly the size of a hem, and the chest and the throat which emerged from his wide-open shirt collar was as brown as his face, and big with muscles. There was a delicious odor of tar about him. You positively could not look at him without hearing wind whistling through ropes. He hitched up his trousers with his other hand and said, "'Aye, aye, skipper. Here I be, as big as life, all ready for orders.' As Freddy gazed at him, the little boy slowly collected his wits, and a light began to dawn upon him. "'Have you been to China?' said he. "'Right, oh!' cried the sailor man. "'To China I have been,' in a queer sing-song, as if he might have been marching to it in time round to Capstan, hauling in an acre. "'To China I have been, and a many a ports I've seen.' near and far i can sail before the mast or behind it just as fast i'm a tar i'm a tar i'm a tar freddy continued to stare at him with increasing astonishment are you a sailor sir said he what me i'm lemuel mizzen a b that's me and i sail the deep blue sea from maine to Afriki, and round again on an even keel to coach in china for cochineal, and back to Chile for chili sauce, and home again to Banbury Cross, that's me, Lemuel Mizzen, able seaman, fed on hardtack or soft tack, or a starboard tack or a port tack, it's all the same to me. Now then, skipper, you pipe me up, what's the orders? Please, sir, said Freddy, would you mind telling me what it is you would like to have? Me? Douse my binnacle light. What I want is a chew of tobacco. But the question before the chart house is, what do you want, skipper? I don't want anything, said Freddy. What? You piped me up, didn't you? Piped me up with a pipe? No, sir, said Freddy. Sorry to entertain a different opinion from the skipper. Didn't you smoke the Chinaman's tobacco in a pipe? Yes, sir, said Freddy, hanging his head. Then you did pipe me up with a pipe, and I hope I knows better than to come aft without being piped. Didn't you know I've got to come when you smoke the pipe with the Chinaman's backy in it? No, sir, said Freddy. The able seaman fixed his black eyes on Freddy in amazement. Well, bust my locker if this ain't the... Begging your pardon, skipper, and no offense meant. 
called me off from the China Sea and don't want me after all. Didn't go for to do it, not him, and me off in the China Sea amongst the boxers, a voyage in hither and thither to pick up a cargo of boxes to box compasses with. You've brought me a fair long journey for nothing, Skipper. I'm very sorry, sir, said Freddy. I didn't know you had to come when the Chinaman's tobacco was smoked. Are you the one that brought that tobacco here? Aye, aye, that's me. Them you'll mizzen, a b, and a fine long trip from the China Sea to come to a lad in Ameriky when I hear in my ears the skipper's call, and all for nothing at all, at all. Ain't you got nothing to offer in extenuation? Freddy did not know what extenuation meant, but he could see by the sailorman's face that that gentleman was a good deal put out. He remembered that Mr. Mizzen wanted a chew of tobacco. "'Would a little tobacco make you feel better?' said he. "'Now you've got your hand on the right rope,' said the able seaman, his face brightening. "'I don't smoke. I chew. If you're going to offer a bit of a chew, why then,' says I, "'I don't care if I do.' Freddy took a long plug of chewing tobacco from the shelf behind him. He knew that Mr. Toby would not mind making a little gift to the sailor man, after his long journey he put the plug under the cutter on the counter and was about to press down the handle to cut off a portion when the able seaman hitched up his trousers and said belay there skipper put the whole cargo aboard this here craft needs ballast hoist her over the side and he reached out his hand for the whole plug of tobacco and took it from freddy and not off a corner with his teeth ah said he his right cheek bulging out too much ballast to starboard, and he gnawed off another corner, so that his left cheek bulged out like his right. All snug, said he. I'll just pay for me cargo before I set sail, with a bit of a draft on the owners, in a manner of speaking. Here you are, sir. Stow that bit of paper in your sea chest, and it'll come in handy one of these days. Pay as you go, says I. He placed in Freddy's hand a folded sheet of soiled paper, it was greasy with handling, and was evidently very old. It was folded small and tight, and was beginning to break with age at the creases. On the outside it was blank, but there might have been writing inside. Got it in the Caribbean off a runaway sailor, for a set of false whiskers and a tattoo needle. Will it do to pay for the cargo with? Yes, sir, thank you, said Freddy, holding the paper in his hand without unfolding it. Then all I got to say is, before I weighs anchor, take good care of that there bit of paper. Aloft and alo, don't ye never let go. Round the yard take a bite and hold on to it tight. Let the hurricane blow till your fingers is blue. But whatever you do, don't ye never let go. And skipper, mind what I'm a-tellin' you, if you ever need slam your mizzen, a b, for to give him his orders. All you got to do is to smoke a couple of whiffs of the Chinaman's backy, and lam yo missin a b. He'll be on deck before the smoke's cleared away. That's clear. Yes, sir," said Freddy, with eyes wide open. And now, as I see there's no orders to give, I'm off to my tight little bark called the sieve, and when I'm aboard, I'll close all the shutters, and lock up the parrot that sneezes and stutters and wake all the skippers and put on my slippers and get into bed while the mates overhead are swabbing the decks and heaving the lead and bailing the bilgewater up with their dippers and when they have gotten the vessel to go in and settled all down to their knitting and sewing and the twenty-third mate who is always so late has learned what is meant by a third and last warning i'll turn up the gas and take a look at the glass and read me the life of old Chu until morning. And so, sir, continued Mr. Mizzen, walking towards the street door, I must give you a view of my little stern light, and bid you, dear sir, a very good night. So saying, he turned squarely towards Freddy, with one hand on the doorknob, and with the other hand touched his cap respectfully. Freddy saw that his trousers were very wide at the ankles, and very tight at the hips, and that he rolled a little when he walked. Having touched his cap respectfully, he opened the door and went out, and disappeared in the darkness outside. Freddy stood looking after him with his mouth wide open. 
End of chapter 6. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Chapter 7 of The Old Tobacco Shop. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. The Old Tobacco Shop by William Bowen. Chapter 7 The Hands of the Clock Come Together. It was some minutes before Freddy recovered from his astonishment. Certainly this was a strange sailor man, and he had come all the way from the China Sea at a puff of the Chinaman's tobacco? Certainly magic tobacco, that. But it was a pity that Mr. Mizzen had been called away from the China Sea, all for nothing, while he was so busy gathering boxes to box compasses with. No wonder he had felt put out about it, and it must have been a queer sort of ship, with its shutters and all those skippers and mates, did they really like to knit and sew after they had got the ship to going? It would be a wonderful thing to sail in a ship like that. He wished he had thought to ask Mr. Mizzen more about it. He must tell Aunt Amanda at once. He ran to the back door and burst into the back room, crying out, Aunt Amanda! Aunt Amanda was sound asleep in her chair, with her head back and her mouth open. The gas was burning brightly overhead and the clock was ticking away distinctly on the mantelpiece. "'Aunt Amanda!' cried Freddy. She awoke with a jump, blinked her eyes, and said, "'Ha! Where's the... What's the... Who said... Where's Toby? What's the matter?' "'It's me, Aunt Amanda,' cried Freddy breathlessly. "'And the sailor man's just been here and gone, and I called him with a pipe, and I can call him whenever I want him, and he gave me a piece of paper,' and he talks like a singing book, and there's a parrot that stutters, and they have to bail out the water with dippers because the ship's named the sieve, and we mustn't lose the paper because the runaway sailor wore false whiskers, and he feeds on tacks instead of pins, and we have to hold on tight to the paper, and one of the men on the ship is always late, and we mustn't lose the paper because... Stop, stop, said Aunt Amanda. What on earth is the child talking about? What's all this about a sailor man and a paper? He's the one that brought the Chinaman's tobacco from China, and he gave me a piece of paper, and here it is, and we mustn't lose it because... One minute, Freddy. Now you just stand right there, perfectly still, and tell me about it slowly. Now then, what about this sailor man? Slow, slow. It was a long time before Freddy made her understand exactly what had happened. But at last she did understand, from beginning to end. She was grieved and horrified that he had smoked the tobacco, but there was no help for it now, and she was too much excited by his tale to scold him very long. "'What's the paper he gave you?' said she, when he had told her everything. Freddy put the paper in her hand, and she unfolded it carefully. "'Why,' said she, "'it's a map.' "'What kind of a map?' said Freddy. "'It's a map of an island,' said Aunt Amanda. "'Where's Toby? I wish you would come home. "'It looks like an island, and there's writing here on it. "'Looks like some sailor man might have drawn it, maybe. "'It's certainly pretty old. I wish Toby would come.' "'What's the writing on it, Aunt Amanda?' said Freddy. "'Well, here at the top it says, Correction Island, "'and under that it says, Spanish Maine.' "'Bless me, that's where the pirates used to.' "'Pirates?' said Freddy, his eyes sparkling. "'Yes, pirates, of course. "'You've heard of the Spanish Main, haven't you?' "'Yes, am It's a long way off. "'You have to go there in a ship. "'Have you ever been there?' "'Me? "'Me been to the Spanish Main? "'Mercy sakes, no, child. "'What would I be doing on the Spanish Main? "'I ain't been outside of this town since I was born.' "'Wouldn't I like to go there?' "'Pirates,' said Freddy. "'Oh, Jiminy!' "'You mustn't use such dreadful language,' said Aunt Amanda. "'I wonder where Toby is. "'Just look at that clock. "'Why, bless me, it's twenty-seven minutes to seven. Freddy looked and saw that the hands of the clock were together, one on top of the other. 
It was the hour for Mr. Punch's father to call Mr. Punch from the church tower. Toby's got to talking with that barber again, as sure as you live. When they once begin, they never know when to leave off. I wish he'd... As she said this, the door opened, and in walked Mr. Toby himself. Sorry I'm so late, he cried, but the barber got to talking about... What, young fella, are you still here? He turned and called through the open door to someone behind him in the shop. Come in. Make you acquainted with my aunt and a young chap here. Don't be bashful. Come right in. Nobody's going to eat you. Mr. Toby held the door wide open and made way for a little gentleman who now advanced into the room. He was a hunchback man, of the same height as Toby, and he was holding out in one hand a bunch of black cigars. He was bareheaded and bald-headed. He had high cheekbones and a big chin and a hooked nose. He wore blue knee breeches and black stockings and buckled shoes, and his coat was cut away in front over his stomach and had two tails behind down to his knees. His joints creaked a little as he walked. He made a stiff bow to Aunt Amanda and another one to Freddy. "'Come in, Mr. Punch,' said Toby. "'You don't need to hold them cigars any longer. Give them to me.' and he took them from Mr. Punch and laid them on the table. He then went to Mr. Punch and linked his arm in his, and the two hunchbacks stepped forward together and stood before Aunt Amanda. "'Allow me to present my friend Mr. Punch,' said Toby. Just as I was coming in, I heard a voice sing out, "'Punch!' from the church tower, and Mr. Punch stepped down from his perch, and I invited him to come in, and here we are. "'Good evening, marm,' said Mr. Punch." His voice sounded harsh, as if his throat were rusty. "'Good evening, young sir. "'He's very pleasant within doors, very pleasant indeed. "'I can't say it's so bloomin' agreeable out there on my box. "'Hall day and hall night. "'The gaslight is very welcome to my poor highs, I assure you, marm. "'I trust I see you well, marm.' "'Mercy on us,' said Aunt Amanda, who had been speechless with astonishment. Freddy, it's Mr. Punch himself. Bless me if it ain't. Freddy edged a little closer to Aunt Amanda, for he was afraid Mr. Punch might snatch him up and carry him off to his father in the tower. Mr. Punch noticed this. Have no fear, me good sir, said Mr. Punch, his wide mouth expanding in a smile almost to his ears. I shan't see my father this night. If me kind friends will permit me to enjoy their society for a brief period together with their charming gaslight, which it is very dim all night in the street and quite unsatisfactory, accordingly most pleased to accept me friend Toby's kind hospitality, I assure you, one grows quite cramped in one's legs and one's arms when one has to remain in one position on one's box all night, unless one's father should tie Kit into his head to call one up for a bit of a lark, and one can never be sure of one's father avin' it in his ed to call one up, to say nothing of one's fingers comin' stiffer and stiffer with one's parcel of cigars eld out in one's and, and no ad on one's ed, and no air on one's ed, to defend one against a evenin' hair, with one's nose dropping icicles in winter, so that one never knows when one will lose one's nose off of one's vice. "'Excuse me,' said Aunt Amanda. It was evident that Mr. Punch was a talkative person. "'Are you an Englishman?' "'Oh, lor, miss, indeed,' said Mr. Punch. "'A Englishman as ever was, I assure you. But I hopes I give myself no airs.' Freddy gave up trying to understand the difference between air and hair. It was plain enough that the bald-headed man had never given himself any hair, so it couldn't be that. Anyway, this was an Englishman, and Freddy was glad that he would now probably have a chance to hear English spoken, which he had never heard before. Toby, said Aunt Amanda, Freddy has seen the sailor man from China, and he has a map. I'll tell you about it. Thereupon she related the story of Mr. Lemuel Mizzen, as she had got it from Freddy. Mr. Toby and Mr. Punch were both tremendously impressed. It's too bad, said Mr. Toby. This young fellow here had to go and smoke the Chinaman's tobacco after I told him not to. It's too bad. That's what it is. What did you mean by it, sir? It's a wary naughty action, indeed, said Mr. Punch. 
wary reprehensible wary i can't say i ever heard of a thing so extremely reprehensible now when i was a lad you don't say so said mr toby well i don't see anything so very bad about it i'd have done it myself if i'd been in his place what do you mean by saying that my freddy's reprehensible i won't have nobody calling him names i won't and what's more no offence toby no offence cried mr punch sorry i assure you wary reprehensible of me to say such a thing wary pray be calm be calm well then grumbled toby don't you go and say nothing about freddy because anyway let's have a look at the map at that moment there came a timid knock upon the door who's next said toby come in End of chapter 7. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Chapter 8 of The Old Tobacco Shop. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. The Old Tobacco Shop. By William Bowen, Chapter Eight: Celluloid Cuffs and a Silk Hat. The door opened, and there entered a poor-looking elderly man, bowing and scraping as he came, and saluting the company with an old rusty dented tall hat, which he carried in his hand. The most striking thing about him was that he had a wooden leg. His hair was gray and thin, and his face was not very clean. There were signs of tobacco at the corners of his mouth. His clothes were frayed and patched, and there was a good deal of grease on his vest. He wore a celluloid collar without any necktie, and round celluloid cuffs. His coat sleeves were much too short, and his cuffs hung out certainly three inches. Strange to say, his collar and cuffs were spotlessly clean, and presented quite a contrast to his very untidy face and clothes. But then, celluloid is easy to clean much less trouble than washing the face. As he stumped into the room, he kept bowing humbly from one to another and bobbing his old hat up and down in his hand. Ahem, he said, making another bow. I was just going by, and I thought I would drop into... Er, ahem, I hope I'm not in the way. Oh, come in, said Toby, not very graciously. As long as you're here, you might as well stay. This is Mr. Punch, and this is Freddy. The elderly man bowed to Freddy, and went up to Mr. Punch and shook him cordially by the hand. He put his mouth quite close to Mr. Punch's ear, and lowered his voice, and said, Ahem! I am delighted to know you, sir. I trust you are well. I have seen you often, but not to speak to. Ahem! He lowered his voice again, and spoke very confidentially into Mr. Punch's ear. The fact is, sir, that as I was going by, I suddenly found that I had left my tobacco pouch at home. Most unfortunate. And I came in with the hope that perhaps, er, ahem, very seldom forget my tobacco, very seldom indeed, perfectly lost without it. Do you, er, ahem, do you happen to have such a thing about you as a, er, ahem, a small portion of, er, smoking tobacco? I should be very much obliged. Sorry, said Mr. Punch stiffly, backing away. I never used tobacco in any way, shape, or form. The elderly man looked much disappointed and sighed. He turned to Toby and bowed and smiled hopefully. Perhaps, Mr. Littleback, he began. Not on your life, said Toby. You don't get no tobacco out of me, and that's flat. The elderly man sighed again and looked steadily at Freddy, but he evidently thought there was no hope in that quarter, and he said nothing. Freddy now realized who the elderly gentleman was. He had a wooden leg, and he never bought tobacco when tobacco he could beg. It was the old codger whom Mr. Toby had now and then sung a song about, one of his two friends, the one who was always begging tobacco, and never had any of his own. Freddy looked at him and felt rather sorry for him. 
Ahem, said the old codger with the wooden leg. Very sorry to intrude, Miss Amanda. I hope I'm not in the way. It's very mild weather we're having. Now, then, said Toby briskly, let's look at this map. As he said this, another knock was heard at the door, a firm and confident knock this time. Confound it, said Toby. Who next? Come in. The door opened, and another elderly man stepped in, a tall, slim man with very white hair and a long, narrow face. He carried a tall, shiny black silk hat in his hand. He wore a black suit, all of broadcloth, and his coat hung to his knees, and was buttoned to the top. His cuffs and collar and shirt were of beautiful white linen with a gloss, and his tie was a little white linen bow. He came forward with an air of warm benevolence. "'My dear, dear friends,' he said, and stretched out both hands towards the company, as if to clasp them all to his heart. "'What a beautiful, beautiful scene! So homelike, so cozy, so sociable, so, so... What can be so beautiful as the gathering together of friends about the family hearth? So beautiful! There was a latrobe stove in the room, but no hearth. However, that made no difference. He went, with his hands outstretched, to Aunt Amanda, and pressed one of hers in both of his. The old codger with the wooden leg immediately sidled up to him, and while he was still pressing Aunt Amanda's hand, said, in a confidential tone, Ahem! I'm delighted to see you again. I trust you are well. The fact is, I find that I have, um, left my tobacco pouch at home, most unfortunate. Very seldom forget it. Completely lost without it. I was wondering, uh, ahem, if you happen to have such a thing about you as a... No, said the other old man, changing at once from beaming benevolence to stern severity. I'll be hanged if I do and he released Aunt Amanda's hand and turned his back on the old codger with the wooden leg. Now, said Toby, let's look at the map. This here is Mr. Punch, and this is Freddy. The newcomer took Mr. Punch's hand in both of his and squeezed it softly. He then took Freddy's hand in both of his and pressed it tenderly. Freddy knew him. He was the other old codger, as sly as a fox, who always had tobacco in his old tobacco box. Freddy could hardly believe that that white-haired old gentleman could be as sly as a fox. "'My dear, dear friends,' said the sly old fox, "'what is so beautiful as the love of friends?' He stopped to glare at the old codger with the wooden leg, who looked away nervously. "'The love of friends, gathered together around the family hearth. "'How beautiful! It touches me! My friends, it touches me!' "'That's all right about that,' said Toby." For heaven's sake, let's look at that map. Aunt Amanda spread out the map on the table beside her, and the others gathered round. It's an island, cried Toby. On the Spanish main, said Aunt Amanda. The Spanish main, said the sly old fox. A beautiful country, full of palms and grape nuts, what you might call a real work of nature, full of parrots and monkeys and lagoons and other wild creatures. A work of nature, my dear friends, a real work of nature. And pirates, said Freddy earnestly. I said parrots, said the sly old fox. I said pirates, said Freddy. Just what I said, said the sly old fox. That live in trees, my little friend, in trees, and have red and blue feathers, and... Pirates don't have feathers, said Freddy. Dear, dear, said the sly old fox. How can you say such a thing? How can you? Did you ever see a pirate in a tree? In cages, my dear little friend. Hundreds of them. That's enough, said Mr. Toby. Quit wrangling for a minute, will you? What about this here map? I tell you what, though. I'd like the church warden to see this map. Freddy, will you run down the street and get the church warden? Yes, sir, said Freddy, moving towards the door and tell him to bring along his odor of sanctity with him. He always carries a bottle of it in his pocket, and we may need it. Don't forget it. No, sir, said Freddy. Hold on a minute, said Mr. Toby, snatching up his hat. I'll go for him myself. I can do it quicker. 
and in a moment he was out of the door. End of chapter 8 Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona Chapter 9 of The Old Tobacco Shop This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. The Old Tobacco Shop by William Bowen. Chapter 9. The Odor of Sanctity. While Toby was gone, Aunt Amanda explained to the two old men about the sailor man from China and about his gift of the map which was lying on the table. They were just at the end of their discussion when Toby returned, bringing with him the church warden, puffing and blowing with the unusual exertion of walking, and without his pipe. Toby introduced him to Mr. Punch and the two old codgers, and drew him up to the table, and showed him the map, explaining at the same time how it came there. The church warden examined the map carefully, while the others all looked at him. He finally put down the map, settled himself in a chair, folded his hands across his fat stomach, blew out his cheeks, and said, My opinion is that what we ought to do is to... I've considered the matter carefully, from all sides, and I think we ought to... Of course you may not agree with me, but I think the best thing to do would be to... Unless, of course, some of you may think of something better, but if you don't, then I can't say as there's anything better to do than to... At this moment there came a sound from the street outside, which made everyone but Aunt Amanda jump to his feet. It was the sound of running feet, mixed with strange cries, not very loud, but somehow blood-curdling. It was evident that someone was in trouble. Freddy and the five men rushed from the room and through the shop and into the street. The street was very dark, except for a gas lamp at the opposite corner. A white figure was running down the pavement towards the shop door, with frantic speed, and behind him, evidently chasing him, came a crowd of little dark creatures, hard to make out in the dim light. It was these creatures who were making the little blood-curdling cries, in a moment they had come so near that the party about the shop door could see what they were. In front, running desperately with leaps and bounds, and panting for breath, came a tall, slim man all in tight-fitting white clothes, with a dead white face and a white hairless head, and after him, tumbling on pell-mell, was a perfect riot of little red imps, with little horns on their foreheads, and little tails behind them, all trying to spear the white man with the wicked little pitchforks which they carried, and to seize him with their claws. Freddy thought they were precisely like the imps he had seen at Hanlon's Superba. When the white man reached the shop door, they had nearly caught him. He paused at that moment, looked wildly about him, saw the open door of the shop, and dashed in and banged the door to behind him. The imps came tumbling up and hesitated an instant before the men at the door and in that instant the church warden showed the most unexpected presence of mind. He quickly reached behind him and drew a small bottle out of his pocket and pulled out the cork and sprinkled a few drops of its contents on the ground before him. A sharp, penetrating odor immediately filled the air. It was so intense that it made the tears come into Freddy's eyes, but what it did to the wild mob of imps was almost beyond belief. As they got their first whiff of it, they tumbled back over one another in a mad effort to get away, but they could not get away from the odor quick enough. It caught them and held them, so that in a moment they could not move. They stood fixed and fast and silent. In another moment they began to melt away, and in two minutes they had vanished, actually vanished where they stood, each and every one, before the very eyes of the astonished party before the door. "'Blimey, if I ever see the like,' said Mr. Punch. "'Never knew my odor of sanctity to fail once,' said the church warden coolly. "'Hardly ever go out without it. "'There ain't a witch or an imp or a bad spirit of any kind whatever "'can stand up against my odor of sanctity "'if he once gets a couple of good whiffs of it out of this little bottle. "'Just a few drops from the bottle, and a few sniffs, and foof! "'They're done for. "'No, sir!' 
There ain't no perfumery in the world like odor of sanctity. On the floor of the shop they found the poor white man lying completely exhausted. They asked him to explain, but he could not speak. Mr. Toby and Mr. Punch, one on each side, supported him into the back room and sat him down in a chair before Aunt Amanda. She held up her hands in astonishment. The man was certainly a strange-looking man. They plied him with questions, but he touched his tongue with his finger and shook his head. He could not speak. He was dumb. Freddy, after one long look at him under the gaslight, knew who he was. "'It's Mr. Hanlon!' he cried in great excitement. "'It's Mr. Hanlon!' The dumb man looked at Freddy and smiled and nodded his head. He rose to his feet, shook Freddy's hand, and made a graceful bow to the whole company. "'It's Mr. Hanlon, sure enough,' said Toby, still being chased by the imps. "'Pretty near got him that time, too. But he got away, safe and sound, after all, didn't he, eh?' and all the party, including Mr. Hanlon himself, laughed with delight. And when the church warden pulled out his little perfume bottle and showed it around, and explained to Mr. Hanlon what it had done, the poor man was so overcome that he put his head down on the church warden's shoulder and wept. "'This'll never do,' cried Toby. "'Ain't we never, never, going to get down to this here map? I never see such a time as I've had trying to examine this here map. One thing right after another. Mr. Hanlon, I'll tell you what it's about, and then you can see it for yourself. Would you like to stay here with our little party? It's a good deal safer than out of doors. Mr. Hanlon nodded eagerly and smiled, and Toby explained everything to him and showed him the map. Now, said Toby, when that was done, speak up, warden, and finish what you was a-saying. End of chapter 9 Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Chapter 10 of The Old Tobacco Shop. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. The Old Tobacco Shop by William Bowen. CHAPTER Ten, CAPTAIN HIGGINSON AND THE SPANISH MAIN The church warden, having put back into his pocket the bottle of odor of sanctity, folded his hands across his fat stomach and began again. As I was saying, Never mind that, said Toby. Tell us what we had better do. Well, as I was saying, went on the church warden, paying no attention to Toby, the best idea that occurs to me, after thinking it over considerable, is that, but I ain't saying there's none better, and I don't lay claim to being any wiser than, anyway, it seems to me we ought to, just listen to this, broke in Aunt Amanda. She had been studying the map all this time, and she was holding it in her hands. She was much excited. I've just made out all this handwriting at the bottom of the map, and I'll read it to you. Do you want to hear it? Her voice shook and her hands trembled. Everybody except the church warden begged her to go on. Oh, do you think it could be true? If it only could! Oh, if it could only be true! Maybe if you'd read it, Aunt Amanda, said Toby. Yes, yes, I will, said she, all of a twitter. I'll read it. Don't hurry me. This is what it says. If it could only be true! Correction Island by dead reckoning, latitude 12 degrees, 32 minutes, 14 seconds, north, longitude 61 degrees, 45 minutes, 13 seconds, west, whatever that means. But I'll read it to you just as it's written. It's a queer kind of language. Anyway, this is what it says. Lately discovered by me, Reuben Higginson, Master Mariner, Brig Cotton Mather, New Bedford. Notify Elizabeth Higginson, spinster, or else the acknowledged elder of the Society of Friends, New Bedford. Now, of course, in heavy gale on return voyage to fetch my sister aforesaid to Correction Island with as many others as are minded to come. 
leaking badly below line, pumps given over, water mounting in hold, decks awash, both masts gone by the board, whale oil no use, down with all hands in another hour. This map shall be cast overboard in a stout bottle as we go down with a paper of directions how to gain correction in the island. Where's the paper of directions? said Toby. It ain't here, said Aunt Amanda. I suppose Captain Higginson lost it, or else he didn't have time to put it in the bottle. Anyway, this is what the writing on the map says. Let him that finds the bottle remember these mariners. Also, let him take heed to search out the island diligently. For this island, listen to what it says now, said Aunt Amanda, trembling with excitement. Oh, do you suppose it could really be true? And yet this Reuben Higginson was a good Quaker captain, I'm sure, and I don't believe he would say what wasn't true, and especially when he was on his way home to get his own sister. Why don't you read it instead of talking about it, said Toby. I would if you'd let me, said Aunt Amanda. Here's what it says. For this island is refuge to such as be afflicted, and in this island shall be corrected. Oh, listen to this. I wouldn't believe it from anybody but Reuben Higginson. Shall be corrected whatever errors, disappointments, miscarriages, failures, preventions, and the like, this mortal life may have afflicted any withal. Wherefore, I have called it Correction Island. There be perils enough in coming at complete correction, but let courage halt not by the way, so shall he arrive presently. If any be crooked, this is the part, it's too wonderful. But Captain Higginson wouldn't have said it when he was so near going down with his ship, and especially on his way home to get his own sister. My dear lady, said Mr. Punch, if you would be so very kind as to... Yes, yes, give me time. I declare you make me so nervous. Now just listen to this, every one of you, and don't speak. If any be crooked, he shall there be made straight. She paused and looked hard at Toby. Mr. Punch started at the same time, and he and Toby looked hard at each other. If any be blind, he shall see. If any dumb, he shall speak. At the word dumb, Mr. Hamlin, whose elbow was resting on the table, jumped so violently that he knocked the album onto the floor. Aunt Amanda nodded her head to him, and all the others stared at him. If any be old, he shall be young again. If any fat, he shall be as lean as he will. At the word fat, the churchwarden gave a questioning grunt, and settled down deeper in his chair. If any be poor, whether in purse or in mind, he shall seek alms no longer. The old codger with the wooden leg, who had been resting his wooden leg on the chair opposite, dropped it to the floor and sat up very straight. Toby, who was standing beside him, clapped him heartily on the shoulder. If any be mean or cunning or despiteful, he shall be given a new heart. Aunt Amanda looked directly at the sly old codger, who was sitting smiling, with his tall silk hat on his knees, and everyone else in the room, except Mr. Hanlon, looked very intently at him. He noticed it, and glanced around inquiringly, smiling more benevolently than ever. "'How beautiful that would be,' he said. "'How beautiful! "'If some of my dear, dear friends could only have a new heart, "'how beautiful!' "'Don't interrupt,' said Aunt Amanda. "'Freddy, listen to this. "'If any be little in stature, "'against his desire he shall be great.' "'Freddy opened his eyes very wide. "'Would it be possible to be big at once, "'without waiting all that long, dreary time?' How glorious that would be! But this, said Aunt Amanda, this is the last and the best. I don't know whether I can read it right. Her voice broke, and she blew her nose and cleared her throat. But I will try. Oh, do you suppose it could be true? Would a good Quaker captain, with a sister in New Bedford, say it if it wasn't true? With the sea raging and both masts gone, and the ship filling up with water, and... 
"'Aunt Amanda,' said Toby, "'if you don't read the rest of it this minute.' "'Ah, yes, Toby, I will,' said Aunt Amanda. "'It must be true, or a good man like that wouldn't have said it. "'This is the last part, and the best. "'If any be prevented unjustly of beauty, or of children, or of love, or of other like desires, there shall be found for him of these a great store, so that there shall be an end of repining, and none in that place shall say, Thus and thus might I have been also, had I been but justly entreated. And so I commit my body to the sea, and my soul to... Go on, go on, cried the company, excepting, of course, Mr. Hanlon. Aunt Amanda blew her nose again and laid down the map on the table. That's all, she said. I suppose he didn't have time to finish it. End of chapter 10 Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona Chapter 11 of The Old Tobacco Shop This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. The Old Tobacco Shop by William Bowen. Chapter 11. A Mixed Company in Search of Adventure. After Aunt Amanda had stopped reading, it was a moment or two before anyone spoke. If all those things, said Mr. Toby thoughtfully, could be done in that island... I'd be in favor of going there. There was a general murmur of assent, and Mr. Hanlon nodded his head. Well, went on Mr. Toby, we'd better make up our minds what we want to do about it. The church warden ain't had his say yet, what with all these interruptions, and I move we give him a chance to have his say, right now. Speak up, warden. What do you think we ought to do? As I was saying, said the churchwarden, looking around solemnly, while I don't hold to my own opinion if anybody else can think up something better, still it seems to me, but maybe you'd rather hear from the others first. No, no, cried the whole company, except Mr. Hanlon, who shook his head vigorously. Well, then, being as you've asked me so particular, and haven't thought about it considerable, as I was saying, it appears to me that the best thing to do would be to... This is only the way it looks to me, you understand, and I ain't speaking for nobody but myself, and I don't pretend that my opinion is worth... By cracky, cried Mr. Toby, very rudely, ain't you the most maddening old fellow that ever was in the world? Come on, now, tell us what to do, and be quick about it. Call up the able seaman. This was so unexpected that nobody spoke for a moment. Hooray, cried Toby. Now you've said it. We'll call up Mr. Lemuel Mizzen. Is that his name? That's the thing to do. Do you all agree to that? Everybody approved, and Mr. Toby turned to Freddy. He's your man, Freddy, and if you've done it once, I reckon it won't be any harm for you to do it again. Wait a minute. And he ran into the shop and immediately returned with the Chinaman's head and a churchwarden pipe. Now, then, Freddy, he said, will you do it again? No, sir, said Freddy, I'd rather not. You shouldn't make him do it, said Aunt Amanda. Nonsense, Aunt Amanda, cried Toby. He's as bad now as he'll ever be, and it ain't going to do him no harm. I'll fill the pipe. "'His quite a lark,' said Mr. Punch, laughing heartily. "'Fancy the little beggar smoking a pipe!' "'My dear little friend,' began the sly old fox, beaming upon Freddy, "'you must always remember that your elders know best.' "'Here, Freddy,' said Mr. Toby, having filled the pipe. "'Sit down here,' and he pushed Freddy gently down upon his accustomed hassock at Aunt Amanda's feet. Freddy shook his head, but Mr. Toby put the pipe into his mouth and lit a match. All the others sat in silence, watching Freddy intently. Now, then, said Toby, pull away, and he touched the lighted match to the pipeful of black tobacco. 
Freddy gave a pull and blew out a cloud of smoke. He did not choke this time. He gave another pull and blew out another cloud. The white smoke lay above the heads of the company in a thick mass. It grew thicker so that he could not see through it. It began to move as if in a high wind. He drew on the pipe once more and blew out another cloud of smoke. He knew what was coming, and in fact the same thing happened that had happened to him before. The white cloud churned about with its barber poles and jets of fire coming down closer and closer upon him, and in a jiffy he was sitting in mid-air on his hassock, and then he felt himself falling, falling, and as he struck the bottom with the jar, he heard, very distinctly, a knock on the door, and he was sitting again on his hassock at Aunt Amanda's feet in the quiet room, with no sign of a cloud anywhere to be seen. "'Come in,' he heard Mr. Toby cry. The door opened, and in walked Mr. Lemuel Mizzen, A.B., as cool as a cucumber. He took off his flat blue cap with the black ribbon and made a bow to the company. "'Piped me aft again, and good evening to you all,' said he, in his hoarse voice. "'Lemuel Mizzen, A.B., that's me. What'll it be? All ready for orders, skipper. It was just half-past by the starboard watch.' and the skipper's sir apples were quietly peeling when i locked up the last of the lemons and scotch and lay on my bed looking up at the ceiling to snatch forty winks as i foolishly reckon but just as i thinks thirty-first thirty-second there's a ring at the bell of the big front door and the mates come and yell that i'm wanted ashore and so i tucks in my cap the eight points of my nap and just before stopping to turn down the lights I runs to the dresser and puts it to rights, and then, before giving a last look behind, I goes to the bed and takes off the spread and lays out the air the three sheets in the wind. And here I be, concluded the able seaman, all ready for orders. And he looked very hard at Freddy. Well, said Aunt Amanda, gasping, I never in my life heard such a... I'll tell you what it is, Mr. Mizzen, said Toby. It's about Correction Island, on the Spanish main. Aye, aye, sir, said Mr. Mizzen. Would you like to go there? Ah, said everyone at once, except Mr. Hanlon, who nodded his head. No trouble at all, said Mr. Mizzen. Just step into the sieve, and we'll be off. A sweet little bark is the sieve, provided there's plenty of dippers, but we always go well provided. Is the whole party going? "'One moment, if you please,' said the sly old codger. "'There is one little point on which I... "'That is to say, will there be any expense?' "'Not a penny,' said Mr. Mizzen. "'Everything's found. "'Orders from the skipper. "'What he says goes.' "'Ah,' said the sly old fox, "'the Spanish main, "'with all the little parrots and monkeys "'flitting about in the branches of the upas trees. "'I think I will join.' "'I reckon we're all going,' said Mr. Toby. "'Is everybody agreed?' "'All right, it's settled, and my vote is to go right now, "'while we've got hold of our able seamen here.' "'Shouldn't I tell Mother first? asked Freddy. "'I'll write her a note in the morning,' said Toby. "'I'll fix it. You leave it to me.' "'I suppose I really ought to finish this sewing,' said Aunt Amanda. "'No time,' said Toby.' who seemed to be managing everything. Where's the ship, Mr. Mizzen? Made fast to the wharf at the foot of this street, said Mr. Mizzen. Then let's go, said Toby. He ran out of the room and returned with his white derby hat on his head and his hand-painted necktie neatly in its place. He helped Aunt Amanda to get up and brought her her little black bonnet, which she put on and tied under her chin, and her cashmere shawl, which she put around her shoulders. "'All right,' cried Toby. "'We're off. Come along.' "'We're off to the Spanish main,' said Mr. Mizzen, "'in his curious sing-song. "'To the wet antipode, "'but dry or wet we need not fret, "'for we are bold as bold can be. "'And on the way at Botany Bay "'we'll probably stay a week or two "'to gather ferns as the botanists do, 
and then we'll stop at the door of Spain to ask the way to the Spanish main. And so without any more delay, on the Spanish main we'll all alight, where the starfish shines in the sea all night, and the dog star barks in the sky all day. Here, skipper, put this in your pocket, and hold fast to it. He handed Freddy the map, and Freddy put it away safely in his pocket. "'Have you got the odor of sanctity?' said Mr. Toby to the church warden. "'Right here,' said the fat man, tapping his back pocket. "'I'll carry the Chinaman's tobacco,' said Toby. "'We may need it.' And he tucked the Chinaman's head under his arm. In a few moments the whole party were standing on the pavement outside, and Toby locked the shop door behind them. They crossed the street, and as they did so they heard a faint voice hallowing from the top of the church tower, and they could make out that it said, Punch! Punch! But Mr. Punch only sniffed and shrugged his shoulders and made no answer. It was very dark. The gas lamps at the corners only made the darkness gloomier. The only sound they heard, after Mr. Punch's father's voice had died away behind them, was the stump-stump of the old codger's wooden leg on the brick pavement. All the dwelling-houses were closed, and as they came nearer to the wharves, all the warehouses were dark and awful. Not a soul was to be seen, except that once they saw the back of a policeman as he disappeared around a dark corner in advance. At the sight of this policeman's back, and in the shadow of a great gloomy building alongside an alley, Freddy slipped his hand into the able seaman's big paw. He wondered if he were doing quite right in leaving home without saying a word to his mother. But Mr. Toby had promised to do whatever was necessary, and anyway, he was going aboard a ship. If he should stop to speak to his mother about going away on a voyage in a ship, he felt, somehow, that he might never go. He could already smell the delicious odor of tarred ropes. Their progress was very slow, on account of Aunt Amanda's lameness. First came Mr. Mizzen, leading the way with Freddy by his side. Next came Aunt Amanda, limping with her cane, and supported on one side by Mr. Toby, and on the other by Mr. Punch. Behind them walked the church warden and the sly old fox. And last of all, Mr. Hamlin and the old codger with the wooden leg. They could not see far before them the ghost-like masts and shrouds of ships, looking as if they were growing up from the street among the buildings and in another moment they found themselves standing in a group on a wide wharf, piled up with bales and boxes, and before them, against the edge of the wharf, where the black water was lapping the piles, stood a tall ship with most of her sails set. Freddy thrilled in every vein of his body. At that moment he did not think of his father or mother. He thought of nothing but the smell of brackish water and tarred ropes and the deck of a ship on the open sea under a cloud of canvas, and the faraway Spanish main. The able seamen led the company of adventurers forward between the bales and boxes, until they stood beside the dark hull of the ship. He turned round and faced them, and touched his cap respectfully. "'Come aboard,' said he. End of chapter 11 Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona Chapter 12 of the Old Tobacco Shop. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. The Old Tobacco Shop by William Bowen. Chapter 12 The Voyage of the Sib. When Freddy awoke the next morning, he leaned up on his elbow rubbing his eyes, and was surprised to see the floor of the little room in which he found himself settling slowly down at one side. In a moment the floor rose again on that side, and the other side settled down. Then the whole room tilted sideways, and back again. It made him dizzy, and he closed his eyes, wondering what kind of a house he had gotten into. He decided he would get up and find out about it. He carefully rose and tried to walk across the floor to the window, as he stepped out, the floor seemed to go down under him, and he quickly grasped the bed. He put out his foot again, and the floor rose up. He was dizzier than before, and he had a queer sinking feeling in his stomach. 
As the floor tilted down sideways again, he made a dash to the opposite wall and held on there by the window. But the floor sank again, and he made another dash back to bed. He was cold and hot, and his head ached, and there was a feeling in his stomach as if, Oh, dear! He decided he would lie in bed for a few moments until he felt better. He remained there for two days. What occurred during those two days he could not remember very well afterwards. He slept a great deal, and it seemed that someone with a green patch over his eye came in now and then. But he paid very little attention. All he wanted was to go to sleep and stay asleep. On the morning after his third night, he sat up wide awake. He was hungry. He jumped up and dressed in a hurry. As the floor tilted and sank and rose with him, he thought he had never felt so delicious a sensation. He wondered if there would be bacon and eggs for breakfast. In a moment he had thrown open the door, and he was running up a short flight of steps. He was weak and tottery, but he paid no attention to that. He was at the top of the steps, and he drew in a deep breath of the cool morning air. He was standing on the deck of a great ship. Over his head clouds and clouds of beautiful white canvas swelled out to the breeze. The sun was sparkling merrily on the water, and there was no land to be seen anywhere. Up forward... The bow of the ship was dipping and rising regularly. There were three tall masts, and on the first two the sails were set square to the masts, and on the third lengthwise. Every sail seemed to be up. It was glorious. He walked forward up the deck. Here and there were men in blue overalls, cleaning the deck, coiling ropes, and polishing metal. And in a little house with windows a man was standing beside an upright wheel. Near the first mast, in a group, were Aunt Amanda, Mr. Toby, the church warden, and the two old codgers. Freddy hailed them with a shout. "'All right, young feller,' cried Mr. Toby, as Freddy came up. "'Here we are. How is this for a cork and spree? Beats all the Tolchester excursions you ever see. That's what I say. Blamed if it don't. I ain't been out of bed for two days.' "'No more has any of us,' said Aunt Amanda." Do you feel well, Freddy? I declare I'm quite excited. Isn't the air invigorating? Yes, um, said Freddy. What did you say in your note, Mr. Toby? What note? said Toby. Why, your note to my mother explaining about me and... By crack, he cried Toby. Blamed if I didn't clean forget all about it. Now ain't that too bad? What on earth are we going to do about it? Well, said Aunt Amanda... Now ain't that just like you, Toby Littleback? I declare, if your head wasn't fastened on, you'd... Wary reprehensible, said Mr. Punch. Wary. My dear friends, said the sly old codger, let us not be disquieted on such a morning as this. Everything is so beautiful, so beautiful, and without any expense whatever. It is a precious thought. How pleasant it is to hear the breeze blowing so gently among all the little capstans up there. He took off his high silk hat and looked up among the sails with a rapt expression on his face, and all the others looked up too, trying to see the capstans fluttering in the breeze. Look, cried Aunt Amanda, why, there's Mr. Hanlon. Far, far up near the top of the second mast was a white figure standing on a rope under the topmost sail and holding on with one hand and waving the other down at the passengers. Mr. Toby waved his white derby and Mr. Hanlon began to come down. Freddy trembled with alarm, but Mr. Hanlon was obviously having the time of his life. He skipped swiftly along his dangerous perch, and sliding down and along the spars of wood that held the sails, and actually leaping from one to another, and tripping lightly down ladders of rope, while the whole top swayed dizzily from side to side, he at length came down on the deck with a bounce, and bowing to everybody, shook Freddy by the hand. "'Here comes the able seaman,' cried Toby, "'and see what he's got on his wrist.' Mr. Lemuel Mizzen came rolling down the deck, and as he approached he took off his cap with his left hand and made a bow. On his right wrist was a blue and red parrot, who cocked his head sideways at the strangers, and then looked up inquiringly at the able seaman. "'Good morning, all,' said Mr. Mizzen. "'Glad to see the passengers come to life again. "'Nothing like the open sea, lady and gentlemen.' "'Are you sure it's perfectly safe?' said Aunt Amanda. "'Perfectly safe, ma'am. A tight little bark is a sieve. 
provided the dippers hold out. Most of the men is below now, bailing out the water with their dippers, and the ship ain't leaking more than ordinary, yet. Of course, you never can tell what may happen, but there's plenty of dippers, unless we should founder in a storm, or split up on the rocks, or... "'Mercy on us!' cried Aunt Amanda. "'I wish we hadn't come. "'If I only had some sewing with me. "'Would you mend socks, ma'am?' "'Oh, that would be lovely. "'And I could look after the men's shirts, too, "'and count the laundry when it comes home. "'And I'm sure we're going to have a delightful voyage. "'I feel better already. "'I don't believe there's any danger, after all. "'It's all nonsense about the ship's leaking. "'Who's your f f friends?' L lamb shrieked a voice from mr mizzen's wrist everyone started and looked in amazement at the parrot whose head was perked sideways up at mr mizzen's face l l lamb shrieked the parrot stuttering terribly who's your f f f friends never you mind said lemuel you'll find out soon enough breakfast ready anybody want breakfast before anyone had a chance to reply the parrot opened his mouth wide and gave a loud laugh and cried out, th th Three cheers! Th th there's ch chops, steak, b b bacon, and eggs. I'll have l liver and onions. Ha ha ha! The three ch cheers for l liver and onions! Be quiet, Marmaduke, said the able seaman. I'll lock you up again if you ain't careful. C -c 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 choo said Marmaduke, giving a loud sneeze, and rubbed his beak with his foot and fluttered his feathers. L -l Lock me up in the afterhole, till I g get all over this d d dreadful cold. T -t Three ch ch cheers for a f f fever. C -c 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 -choo. I'll lock you up in the afterhold if you don't quit being so fresh and bold. I'll learn you manners before I'm through. And if ever I hear one little cur choo said Marmaduke, finishing Mr. Mizzen's sentence for him very neatly. Everyone laughed except the able seaman. All right, said he. Just wait till I've had my chow. I'll attend to you proper. Now off with you. Now! And he tossed Master Marmaduke off his wrist up into the air. The parrot lit on a spar overhead, just under a sail, and peered down at the company without the least appearance of embarrassment. If there's b b bacon and eggs, he cried, I'll take the liver. The three ch cheers for the liver. Freddy burst into a merry laugh, and all his friends joined, all except Mr. Punch, who looked puzzled. How could he have liver, said he, if there was only bacon and eggs? At this, everyone laughed louder than before, and Mr. Punch was completely perplexed. I'll explain that to you some day, said Toby. "'Didn't you never hear a joke?' "'Oh, yes,' said Mr. Punch. "'I heard a very good joke once, a very good one indeed. "'How relate it to you. "'When I was a lad—' "'There's the breakfast bell,' said Mr. Mizzen. "'Sorry to interrupt, but we mustn't let it get cold. "'We'll hold the election afterwards.' "'No one waited to hear Mr. Punch's joke. "'The able seaman led the way, and all the others followed him down the deck— towards a kind of three-sided box which opened on a stairway below. In a moment or two they found themselves in the dining saloon, and in another moment they were seated about a round table, set for breakfast. The passengers insisted on the able seaman sitting down with them, and he consented to do so. A lad of about eighteen entered, to wait on the table. He had a shock of bright red hair and a kind of frightened look in his eyes, as if he were afraid he would do everything wrong and would always be in hot water about it. He stood behind the able seaman's chair, and began to make a queer contortion of the face in an effort to speak. The, 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 there's, he began. Skipper first, interrupted Mr. Mizzen, nodding towards Freddy. The cabin boy, for that was what he was, went to Freddy's chair and began to speak again, with the same contortion of the face. The, 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 there's, ch ch chops, to st steak, b b bacon, and eggs, he said. Yes, sir, said Freddy. The cabin boy stared in bewilderment and began again. The, 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 there's ch ch chops, st st steak, 
but bacon and eggs, said he. Yes, sir, said Freddy, much embarrassed. I don't blame you, Skipper, said the able seaman. I would, too, if I hadn't eaten for two days. Next. The cabin boy stood behind Aunt Amanda's chair and began. The, the, there's chops, steak, b -b bacon, and kchoo! He gave a hearty sneeze and pulled out his pocket handkerchief, so he had to begin all over again. The, 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 there's ch chops, ch chops, thank you, said Aunt Amanda. The cabin boy took his stand behind Toby's chair and began. There's, there's, the, 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 ka the, the, there's ch chops, ch chops and steak, said Toby. The cabin boy stood behind each of the other chairs in turn and repeated each time his entire list. Everybody gave a different order, and the boy became so bewildered at last that he wiped his forehead with his pocket handkerchief, brushed a tear from his eye, and when he had taken the last order, dashed out of the door with a kind of sob. As soon as he was gone, sounds came through the door by which he had left, as if a dreadful row was going on in the next room. "'Frightful temper, that cook,' said the able seaman. "'But the boy certainly does get on his nerves.' In a short time the cabin boy came in with four plates at once, and as he reached Freddy's chair, the ship gave a deep lurch downward, and the four plates shot out of his arms across the room, showering the floor with chops, steak, bacon, and eggs. The boy gave a wild cry and burst into tears, and fled through the door. From the next room came the sound of a row more violent than before. "'Never mind,' said Mr. Mizzen. "'He'll be back.' He came back presently, his eyes very red, and stumbling in and out, managed to put down before each one a plate. Every plate contained chops, steak, bacon, and eggs. "'Now,' said Mr. Mizzen, when the breakfast was over, "'we'll go up and hold the election.' When they came on deck, they were astonished to see a considerable number of men in blue overalls who were sitting on the deck in a group. As the passengers approached, they stood up respectfully, and one of them said something privately to Mr. Mizzen. "'They've held the election already,' said the able seaman, turning to the passengers. "'There's three dozen of them, and they've elected the captains and mates for the voyage, thirteen captains and twenty-three mates.' They went right ahead without waiting for me, so I'm the only able seaman left on the ship. What? said Aunt Amanda. Do you mean to tell me? It's all right, madam, said Mr. Mizzen in an undertone. You see, they're all free and equal, and everything goes by voting. They won't have it any other way. It's lucky they didn't all want to be captains. It's all right, anyway, because there's none of them knows anything about navigation, and I'm the only one on board that does know so it comes to the same thing as if they had elected me captain. But, of course, they don't think of that. Not a word. I'll send them about their business now, as soon as they put on their uniforms. Well, said Aunt Amanda, gasping, I never in my life? The thirteen captains and the twenty-three mates disappeared from the deck in a hurry, and in a very few minutes reappeared. Each one of them wore, in place of his blue overalls, a smart blue suit with brass buttons and gold braid, and a jaunty blue cap with gold braid around it, the mates having only nine instead of ten rows of braid around their sleeves. The able seaman led them aside, and after a few words with them returned to his passengers. Everything's settled, said he. Some of them are going below with their dippers, and the rest of them are to look after handling the ship. The navigation is left to me. We'll get along fine now provided the leaks don't get any worse. Freddy wandered off by himself to inspect the ship. He could walk very well now, in spite of the roll of the ship, and he went everywhere. He found himself finally on the after deck, leaning over the rail and watching the wake of the ship boiling away so white and beautiful behind. He was more and more delighted with his strange adventure. It was too bad that Mr. Toby had forgotten to write the note to his mother, but it couldn't be helped now, and they would sometime find a place somewhere or other where they could post a letter. It was so entrancing to be actually at sea on a ship, with the deck rising and falling, and the wake boiling away behind, and land nowhere in sight, that it would seem a pity ever to arrive at the Spanish main. But the thought of adventures there! 
However, he was in no hurry to have the voyage over. Aunt Amanda was sitting somewhere with a pile of sailor socks in her lap, perfectly contented. Mr. Hanlon was swinging his feet away up yonder from the topmost yard of the second mast. The churchwarden, Mr. Punch, Toby, and the sly old fox were engaged in an earnest discussion in chairs beside the deck-house. The old codger with the wooden leg was speaking confidentially in the year of the twenty-first mate, in an effort to borrow a pipeful of tobacco. Suddenly, Freddy heard behind him the loud, harsh laughter of Marmaduke the parrot. Turning round, he saw the parrot perched on the ship's rail, and before him was the cabin boy shaking his finger in the parrot's face, and storming away at him angrily. Freddy immediately went over to them. "'I w -w -w won't stand it no l l longer,' the cabin boy was bawling, his face nearly as red as his hair. "'I w -w -w won't! W -w -w what do you m -m mean by m -m mocking me all the t t time?' "'Who?' M -m 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 "'Me?' said the parrot. Y -y "'Yes! Y -y you!' cried the cabin boy. Just because I st st stutter, do you, do you, do you have to, have to st st stutter too? M m m m me? You're entirely m m m mistaken. You're the one that st 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 stutters. Ain't you always st saying, saying ch ch chops, st st steak, b b b bacon? And eggs? Ain't you? You've got to k k k quit r r right now. Do you hear? I w w won't stand it no l longer, and you b better believe it. Heidi tidy, sixty ninety, Uncle Sam, pop pop, th th there's ch chops, st st steak, b b bacon and eggs. Th three ch ch cheers. For liver and onions, the poor cabin boy burst out crying. All right, he sobbed, stamping his foot. All right, I c can't help it. If I do s stutter, but there ain't no p p parrot going to m m mock me, m m mizzen, nor no m m mizzen. I'll wring your blasted neck first, you ornery. L -l little varmint, you s -s see if I, see if I d -d -d don't. Marmaduke's my name, shrieked the parrot. Please to note the same. Pop, pop, pop. I'll have l -l liver and onions. L -l 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 liver and onions. L -l -l liver and onions. Pop, pop, pop. The cap'n boy, shaking with sobs, raised his hand threateningly. D -d 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 don't you d -d 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 dare t -t 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 -ker chew he sneezed, and out came his handkerchief. Ker chew sneezed the parrot and rubbed his beak with his foot. This was the last straw. The cabin boy reached for Marmaduke's neck and would surely have choked him then and there if Freddy had not caught his arm and pulled him away. The cabin boy allowed himself to be led off, and Freddy drew him along towards the companionway. Come along down to my room, said Freddy. All r r right, said the cabin boy, wiping his eyes and sniffling. All c c c come, b b b b but there's going to be trouble. Trouble on this sh ship along of that p parrot before this. Before this v voyage is over. You m m mark m m my w w w words. End of chapter 12. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Chapter 13 of The Old Tobacco Shop. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laurie Arsenault. The Old Tobacco Shop by William Bowen. Chapter 13 The Cabin Boy's Revenge. It was a soft moonlight night in southern seas. Our party of adventurers, with Mr. Mizzen in their midst, were sitting quietly on the after part of the deck, enjoying the balmy air and watching the bright track, which the full moon made on the water. 
the sea was very calm. There was only a light breeze, and the sieve was hardly moving. Mr. Mizzen was scratching the head of Marmaduke the parrot, who was perched on the able seaman's wrist. From the forward part of the deck, where the skippers and mates were sitting in a party of their own, could be heard the tinkle of a guitar and the sound of a voice singing. One always enjoys, said Mr. Punch, a bit of singing by moonlight on the water. I remember when I was a lad. Why don't you sing for us yourself, said Toby. Oh, do, cried several of the others. Mr. Punch looked down at the deck bashfully. I should be very glad to oblige, said he. But I have a slight cold, and besides, I only know one song. What is the name of it? said Aunt Amanda. Kathleen Mavournine, said Mr. Punch. That's a very good song, said Aunt Amanda. Sing it. Wait a minute, said Mr. Mizzen, and I'll get the guitar. I can play it. While he was gone, and while the others were talking, Freddy felt a hand on his arm, and looking down saw the cabin boy sitting on the deck beside his chair and winking up at him with a strange, excited look on his face. The cabin boy pulled Freddy's head down and whispered in his ear, K -k keep your eyes o -o -open, uh, open. Something's going to happen to to tonight. You'll see. Down with m m Mizzen and m m Marmaduke. Freddy gazed at the cabin boy in some alarm, and was about to ask a question when Mister Mizzen returned with the guitar. Now we're ready," said he taking his seat and putting Marmaduke on the rail of the ship. Here's the cord. All right, Mr. Punch. I really have such a cold, said Mr. Punch. That's understood, said Toby. Now then, strike up. Mr. Punch cleared his throat very loud and coughed once or twice and began to sing. Kathleen Mavornin, the gray dawn is breaking. The horn of the hunter is heard on the hill. Ha 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 ha! Roared Toby. The horn of the hunter. Blamed if I ever heard the like of that before. My stars! What's the matter, Mister Punch? Can't you put in a little H now and then? The horn of the unter. Oh, my stars. Ha, 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 ha. Mr. Punch was deeply offended. Hit is quite sufficient, said he. I shall sing no more. And nothing that anybody could say could induce him to go on. Toby Littleback, said Aunt Amanda. It's just like you, all over. Now you ask Mr. Punch's pardon, right this minute. Toby apologized, and Mr. Punch said that it was of no consequence whatever, but he would not sing. Then I guess you'll have to sing for us yourself, Mizzen, said Toby. Right-o, said Mr. Mizzen, thrumming on his guitar. What'll it be? The cabin boy sniffed and spoke in an undertone close to Freddy's ear. He'll be s s singing on the other s s side of his f face before this night's o o over. You mark m m m my w w words. Lady and gentlemen, began Mr. Mizzen. Kerchoo, sneezed the parrot. A wet sh sh sheet and a f f flowing s s s sea. Three cheers f f for the choo. Three cheers f f for hay f f be fever. Down with b b b both of them, whispered the cabin boy fiercely in Freddy's ear. Suppose you sing us something about yourself, said Aunt Amanda. 
"'Aye, aye, ma'am,' said Mr. Mizzen, and after playing a few chords and quivers on the guitar, he began to sing, in a voice like a foghorn muffled by a heavy fog, the following song concerning the life and adventures of L. Mizzen. <laughs> When I was a lad, I was bad as I could be. Wouldn't say thank you, nor please not me. And at church I wouldn't kneel, but only on one knee. And at school I wouldn't study my ABC. And I couldn't conscientious with the golden rule agree, nor understand the secret of its popularity nor get an ounce of pleasure from the rule of three. I was bad right through, sweared Holly Key. And worse sometimes, like Jiminy, scrawled with a pencil on my geography, stole birds' eggs in the huckleberry tree. Oh, I was bad, tried to learn a flea. How to keep his balance on a rolling pea? Oh, regular bad, and my ma said she, If you don't be better than what you be, I'll put you in the cupboard and turn the key. But I wouldn't, and I wouldn't, no siree. So I ran away to sea. Yes, I ran away to sea. With a little gingham, bottle of cambric tea, and a penny wrapped up in my handkerchief. For I wanted to be free, so I ran away to sea. Mr. Mizzen stopped and looked towards the stern of the ship. I thought, said he, I kind of noticed something queer about the stern rail. Looked as if it was lower, but I guess I'm mistaken. Everyone looked, but saw nothing amiss. The cabin boy tittered into Freddy's ear. Would you like to hear the second verse? said the able seaman. Yes, yes, go on, said several voices at once. It goes then, said Mr. Mizzen, thrumming on the guitar. After I ran away to sea, I had a good many adventures, and some of them, anyway. When I was young, I followed the equator from pole to pole in the ship perambulator a four-wheeled schooner a smoky old freighter loaded with sulfur for an old dead crater in the andes mountains and a night or two later with a three-knot gale blowing loud and rude as the dark grows darker and the gale increases of a sudden we strike and we goes all to pieces on the 47th parallel of latitude and then and there we formed a committee and went in a body up to london city and walked up the steps and pulled the little bell and spoke out bold to the lords of creation where they sat in their wigs making rules of navigation and explained to them the dangers of the deadly parallel take them down and pull them in that's the way we did begin tis and leaks nor tis and whiskey makes a sailor's life so risky it's the parallel that lies across our track it's the deadly parallel lying there so long and black is the subject of our moderate petition tisn't much that we are wishing but we humbly beg permission to implore coil them up we implore where they won't be in the way out of sight safe ashore we humbly pray for this many a tidy bark strikes against them in the dark and is never never heard of any more 
So we'll thank you heartily, if so very kind you'll be, and remove this awful danger from the sea. But we couldn't make them do it, no, they simply wouldn't do it, and the bailiff shoved us gently from the door. And we wept uncommon salty, for the reason did seem faulty, any way that we could view it. And the reason which they gave us why they really couldn't save us was because the thing had ne'er been done before. No such a thing had ne'er been done before. Mr. Mizzen stopped again and looked along the deck and up at the masts and said, I can't get it out of my head that the deck is slanting a little more than usual. The ship doesn't seem to come up well at the stern. However, would you like to hear any more of this song? Everybody begged him to go on. The cabin boy plucked Freddy's sleeve. I've done it. You'll s s s see. One that m m Marmaduke and that m m m Mizzen sing another tune when they f f f find out. Freddy looked at him in amazement, but the able seaman was commencing the third verse of his song. When I was older and bold as you please, I shipped on the good ship Firkin of Cheese. For a voyage of discovery in the far south seas To gather up a cargo of ambergris That grows in a cave on the amber trees Where the medicine men all find MDs for the sake of the usual medical fees crawling by night on their hands and knees in a strictly ethical manner to seize the amber fruit that is used to grease the itching palm in shackles disease on a long long voyage as busy as bees never stopping for a moment to take our ease never changing our course except when the breeze took to blowing to windward we had slipped by degrees down the oozy slopes of the hebrides and passed through the locks of the florida keys which in getting through was a rather tight squeeze but danger is nothing to men like these when suddenly the lookout a portuguese who had better been below a shelling piece shrieked out they are coming by twos and threes on the starboard bow we are lost we're lost we're lost we're lost came a terrible cry from the forward part of the ship as if in echo of mr mizzen's song we're lost the dippers the dippers everyone jumped up even aunt amanda the cabin boy whispered in freddie's ear in great excitement n -n 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 now you'll s see a man came running down the deck followed by all the skippers and mates. As he halted before Mr. Mizzen, he was evidently the cook by the white cook's cap he wore on his head. He took off his cap and wiped his forehead with his hand. He was in a state of mixed alarm and anger. "'We're lost!' he cried, and actually tore his hair with his hands. "'It's that rascally cabin boy. The dippers is gone, 
every last one of them, and the ship leaking by the barrel full. Let me get at that boy once, and I'll learn him. Frying on a slow fire would be too good for him. Swore he'd get even, he did, and now he's gone and done it, stole all the dippers. He's the one that done it, you can bet your last biscuit. There ain't a dipper left in the ship and the water pouring in by the barrel full. I just found it out while them lazy skippers and mates was lying around doing nothing. Give me one sea cook for all the skippers on the ocean. That's what I say. Every last dipper gone. Gone. We're lost. Everyone looked around for the cabin boy. He was nowhere to be seen, but his laugh was heard overhead, and his face was then seen looking down from the rigging just above. I've d d, d done it, he cried, shrieking with laughter. I'm even with you n n n n n now m m m m mizzen he l l l learned the parrot to m m m mock me he did and cook he b b b basted me in the g g g galley all the t t t t time and now I'm e e e even with all of them they ain't g g g going to t torment me no m m m m more i stole the dippers and th 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 threw em overboard every last one of em and n n n now you're g g g going to s s sink sink s i ink d d d down down d d d down to the bottom of the bottom of the s s s sea he laughed louder than before and the angry cook sprang forward to climb up after him but just then the ship gave a violent lurch backwards nearly upsetting everyone and settled down by the stern so that the end of the boat was completely under water aunt amanda screamed toby and mr punch came to her at once and supported her on each side there was a great hubbub. Everyone tried to speak at once. Freddy felt his hand grasped in the strong hand of Mr. Toby, and he began to feel somewhat less afraid. Over the hubbub could be heard the cabin boy's wild laugh. Everybody quiet, shouted Mr. Mizzen. We must think what we had better do. Yes, yes, cried a number of voices. What are we going to do? I wish, said Mr. Mizzen thoughtfully, I wish we had thought to bring a rowboat with us. What? cried Aunt Amanda. Do you mean to tell me that you came away on this long journey without an extra boat? We didn't think of it, said Mr. Mizzen. We had plenty of dippers, and we never thought of anybody's throwing them overboard. No, no, cried all the skippers and mates together. We never thought of that. Then bring out the life preservers at once, said Aunt Amanda, and be quick about it. We haven't any, said Mr. Mizzen. What would have been the use of life preservers if the dippers were all on board? We never thought we would need them. No, no, cried all the skippers and mates together. We never thought of that. Then think of something now, said Aunt Amanda. Don't you see the ship settling deeper in the water? The ship was in fact deeper in the water. It was sinking rapidly. The deck began to list so much toward the stern that it was difficult to stand on it. The ship was making no headway whatever. The breeze was even lighter than before, and the sails were hanging limp. It would have taken a stiff wind indeed to have moved that waterlogged boat, and it lay as if moored to a float, going up and down heavily in the long swell. Do you, er, think, said the old codger with the wooden leg, that we are in, er, danger? Danger, cried Aunt Amanda. Something must be done. Are you going to let us drown without turning a hand? There's only one thing to do, said Mr. Mizzen, and I don't know whether it will work or not, but we can try. Boys, bring up all the mattresses from the cabins and a coil of rope. Look alive now. The skippers and mates ran off in a great haste and disappeared down the hatchways. 
In a few minutes they had laid on the deck a great pile of mattresses. While this was being done, Aunt Amanda, whose bonnet and shawl had been brought to her by one of the men, tied her bonnet strings under her chin and put her shawl about her shoulders, in readiness for departure. "'Now then,' said Mr. Mizzen, "'lash the mattresses together.' The men proved themselves very handy with ropes. With Mr. Mizzen's help they lashed together securely a good number of the mattresses, and the first result of their work was a mattress raft some fifteen feet square and some four or five feet thick. A supply of oilcloth was found in the storeroom, and this was bound by ropes all over and under and around the raft. I don't know whether it will do, said Mr. Mizzen, but anyway there's nothing else that will do. Now, lads, over the side with her. All the men lent a hand, and the mattress raft was hoisted over the side and onto the water. To the satisfaction of everyone, it floated there quietly and easily, with its top well above the surface of the sea. Lucky it's a smooth sea, said Mr. Mizzen. We ought to be pleased with the state of the weather. Couldn't be better. I feel quite joyful about it. Oh, you do, said Aunt Amanda. Well, I don't feel joyful about it. What next? Put the provisions aboard, said the able seaman, whereupon some of the men placed on the raft a small barrel of water and some tins of meat, soup, biscuit, and other things. If you please, said Mr. Mizzen, when this had been done, I think the passengers had better get aboard. When you're aboard, we'll make another raft for ourselves. Are you ready? The passengers were helped to board the raft one after another. Although the raft bobbed up and down on the swell, it was not a difficult matter for the men and the boy to get on, for it was held fast against the side of the ship at a point where it was about even with the deck rail. Freddy gave a good spring and was on in no time. Mr. Hanlon, who did not seem in the least uneasy, got aboard with the agility of a cat. There was no trouble with anyone except Aunt Amanda, whose lameness impeded her movements a good deal. As the sly old fox, with his high silk hat on his head, was about to step over the side, he turned and said, I feel it my duty, Mr. Mizzen, to register a complaint against the outrageous treatment to which we are being subjected. I submit under protest, sir, under protest. If I had for one moment imagined, oh, bosh, said Toby, push him over, Mizzen. And the sly old fox was in fact somewhat rudely pushed over on to the raft. None of the others made any objection. Mr. Punch, who usually talked a good deal, was noticeably silent, and when Toby offered him a hand to help him over, he said stiffly, "'Hi, thank you, sir, but I do not require any assistance.' When the church warden took his seat in the middle of the raft, it went down alarmingly, but nothing happened, and when the old codger with the wooden leg was aboard, the party was complete. All the others sat around the church warden as close as they could huddle. It was evident that the raft would float them, at least until it should become waterlogged or a gale of wind should blow. The men on the ship now let go of the raft and proceeded to lash together the remaining mattresses for themselves. The raft floated quietly away from the ship. Aunt Amanda's arm was about Freddy. He did not feel, however, that he needed her protection. He had already forgotten his first alarm and he was feeling most of all what an extraordinary adventure it was that had befallen him. The men from the ship would be nearby on the other rafts, the sea was calm, the air was warm, and they would probably be picked up by some vessel before the food gave out. He supposed there were very few boys who had ever sailed the open sea on a mattress. "'Well, Freddy,' said Mr. Toby, as the raft continued to float slowly away from the ship, what do you think of this, eh? Have you got the map of Correction Island with you? Yes, sir, I have. It's in my pocket. Good, don't lose it. We may get to the island after all. Some day, you never can tell. By the way, Warden, 
Have you got your odor of sanctity? Safe in my pocket, said the church warden. What about you? Have you got the Chinaman's head? What? Me? The Chinaman's head? Oh, merciful fathers, I clean forgot it, cried Toby. Blamed if I didn't leave it in my room on the ship. Never thought about it once, if that don't beat all. What'll we do? We can't get back. We're floating away. Great jumping Joan, what'll we do? Well, gasped Aunt Amanda, won't you never get a head on your shoulders, you Toby Littleback? Can't you never remember anything? I declare, Toby Littleback, you are the most addlepated, exasperating, oh dear, we'd better hail the ship, quick! The party on the raft set up a loud cry, which was answered from the ship. The Chinaman's head, shouted Toby. On the dresser in my cabin. I forgot it. Run and get it. Quick, we're floating away. Aye, aye, sir, came a voice from the ship. The company on the raft waited anxiously. In a very few moments, which seemed like a great many, a hail came from the side of the ship, and they could see the cabin boy standing at a point of the deck where it was now sloped high out of the water, and he was holding the Chinaman's head aloft in both hands, as if about to throw it towards the raft. "'Don't throw it!' shouted Toby. "'Tie a rope to it first. But he was too late. The cabin boy raised the Chinaman's head higher, swinging his body sideways, and as a dark figure came up behind him and tried to seize his arm, he gave a mighty heave and toss, and sent the Chinaman's head flying through the air in the direction of the raft. For a second it glistened in the moonlight. In another second it descended towards the raft and almost reached it, but not quite. It came down within five feet of it and fell like a shot plump into the ocean. It splashed and that was all. The Chinaman's head was gone. A wail went up from the company on the raft at this terrible disaster. How terrible it really was they did not even yet understand, but they were soon to learn. Freddy was almost ready to burst into tears. Aunt Amanda was so exasperated that she could scarcely speak. The others seemed to be stupefied. Oh, 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 cried Aunt Amanda. You, Toby, you! Now you've done it for good. Why, why, why can't you never remember anything? It's your fault, and don't you never try to lay it to that cabin boy. And now what'll we do if we ever get separated from Mr. Mizzen? How'll we ever call him up to help us out of trouble if we get into it? Here's a pretty kettle of fish now, ain't it? I hope and pray we can stick close to Mr. Mizzen until we're all safe and... Look there, cried Mr. Punch. Bless me, Hayes, what do I see? Look at the ship. It was high time to look at the ship. No sooner had the Chinaman's head disappeared into the depths of the ocean than a change began to come over the ship. It grew paler and thinner in the moonlight. The green shutters along the side faded away one by one. The dark hull became lighter. The sails grew so thin that at last the watchers could see the stars shining through them. The whole ship seemed to waver and dissolve into a pale mist. It did not sink, no. The bow was still high out of the water, and all the masts and sails were visible. It simply faded away where it stood. As it was becoming more and more vague, the voice of Marmaduke the parrot came across the water out of the rigging, a faraway voice which grew fainter and fainter as the ship grew dimmer, until it died away as if in the distance. The, the, the three ch ch cheers, it said, the, the, the three ch ch cheers for li 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 liver and onions, the, the three ch ch cheers, li 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 liver and... As Marmaduke's voice died away, the ship dissolved like a pale ghost, and vanished. The sieve was gone. The party of adventurers sat on their mattress raft in the midst of the wide ocean, 
with never a ship to be seen. The long sea swell rolled placidly over the place where their ship had been. They sat huddled together in silence around the church warden, too horrified to speak a word. The moon glistened on the sly old codger's high silk hat. End of chapter 13 Recording by Lori Arsenault Chapter 14 of The Old Tobacco Shop This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. The Old Tobacco Shop by William Bowen. Chapter 14. The Cruise of the Mattresses. I wish, said Aunt Amanda, that I had brought some sewing with me. I don't suppose I could sew very well by moonlight on a mattress in the middle of the ocean, but I don't believe this would have happened if I'd had my sewing with me. I can't see how that would have, began Mr. Punch. Now look here, said Toby. We've got to sit in the middle of this here raft, or else she'll tilt over. Why don't you sit in the middle, warden? I am sitting in the middle, said the church warden. I wonder what the vestry would say if they could... I wish it distinctly understood, said the sly old fox, that I am here under protest. If I had for one moment imagined... Now listen to me, said Aunt Amanda. There's got to be a captain of this expedition, and as there's nobody here but a lot of helpless man-creatures... I suppose I've got to be the captain myself. All those in favor say aye. I'm elected. That's done. Warden, sit a little bit over to the right. Aye, aye, sir. Aye, aye, ma'am. Certainly, said the warden. Now everybody sit up close to the warden, said Aunt Amanda. There. Is the raft balanced now? Aye, aye, sir, said the church warden. I mean, aye, aye, ma'am. Then my orders, as captain, is to sit still and see what's going to happen. Nothing happened. Freddy grew sleepy and leaned his head against Aunt Amanda's shoulder. As he was falling off to sleep, a slim, dark object rose from the sea nearby and whirred across the ocean and plopped into the water. "'Bless me highs,' said Mr. Punch. "'It's a flying fish, as ever was.' "'Is it? Really?' said Freddy. Did he really fly? How wonderful is nature, said the sly old codger. Such an opportunity to improve the mind. My little friend, I trust you will profit by what you have seen. It is very educational. Very educational indeed. Ahem, said the old codger with the wooden leg. What do you suppose? Er, ahem, if you will pardon me, what are those little things sparkling out there on the surface of the water? It's a school of sardines, said Mr. Punch. I know them very well. When I was a lad... There must be millions of them, said Freddy. Just look. The tiny fish were leaping by thousands on the surface of the water, immediately in the path of moonlight, and they flashed and sparkled as they leaped. I believe there's a great fish after them, said Mr. Punch. Maybe a whole regiment of big fish, said Toby. By cracky, there's one now. As he spoke, a black fin cut the water near the sardines, and they became more agitated than ever. From the size of the fin, it must have been a very great fish indeed, and along the upper edge of the fin was a row of long, sharp saw teeth, looking big and strong enough to have sawed through a wooden plank. There's another one, cried Freddy. And another, and another, cried Aunt Amanda. There must have been five or six of the great fish. I hope they won't come near this boat, said Toby. One of them would just about turn us upside down if he struck us. Mercy, said Aunt Amanda. Don't say such a terrible thing. At that moment a great brown black back appeared above the surface of the water, some hundred yards or so away, and in another moment a great black blunt head joined itself to the back, and a spout of white vapor rose from the head. "'A whale!' cried several voices at once. "'Oh!' said Aunt Amanda. "'Suppose he should come this way!' The five or six fins of the great fish near the sardines now disappeared. 
the whale threw up his enormous tail and went down head first beneath the water. Almost immediately, one of the sawtooth fins reappeared, much nearer the raft than before. "'Merciful heavens!' cried Aunt Amanda. "'He's coming towards us. Oh, dear!' The great fish was, in fact, evidently making straight towards the raft. Freddy clutched Aunt Amanda's arm. The fin cut the water at a high speed. It disappeared at times, but on each reappearance it was still pointed towards the raft. "'He's nearly on us,' cried Aunt Amanda. "'Hold on tight, Freddy!' The great fish came on with a rush, and as he reached the raft struck it with his back and slid under it. There was a tremendous bump, which nearly sent the company flat. Then there was a rubbing under the raft, and everything was quiet again. "'He's gone,' said Toby. "'No, he isn't,' said Mr. Punch. "'Look at his tail!' A great tail could be seen beyond the edge of the raft, just below the surface of the water. It thrashed about and churned up the water violently for a few seconds, and then waved back and forth quietly, but it did not disappear. "'By cracky,' said Toby. "'He's stuck. His fin has got stuck into the bottom of the raft. He's got the whole kitten violin of us on his back.' "'Mercy on us,' said Aunt Amanda. "'Is it really true?' said Freddy. On due consideration, said the church warden, I think Toby's right. I believe he is, said Mr. Punch. Blind me if I ever rode on the back of a fish before. Now he's got us on his back. What's he going to do with us? We're moving, cried Freddy. So we are, said Aunt Amanda. Blamed if we ain't, said Toby. The mattress craft was in fact moving, very slowly, indeed, but still moving, and it was moving in the opposite direction to the fish's tail, which could be seen now and then under the water, waving back and forth like the tail of a swimming fish. "'If this don't beat all,' said Toby, "'that fish down there has certainly got his fin hooked into our mattress, and he's swimming along with us on top of him. I've seen a snail crawling with his shell on top of him, but a fish with a load of mattresses and livestock is a new thing to me.' I'm the captain, said Aunt Amanda, and my orders is to sit as still as you can and see where he's taking us to. Aye, aye, sir, said the church warden. I mean, aye, aye, ma'am. The party huddled on top of the mattresses sat as still as mice, hardly daring to breathe. Their little craft continued to move gently through the water. They expected each moment that the fish would free himself, but evidently his fin had embedded itself so firmly in one of the bottom mattresses that he could not get loose. He went on swimming with his load on his back. Hour after hour they waited to feel their craft stop, but hour after hour it moved gently and slowly across the surface of the sea. They settled themselves more comfortably against each other and spoke very little. No one noticed that their raft was now much lower in the water. The air was warm, the moonlight and the silence were extremely soothing, and the motion of the raft was gentle and languorous. Freddy's head sank against Aunt Amanda's shoulder, and his eyes closed, and in another moment he was asleep. Aunt Amanda herself nodded, and her eyes closed. She was asleep, too. Toby yawned and leaned heavily against the sly old codger. His eyes closed, and, in short, every eye closed, and every frame relaxed heavily against its neighbor, and at last, doubled over in a closely huddled group in the exact center of their mattresses, the whole party slept, each and every one. The raft went on steadily and quietly through the water, the moon glittered on the sea, the raft settled deeper and deeper, and there was absolute silence on the ocean, except for a slight groan which came regularly and gently from the nose of the church warden. End of chapter 14. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Chapter 15 of The Old Tobacco Shop. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. The Old Tobacco Shop by William Bowen, Chapter Fifteen, 
A Fall in the Dark Freddy was the first to be awake in the morning. He was cramped and stiff. He sat up straight, rubbed his eyes, and stretched his arms. He looked abroad, and the sight which met him caused him to grasp Aunt Amanda's hand in excitement. "'Land!' he cried, so loud that everyone awoke. "'Blamed if it ain't,' said Toby, and put on his white derby hat, considering that he had thereby dressed himself for the day. All the others sat bolt upright and stared across the smooth blue sea, sparkling in the sunlight. Not more than a quarter of a mile away rose a tall black cliff straight up out of the water. It stretched away on either hand for miles and miles, and came to an end in the ocean at the right hand and the left, so that it was probably the side of an island. The sea rolled up and down at the foot of the cliff, making a beautiful white splash against the rocks. "'But how on earth?' said Aunt Amanda. "'Are we ever to get ashore on such a place as that?' "'We're moving towards it,' said Freddy. "'Blamed if we ain't,' said Toby. "'We'll soon know whether we can get ashore or not.' They moved very slowly, and it was a long time before they came close enough to the cliff to see what their chances of a landing might be. They floated at last within two or three hundred yards of the cliff. It was very dangerous-looking. The waves rolled over huge black rocks at its foot and broke in white foam against its side. It seemed the last place in the world for a landing. A great swell rolled in from the sea and brought them nearer the breakers. "'My word!' cried Mr. Punch excitedly. "'There's a harch!' "'A what?' said Toby. "'See!' said Aunt Amanda. "'There's a little archway in the rock, like the mouth of a cave, over there to the right.' "'Don't you see? With the water pouring in? Over there!' It was true. There was an archway like the mouth of a cave, and into this the water was streaming in a strong current, making a kind of passageway, more or less smooth, through the breakers. "'Yes,' said Freddy, "'and I believe we're headed towards it.' Their course changed a little to the right, as if the fish who was piloting them had now taken a correct bearing." They found themselves in a passage through the breakers, where the water swirled in towards the arch. They were caught in this current, and were swept to a point close under the towering black rocks, and in another moment they were directly before the opening. The current seized the raft, as if with strong hands, and drew it in. They were in a cavern, narrow and high, whose interior was lost in darkness. The current carried them onward into the dark. The roar of the breakers suddenly ceased, and as they looked behind them, the archway was no more than a speck of light. Their raft turned slightly to the left, and at that moment the speck of light disappeared, as if they had turned a corner, and the darkness became so black that no one could see even the person sitting next to him. "'I wonder,' said Toby, "'if there are any matches and candles on board this boat. I'm going to see.' He was silent for a while, and it was evident from the tilting of the raft that he had moved his position. Finally he said, Ah! and a match spluttered and went out in the breeze which was blowing past them, but after it went out there remained a glimmer, and Toby was holding up a lighted candle and shielding it from the draft with his hand. Found him in the tin with the biscuits, said Toby. He held the candle on high so that its little beam searched out the darkness in front and on both sides. They were in a narrow passageway, on each side was a wall of solid rock, not ten feet beyond the edge of the raft. How high the wall was they could not tell, for it was lost in the darkness overhead. They were slipping along a narrow alleyway of water. Toby held the candle higher, and everyone peered into the darkness ahead, but it was impossible to see more than a few yards. "'I wish it distinctly understood,' said the sly old codger, "'that I am here under... "'Never mind,' said Aunt Amanda. "'My orders as captain is to say nothing and wait and see what will happen.' The raft turned a corner to the right, and slipped on silently in that direction for a long distance, probably for more than a mile. Then the raft turned again, this time to the left, and after about ten minutes longer Toby suddenly said, "'Shh! Shh! What's that?' They all listened and heard afar off a sound as of rushing water, very faint but unmistakable. Er, 
"'Excuse me,' said the old codger with the wooden leg. "'Do you think, ahem, there is any, er, danger?' "'I don't like it,' said Aunt Amanda. "'I don't think it's safe in here.' "'I think we are lower in the water,' said Freddy. "'So we are,' said Toby. "'The water's coming up over the top now, "'and if we don't get on dry land soon, "'we'll all be sitting in a puddle.' In spite of its being waterlogged and lower in the water, the raft was beginning to go faster, for the current had suddenly become swifter. The wind blew stronger. It swept through the narrow passageway so briskly that Toby put his hat over the candle. But he was too late. The light wavered and went out. A groan went up from the company. "'I can hear that rushing sound plainer,' said Aunt Amanda. "'It's wary like a waterfall,' said Mr. Punch." I wish it understood, said the sly old fox, distinctly understood, that I am here under protest. If I had ever for one moment imagined... Oh, 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 screamed Aunt Amanda. We're going faster. Uh, uh, oh! She threw her arms around Freddy and held him tight. The current suddenly became swifter. The raft, almost under water, was leaping forward at a frightful speed. Directly ahead of them, Growing louder and louder was the roar of rushing water. "'Hold on tight, Freddy!' cried Aunt Amanda. "'We'll all be done for,' shouted Toby. "'In another minute, I reckon. Hold on tight!' As Toby said this, the raft almost galloped. The roar of falling water burst on them from close ahead. The raft seemed to rise up and then to sink down. Its nose slanted downward. The roar of falling water was all about them. Aunt Amanda screamed, but no one could hear her. The raft paused and teetered for an instant. Then it pointed downward, almost straight, and the whole party, the raft and the fish under the raft, plunged downward through the darkness on a cascade of tumbling water. Down, down, down. The raft shot from under, and the passengers shot off. In a twinkling they were going down the waterfall on their backs, would they never reach the bottom? There did not seem to be any bottom, but, in another moment, there were Aunt Amanda and Freddy, her arms still about him, standing on their feet in about twenty-four inches of quiet water on a solid bottom. Dark forms appeared, one after another, beside them, and almost at once all the party were standing together in a group, in about two feet of quiet water, on a solid bottom. I fear said the voice of the sly old codger, that I have lost my hat. They could see they were in a great chamber, whose walls they could make out dimly on each side. They could not see the top of the waterfall, but they could see its lower part very plainly. Through the tumbling water of the fall, near the bottom, sunlight was shining. Behind the water was an opening some six feet high, and as the water fell across this opening, the sunlight from without shone through it, making it glow with green and sparkle with white. The waterfall hung over this opening like a curtain. Well, said Aunt Amanda, I'm pretty near drowned, and my clothes are a sight to behold. But I'm the captain of this expedition, and my orders is that we go ashore. The water proved to be shallow all about them, and they waded to a strip of dry ground beside the wall which rose at their left as they faced the fall. Aunt Amanda, whose cane was gone, was assisted by Mr. Toby and Mr. Punch. "'Blamed if my hat ain't gone, too,' said Toby. "'She was a good hat. I'll have to say that for her.' The party walked along the edge of the water and came to the end wall of the chamber, opposite the fall. There lay the wreck of the raft, with the tail of the great fish sticking out from beneath. "'I fear,' said the sly old codger, "'that the faithful creature has departed this life.' "'He's dead as a doornail,' said Toby. "'Poor thing,' said Aunt Amanda. "'Anyway, my orders is to explore this cavern "'and see what we can find.' "'At this end of the cavern the water was slipping away under the wall, "'and this outlet explained why the water inside remained so shallow. "'The party commented on it, "'and then walked along the side wall towards the other end where the fall was. "'When they were midway along this wall, a cry from Toby,' who had left Aunt Amanda to the care of Mr. Punch, startled the others. "'What's this?' he cried. "'Look here!' 
He was stooping over something, and as the others gathered round, they saw that he was stooping over a pile of small square boxes, standing in several long rows along the wall. Mr. Hanlon lifted one of the boxes with a great effort and shook it. A jingling sound came from within. Aha, said the sly old fox, that beautiful music. It is the sound, dear friends, the sound of, of money. Bless my soul, cried Aunt Amanda. Is it? My opinion is, said the church warden, that there is gold in that box. Then open it, said Aunt Amanda. Mr. Hanlon shook his head. The box was locked tight, and it was bound with iron bands. All the boxes were locked, and they were all bound with iron bands. Come along this way, said Toby. There's something more here. Further along the wall, leaning against it, was a row of large coffee sacks, each bound around the mouth by strong twine. One of these sacks Mr. Hanlon quickly opened. He tilted it over and poured out its contents on the ground. The party of onlookers gasped with astonishment. From the mouth of the bag fell pearl necklaces, diamond rings, ruby rings, emerald rings, all kinds of rings, gold bracelets and chains, silver forks and spoons, gold toothpicks, gold cups, silver vases, and a great variety of other things of the same sort. It was a moment or two before anyone spoke. Then the church warden said, It's my opinion that this is pirate's treasure. Mercy on us, said Aunt Amanda, and they may be in here on us any minute. Mr. Hanlon opened others of the bags. Each was filled with rare and costly articles of gold, silver, and precious stones. Do you think it's really pirates? said Freddy, in an awed whisper. Not a doubt of it, said Toby, in a voice much lower than before. Look at this. He pointed to a placard on the wall above the sacks. The light was almost too dim for reading, but the writing on the placard was very large, and Toby, by standing on one of the bags, was able to make it out. He read it aloud. Beware. Hands off. Whoever shall touch it, he shall die by the hand of Lingo, with a knife in the throat. Long live King James and the Jolly Roger. There's a skull and crossbones under it, said Toby. Pirates, as sure as you're born. We'd better be getting away from here, said Aunt Amanda. Better not speak so loud, said Toby. How are we to... Shh, said the old codger with the wooden leg in a frightened whisper. Excuse me. Look, I saw something under the waterfall. What's that? Stand close back against the wall, whispered Toby, and don't speak a word. They crowded back against the wall alongside of the treasure and looked towards the waterfall. A dark object was rising from the shallow water at the foot of the fall. As they watched, another dark object appeared to come through from under the fall and apparently from behind it, and this object rose also from the shallow water near the foot of the fall and took its place beside the other. One after another, five more of these dark objects came from under the fall and apparently from behind it and stood upright in the shallow water. There were now seven in all. They moved in a group towards the shore. Each of them had two legs, and each was muffled from top to toe in a single loose garment with baggy legs. They walked somewhat like a company of bears. They stood on the dry ground, and one of them proceeded to take off the loose garment with which he was muffled, while the others assisted him with evident deference. First came off a close hood which covered his head, cheeks, and neck. As the watchers by the wall saw his head, they held their breath in terror, and Aunt Amanda clutched Freddy's arm. Around the head was a tight-fitting kerchief, knotted behind. In his ears were great round earrings, and gripped between his teeth was a long pointed knife. Aunt Amanda gave a sign as if she was about to scream, but Toby quickly put his hand over her mouth. As the man with the earrings got himself out of the legs of his loose garment, the party by the wall saw that he was a short and burly man of a ferocious aspect. In a sash which he wore was stuck on one side a cutlass and on the other a long pistol. He wore no coat, and his shirt was open at the throat. His arms showed from the elbows down, and they were thick with muscles. His trousers were knee-breeches. 
buckled just below the knee, and he was very bow-legged. His calves were big and knotted. When his outer covering had been removed, it was plain that he was perfectly dry from head to foot, except for water on his face and hands, and while the others were taking off their coverings, he withdrew with one hand the knife from between his teeth, and with the other hand wiped the water from his eyes and face. He then stuck the knife in his sash, waved his hands somewhat daintily in the air as if to dry them, took from his breeches pocket a large white handkerchief, completed with this handkerchief the drying of his face and hands, examined his fingernails carefully, blew on them, and proceeded to polish them delicately with his pocket handkerchief, at the same time swearing two dreadful oaths, in a low tone of voice, at the six men who were struggling with their coverings. When these had been removed, the six appeared in much the same style of dress as the first, and each wore a cutlass and a pistol. But their clothing was much ruder than his, and they had no earrings. Instead of sashes, they wore leather belts. Kerchoo! rang out a sneeze as sharp as a pistol shot from the party by the wall. Dear me, said the sly old codger out loud, I do believe I'm catching cold. At the sudden discharge of the sneeze, the seven men jumped as if they had in fact been shot. Each one snatched out his cutlass with his right hand and his pistol with his left and faced in the direction of the sneeze. "'Confound your cold,' whispered Toby fiercely to the sly old codger. "'Now we're done for.' The seven men, with their cutlasses and pistols, with the earring men in the lead, tiptoed stealthily in the direction of the sneeze. As they came closer to the party who were crouched against the wall, Aunt Amanda slipped down quietly to the ground at Toby's feet. The captain of the expedition had fainted. End of chapter 15 Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Chapter 16 of The Old Tobacco Shop. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laurie Arsenault. The Old Tobacco Shop. By William Bowen, Chapter Sixteen. Captain Lingo and a fine piece of headwork. The man with the earrings muttered something in a fierce undertone to his six followers. They spread out behind him in a wide line. With a stealthy step, they came forward noiselessly. The party by the wall held their breath in terror. Nearer and nearer came the seven men, still in perfect silence. They reached the cowering company by the wall, leveled their pistols at their breasts, held up their cutlasses ready to strike, and looked at their leader for the command to kill. At this moment the man with the earrings observed the form of Aunt Amanda on the ground. He stooped down and examined her, and stood up again. Then he eyed the company of travelers with a hard, cold eye, and spoke deliberately in a low voice. His manner of speech was somewhat stilted and precise, and scarcely what might have been expected of a pirate. "'The ceremony,' said he, "'will be deferred for the moment. I commend you, meanwhile, to perfect quietness. One movement, and the consequences may be fatal. A hint is sufficient. I perceive here a lady in distress. "'Tis a monstrous pity, indeed. I regret that we were unaware of the presence of a lady.' Had we known, we should certainly have taken our measures more fittingly. I crave your pardon. No one has yet accused Captain Lingo of rudeness to a lady. Ketch, put up thy cutlass and go straightway to the pool, and wet this pocket handkerchief. Be brisk, thou muddle-pated son of a sea-cook. Haste! The man called Ketch jumped as though he had been stung and took from Captain Lingo's hand a fine white cambric handkerchief, which the captain had produced from his breeches pocket, and running to the water, moistened it and returned in great haste. While this was going on, the poor captives were able to examine their chief captor more carefully. They remarked with surprise the fine quality of the handkerchief with which he had handed to his man, 
and they were even more surprised to note the whiteness and fineness of the linen of his shirt. His breeches were of blue velvet, and his sash and the kerchief which bound his head were of crimson silk. On the fingers of each hand he wore three or four diamond rings, which sparkled brilliantly in the half-darkness. His stockings were plainly of silk, and the buckles at his knees and on his shoes were of polished silver outlined in diamonds. His face was hard and cruel, but its unpleasantness may have been due to a long scar which crossed his mouth from his right cheek to his chin. When he smiled, as he did in referring to the lady in distress, the scar gave to his face a singularly evil expression. Taking the wet handkerchief from Ketch's hand, he knelt beside Aunt Amanda and bathed her face and wrists, slapping her cheeks and temples smartly now and then with the handkerchief and changing her position so that her head lay lower than her body. After he had worked over her with much care for a few moments, Aunt Amanda opened her eyes. She was staring at the frightful crooked smile of a strange man with rings in his ears and a kerchief on his head. She started up, bewildered. "'Where's Toby? Where am I? Who are you?' "'Captain Lingo, ma'am,' said the strange man. "'At your service.' "'Let me up,' said Aunt Amanda. She struggled to her feet, rejecting the assistance offered by the ear-ringed man, and stood facing him, her bed-raggled bonnet very much over her right ear. "'Who are you?' she said again. "'Your humble servant, ma'am,' said the strange man, smiling his crooked smile. "'Captain Lingo by name, a gentleman adventure of the high seas, owner of the treasure which you have discovered here in our little retreat, known here on the Spanish main as the scourge of ships, and loyal servant of his blessed majesty King James, whom the saints defend, your obedient humble servant to command.' He made the lady a very courtly bow. Toby whispered into Freddy's ear, "'He can't be so terrible bad, not with all that polite way of talking. Don't be afraid. We'll be all right with this pirate. Who on earth is King James?' Aunt Amanda was also much relieved by the pirate's polite address. "'As long as you are my obedient servant,' said she, I'll thank you to help us to get out of here as soon as possible. We didn't want to come in the first place, and we are in a hurry to get out. Captain Lingo laughed heartily. They are in a hurry to get out, lads, he said to his companions. And at this they all laughed uproariously. I don't see anything to laugh at, said Aunt Amanda. If we don't get out of here soon, we'll catch our death of cold. This made Captain Lingo laugh more heartily than before. Ha, ha, ha! Their death of cold. That would be a rare fine thing, but a bit too slow, lads, eh? And the other six laughed again, so that the walls of the chamber echoed with their mirth. What do you mean by too slow? said Aunt Amanda. Madam, said Captain Lingo, we are a little pressed for time. We really could not wait for you to die of colds. What? said Aunt Amanda faintly, her feeling of confidence beginning to ooze away. Do you mean to say? Madam, said the pirate seriously, I will put it to you plainly. Our treasure, which you have discovered, has taken a great deal of hard work to accumulate. We really couldn't bear to lose it. The people of this island and a great many other people besides have been trying for many years to find it. You have not only found it, but you have even gone so far as to open certain of our bags in spite of the warning posted above your heads. Now picture to yourselves, dear madam and gentlemen, what consequences would certainly ensue if you were to leave here <clears throat> alive. Oh, gasped Aunt Amanda, leave here alive. All the fruits of our industry would be lost, and our own safety would be imperiled. You will readily see that, of course. Tis a pity so many will have to die at once, for it will mess up the place very badly, and I always endeavor to be neat. 
But why, why did so many of you come at once? Couldn't you have come, say, two at a time? It would have made so much less trouble. Ho, oh, said Mr. Punch, if we had only stopped at Ohm, all of us. However, I do not wish you to feel too keenly the trouble you are putting us to. My brave lads will cheerfully put up with the inconvenience, though I must confess the amount of blood will be quite unusual, and so many bodies will be troublesome to bury. I wish it were possible to have you walk the plank. However, pray do not bother too much on our account. We weren't thinking about you at all, said Toby. We were thinking about ourselves. Oh, said Captain Lingo in a tone of disappointment. I beg your pardon. I misunderstood. At any rate, we will now prepare for our little ceremony. If there are any trifling articles of jewelry and the like, I will be pleased to... But this boy, cried Toby, and this lady, you don't mean to... You can't mean... Not for worlds, said Captain Lingo. Would I be rude to a lady? I trust you will find my conduct towards the lady beyond reproach. There shall be no rudeness of any kind. Merely a quick stroke, and all will be over. No violence, no roughness of any kind, not a word to offend the most sensitive ears. A single stroke, and the affair is done. And let me tell you, I have here with me a practitioner who is very expert in this sort of business. Our friend Ketch, in fact, who was so kind as to wet the handkerchief for the lady. I assure you that you are in great luck to fall into the hands of such a practitioner. He will make it as pleasant for you as possible. One stroke only, I promise you. With one stroke of a cutlass, he is able to slice off a head as neatly as you could do with a broad axe. There are very few who can do it with a cutlass, let me tell you that. Many men have become famous by being operated on by catch. I remember a case, however, he said, looking about him as if considering something, and speaking rather to himself than to the others. It would be difficult to bury the bodies here, and the light is not very good, I think. Yes, I think it had better be done outside. You are already wet, and I trust that another immersion will not inconvenience you too much, lads, he said to his six men. Put on the rubber suits and help our friends under the fall. Look alive now. The six men immediately ran to their rubber suits and began to put them on. While they were doing this, Toby put one arm about Freddy and the other about Aunt Amanda. She lowered her head to his shoulder for a moment, but she soon raised it, and standing very erect, she said, Very well, if it must be, it must. It's easy to see that this bloodthirsty villain means every word he says, but I ain't going to whimper. I'm the captain, and I order that everybody keep up his courage and wait and see what will happen. Aye, aye, ma'am, said the church warden. "'Do you know?' whispered the old codger with the wooden leg. "'I believe that we are in a good deal of, er, danger.' Freddy put his hand in Toby's and held it tight. "'You keep close to me if you can,' said Toby, squeezing his hand. "'We may be rescued at the last minute. "'You never can tell. "'Don't lose your nerve.' Freddy was trembling with fear, "'and the hand which held Toby's was as cold as ice.' But he said nothing. The others were being brave, and he resolved that he would be as brave as the rest, up to the very last. He began to think of his mother and his father, and to wonder what would become of them if he should be... But he forced himself not to think of that. He pressed his lips tight together and commanded himself to be brave. The six pirates returned, clad in their baggy rubber suits, and looking very much like bears walking on their hind legs. They brought with them Captain Lingo's suit and helped him to get into it. When he was encased like the others, with only his hands and face showing, he said, Now, madam, I will assist you to the fall. We'll attend to that. Put in Toby quickly. Come on, Mr. Punch. On Amanda's cane having been lost, 
she found more difficulty in walking than formerly, but Toby and Mr. Punch supported her to such good effect that she kept up with the others very well on their march into the water towards the fall. All, except the pirates, shivered as the cold water came again around their knees, and they looked with fear upon the tumbling cataract which they were required to go under. There was no help for it, however. The seven pirates surrounded them and persuaded them to go on. They stood in a forlorn group in the quiet water near the foot of the fall. "'Now, madam,' said Captain Lingo, "'I will help you under.' Toby and Mr. Punch, feeling that the pirate knew the way better than they did, resigned on Amanda to his care, not without some fear that the villain might deliberately drown her on the way through. He made her kneel in the water, and then lie flat, and with a strong arm he pulled her under the waterfall and out of sight. "'You're next,' said a deep voice to Freddy, and Ketch the practitioner seized him and plunged with him under the water, and in an instant they had disappeared beyond the fall. One after another the miserable shivering victims were assisted by the pirates under the water, and one by one disappeared. The old codger with the wooden leg was the last, and one of the pirates returned for him. When he had followed the others, the great half-dark chamber remained as it had been before, in its empty solitude and gloom, without an ear to hear the steady rush of water pouring incessantly down its fall. On the outer side of that rushing fall was a scene very different indeed. The pirates and their captives stood under a blazing sun, looking across a wide and beautiful landscape. Behind them, in the side of a hill high overgrown with bushes, was the hole by which they had come forth, and across the inside of this hole was the curtain of falling water. Freddy wondered how anyone had ever had the courage to plunge for the first time through that curtain into the unknown dark. The heat of the sun was very grateful, and the clothing of the soaked travelers began to dry perceptibly at once. The pirates took off their rubber suits. Beneath the observers the ground sloped down into a broad valley, checkered with grass meadows and dotted with trees. To their left, as they gazed out across the landscape, the ground rose from the valley by easy stages to a great height, no doubt forming the landward side of the black cliff which bordered the ocean. To the right, the country rolled gently away from the valley in a vast unbroken forest, a shimmering green ocean of treetops as far as the eye could see, far, far off where the forest rose in a kind of mound. Freddy thought he could see what looked like the top of a round tower just emerging above the haze of trees. The pirates and their captives were standing on a little grassy plateau on which were great boulders here and there, and a few wide leafy trees. Two or three fallen logs were lying near the edge of the plateau, where it began to slope downward. Captain Lingo stepped out of his rubber suit, spread out his fine white handkerchief on a boulder to dry, and twiddled his moist fingers daintily in the air, after which he blew on his fingernails and polished them on his shirt sleeves. We are now ready, said he, for the ceremony. Ketch, thy cutlass. Ketch drew his cutlass from his belt and handed it to the captain. It glittered wickedly in the sunlight. The captain ran his thumb along its edge and nodded his head with satisfaction. It will do, said he. One stroke for each will be quite sufficient. We will now proceed with the ceremony. He restored the cutlass to the practitioner, who raised it high and gave a swinging slash downward with it, as if to test his eye and arm. The practitioner then rolled his right shirt sleeve up to his shoulder. He was the largest man in the party, and his arm was the arm of a blacksmith. Stop! cried Mr. Punch. One moment, Captain Lingo, you are a Englishman, aren't you? I am an Englishman, said the captain, swelling out his chest. 
Long live King James. Hi, am a Englishman also, said Mr. Punch, swelling out his chest. You can't murder a fellow countryman in cold blood now, can you? I see you couldn't do that, you know. We're both subjects of Her Gracious Majesty, we are. Long live Queen Victoria. Who? said Captain Lingo. Queen Victoria, cried Mr. Punch. She'd never, never forgive you if... Never heard of her, said Captain Lingo calmly. I'm a loyal subject of His Catholic Majesty King James the Second. May all the saints defend him. King James the Second, cried Mr. Punch. Why, he's been dead these two hundred year, nearly, even as dead as Christopher Columbus. Captain Lingo started violently, and his face became dark with anger. Dead? King James dead? Do you mark that, lads? He calls his blessed majesty dead. Aha! Thou renegade Englishman, thou hast imagined the death of the king, a felony by St. George, and the punishment is death. What, thou reprobate, dost thou not know? Tis a felony punishable by death to imagine the death of the king. But he is dead. One can't live two hundred years, you know. You hear, said Captain Lingo, his voice quivering with rage. He imagines the death of the king. Any judge in the kingdom would sentence him to die for that. Tis the law. But enough talk. Captain Lingo is not the man to stand by and see the law defied. For that, my pretty Englishman, thou shalt die the death twice over. There shall be violence in thy case. Thou shalt wish thou hast never been born. Thou shalt be kept for the last. Aye, aye, there shall be fine sport at his taking off. Eh, lads? Enough. Proceed with the ceremony. To imagine the death of the king. Catch! Art thou ready? Aye, aye, Captain, said the practitioner. The captain cast his angry eye over the terrified group shivering in their damp garments. One of you must be first. Who shall be first? Let me see. Each person quailed as the pirate's eye rested on him. One moment. We will decide it by chance. He plucked seven sprigs of grass and broke them into varying lengths. He then held them all in his hand so that only the even ends showed. Now choose, said he. The longest blade shall be first. Each drew a blade of grass, except Mr. Punch, who had already been reserved for the last. Thou shalt be quartered alive, said the captain to him, to dare imagine the death of the king. Freddy trembled as he drew his sprig of grass, but he did not draw the longest. The longest blade fell to Mr. Hanlon, and the next to Freddy. Mr. Toby was the third, the church warden fourth, the sly old codger fifth, Aunt Amanda sixth, and the old codger with the wooden leg seventh. We will use that fallen log, said the captain, and led the way towards it. He was now very stern. All his politeness had been dissipated by the offense of Mr. Punch. Toby, said Aunt Amanda, as they were moving towards the place of the ceremony, I hope you will excuse me for all the cross words I have ever spoken to you. Oh, nonsense, Aunt Amanda, said Toby, sniffling a little. I've been a trial enough. I know it. What will become of the shop? Poor Freddy, said Aunt Amanda. It just breaks my heart to see him so brave. He's so young to have to, to, and his poor mother. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Now then, said Captain Lingo, you may sit down on the grass until your turn come. Toby helped Aunt Amanda to sit down. Freddy sat beside her and pressed his white face against her shoulder. The others grouped themselves on the grass about them, all except Mr. Hanlon, who, knowing that his time had come, stepped forward and stood before Ketch, the practitioner, who was feeling the edge of his cutlass. 
one of the pirates produced from his pocket some strong twine and bound Mr. Hanlon's arms behind him. On a sign from Captain Lingo, this man led Mr. Hanlon to the fallen log and made him kneel beside it and rest his head face down upon it so that there was a good view from above of the back of his neck. The dreadful moment had arrived. Ketch the practitioner took his place by Mr. Hanlon's side, planted his feet firmly wide apart, tucked in his right shirt sleeve at the shoulder, and raised his gleaming cutlass high above his head. A scream from Aunt Amanda made him hesitate for an instant, but only for an instant, as Aunt Amanda and Freddy closed their eyes and buried their faces in their hands, the cutlet flashed twice around the head of Ketch and came down with a swift and horrible slash straight upon the back of Mr. Hanlon's neck. A single stroke was enough. Mr. Hanlon's head rolled off upon the ground. "'Well done, Ketch,' said Captain Lingo quietly. "'I doubt if there's another hand on the Spanish main could have done it. Ketch blushed with honest pride at these gracious words. He swung his bloody cutlass in embarrassment. All the pirates turned towards the pale group on the grass, and Captain Lingo said, Next! Freddy stood up. His knees began to tremble under him, and his heart was beating so fast that he could hardly breathe. Aunt Amanda flung her arms about him as he stood beside her, and cried, no, 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 in a voice of anguish. All eyes were on the little boy as he stood awaiting his dreadful fate with Aunt Amanda's arms about him. His time had come. His friends were waiting to see if he would be brave, and though his face was white, his courage did not fail him. He looked at them in farewell, and each one gave him a tearful gaze in return. He turned his eyes towards the warm and friendly landscape for a last look at the world he was about to leave. It would be hard to go, and he would need all his strength to bear the— A loud cry from Freddy startled all the others, and pointed a shaking finger. They looked, and what they saw was Mr. Hanlon. By the log on which his head had been cut off, Mr. Hanlon was standing— his hands behind his back, and his head in its proper place on his shoulders. He was smiling and bowing, and as the astonished spectators gazed at him with their mouths open, he sprang lightly into the air and clicked his heels together as he came down. Ha, 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 laughed Toby in spite of himself. Freddy, we've seen that little act before, haven't we? Freddy nodded. He remembered very well the first time he had seen Mr. Hanlon's head cut off at the Gaunt Street Theatre at home. He wondered that he had not thought of it before. Captain Lingo was plainly very angry. His face turned a purple hue, and the scar across his mouth showed very white. He fingered his knife dangerously, and at the same time glared at Ketch, who was scratching his head in bewilderment. The captain did not raise his voice, but he spoke with deadly earnestness. "'A fine workman thou, friend Ketch,' said he. "'Truly a pretty hand with a cutlass, thou son of a sea-cook. I've a mind to let a little of thy blood with this knife, thou scurvy knave. But I will give thee one more chance. If thou fail again, by St. George thou shalt die the death. One more now, and remember. It was Ketch's turn now to tremble. He knew very well the Captain Lingo would do as he had said, if he should fail a second time. His own life hung on a thread now. Aye, aye, Captain, he said huskily, and led Mr. Hanlon back to the fallen log, and made him kneel as before. As Mr. Hanlon's head lay across the log, he turned it round towards his friends and gave them a long, slow wink. Ketch's cutlass flashed as before. Round his head it swung twice, and down it came with a slashing stroke straight and true on the back of Mr. Hanlon's neck. Off rolled Mr. Hanlon's head upon the ground. Everyone watched breathlessly. 
and Ketch did not breathe at all. For a second, Mr. Hanlon's body continued to kneel, headless, beside the log. Then the head on the ground popped like a flash to the neck it belonged to and fastened itself accurately there in place. Ketch turned ghastly pale. Mr. Hanlon sprang up, opened his mouth wide in a soundless laugh, bowed to Captain Lingo, jumped lightly into the air, and clicked his heels together three times as he came down. Captain Lingo's face was a terrible sight to see. He gazed steadily at Ketch. The unfortunate practitioner was shaking like a leaf. Captain Lingo slowly drew his knife and held it behind him in his right hand. With the other hand he pointed to the ground before him. "'Hither, dog!' he said in a quiet, even voice. Ketch hesitated, gave a wild look about him, and advanced slowly towards his captain. When he reached him he fell on his knees and held up his shaking hands. "'No, no, no, captain!' he cried. "'Don't do it! Oh, please don't do it! I done my duty always, and I ain't never failed before. Remember my poor old mother, captain!' Give me one chance, Captain, just one. Don't kill me, Captain. Captain! The expression on Lingo's face did not change, but the glitter in his eye became even more murderous than before. He said not a word, but with his left hand snatched off the kerchief which bound Ketch's head, and seized him by the hair, and with his other hand he brought the knife swiftly around in front and lowered it to plunge it into Ketch's heart. At that moment Aunt Amanda, forgetting her lameness, struggled to her feet, hobbled to the kneeling man, and throwing her body between him and the knife, shrieked at Captain Lingo. Stop, stop, you bloodthirsty villain! Ain't you got no shame? What are you going to murder him for? Ain't he done the best he could? You're a big bully, that's all you are. You ain't a man at all, you're a monster. Put up that knife and take your hand out of his hair. Ain't you ashamed of yourself? Captain Lingo was taken completely by surprise. His eyes opened wide and his jaw dropped. He was so astonished that he took his hand from Ketch's hair and put up his knife. That's the idea, said Aunt Amanda. You're more of a man than I thought. Mr. Ketch, you had better get up. Madam, said Captain Lingo making her a bow. Tis a bold action and generous. I trust I am able to respond to it in kind. My duty to you, ma'am, your obedient, humble servant. Catch, thou white-livered dog, get up and thank this lady for thy life. Catch, still pale and trembling, stood up, and seizing one of Aunt Amanda's hands in both of his, made a low bow over it and kissed it fervently. By the look in his eyes it was plain to see that he was from that moment her devoted slave. "'Madam and gentlemen,' said Captain Lingo, "'I am sorry to inform you that the ceremony is over, "'until I can obtain another practitioner to take the place of Ketch. "'I blush with shame when I think how I boasted of his skill. "'I hope you will not think I meant to deceive you, I assure you I am more disappointed than you can possibly be. I am provoked and disgusted and irritated. I am annoyed. I can't deny it. There is nothing to do but to retire to our home in high dudgeon. What's that? said Aunt Amanda. Is it a place, or is it just the way you feel? Ask me no more, said Captain Lingo, turning away. I must confer with my lads about our next step. Are you going to take us with you? asked Aunt Amanda. We shall certainly give ourselves that pleasure, madam, said the captain rather stiffly. Lads, come with me. On a sign from the captain, one of the pirates cut the twine which bound Mr. Hanlon's hands, and the restored one joined his friends on the grass. The seven pirates moved away to a spot some score of yards apart, where they all sat down on the ground and engaged at once in animated talk. "'I conclude,' said the churchwarden, "'though I don't know as I'm right about it, and other people may have a different opinion, 
that we're a good deal better off. What I say is, said Toby, clapping Freddy on the shoulder, what I say is, three cheers for Mr. Hanlon. Yes, said Freddy, that's just what I said that day after the theater. I wonder, said the old codger with the wooden leg, I wonder, er, ahem, if Captain Lingo has, er, such a thing as a pinch of snuff about him. End of chapter 16 Recording by Laurie Arsenault Chapter number 17 of The Old Tobacco Shop This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The Old Tobacco Shop by William Bowen. Chapter 17. High Dudgeon and Low Dudgeon. The pirate captain and his men rose from the ground, and Captain Lingo, in his politest manner, requested his captives to follow him. The entire party moved down the slope into the valley, and after a walk of some quarter of a mile, entered a grove of trees. In this grove were tethered ten handsome mules, of which seven were saddled and three were laden with packs. One of the pack mules was quickly unladen. A fire was built, and in ten minutes the hungry guests and their hosts were making a very good breakfast of bacon, fried by Mr. Leatherbread, as the captain called him one of the pirates to whom the business of the frying pan was left by general consent. When the bacon had been washed down with clear cold water from a spring nearby, and the mule had been packed again, Freddy and Aunt Amanda were assisted into the saddles of the two smallest mules, and the captain mounted into the saddle of the largest. Now look here, Captain Lingo, said Aunt Amanda. I want to know where we are going and all about it. The idea of me sitting here a straddle of a mule, and this bonnet simply ruined, and my dress just about fit to go to the ragbone man, and my hair. Look here, Captain Lingo, I ain't going a step on this mule until you tell me what. Pardon me, my dear lady, said the captain, but I must ask you to put up with my little whims a short while longer. I beg the pleasure of your society upon a little journey, nothing more. I assure you the country is very interesting. May I not promise myself the bliss of your approval? He turned to the six pirates with a scowl. Mount the rest of them, scoundrels. Four of the captives were mounted by the pirates on the remaining mules, and the procession moved out of the grove into the open valley. Freddy had never ridden a mule before, and he was delighted. When they entered, as they soon did, the great forest which they had seen from the plateau, Freddy was more than ever delighted. After the blazing sun of the open country, the shade of the forest was delicious. The trees were huge, and while the trunks were far apart, the branches made a leafy roof overhead, which was almost unbroken. Flowering plants grew everywhere. Vines climbed the trees. Little streams murmured here and there and the only sound which disturbed the repose of the forest was the occasional screech of a parrot and the occasional chatter of monkeys. The first time Freddy heard the sudden scream of a parrot in the stillness, he was thoroughly alarmed. But when he learned what it was and saw the flash of the bird's plumage between the trees, he forgot all about his danger. And for the rest of the day, he gave himself up to the pleasure of watching for parrots and monkeys among the branches. The sly old codger turned in his saddle and said to Toby, who was riding behind, with Mr. Punch walking between, A work of nature, my dear friend, a real work of nature. So beautiful. Parrots and monkeys flitting about overhead. The primeval forest stretching its bosky arms above us in all directions. So bosky. What one might call a real work of nature. So very, very bosky. Right you are, said Toby. It puts our Druid Hill Park in the shade. That's a fact. Makes it take a back seat and play second fiddle as sure as you're born. I beg your pardon, said Mr. Punch. How can a park sit down and play a fiddle? All day long, 
they moved onward single file further and further into the depths of the forest at noon they halted for a luncheon of fried bacon prepared by mr leatherbread the afternoon wore on and the forest became gloomier and gloomier about them as they marched the silence grew almost terrifying and all the pleasure which freddie had felt in the morning vanished night fell and the procession entered a little clearing and there the pirates made camp for the night after a supper of fried bacon prepared by mr leatherbread the whole party retired to rest each on a mattress of green branches and leaves covered with blankets the night was mild and when the last blanket had been made ready the moon rose and tinged the tops of the trees with silver and while freddie was watching the moon as it climbed higher he fell asleep aunt amanda did not go to sleep so soon ketch the practitioner had devoted himself very specifically to her in preparing her resting place while he was spreading the branches and blankets for her she said to him ketch where are we going not so loud ma'am said he we are going to high dudgeon high dudgeon what's that Shh. when we're disappointed or disgusted or vexed we always go to our home in high dudgeon is that where you live part of the time ma'am mostly we are away at sea or on the island but when anything goes wrong and we're angry about it we always go home and stay there in high dudgeon yes ma'am and what are they going to do with us when they get us there Shh! you'll be in great danger there if you can find any way to escape from there i advise you Shh! not another word captain lingo is looking this way i must go aunt amanda did not sleep very well that night in the morning after a breakfast of fried bacon prepared by mr leatherbread the company resumed its march at noon a halt was made beside a spring for rest and food and here mr leatherbread prepared a luncheon of fried bacon in the evening as the travellers were plodding onward ketch walked for a time at the head of aunt amanda's mule aunt amanda leaned forward and said to him ketch are we going to have more bacon to-night no ma'am said he in a low voice we'll have supper in high dudgeon my old mother's the cook there you heard me mention her yesterday morning i've an idea there'll be pigeon pies for supper and mark what i'm saying to you ma'am his voice sank to a whisper if you get a pigeon pie for supper look careful to see what's inside of it before you eat it mercy on us said aunt amanda are they going to poison us but ketch slipped away in the gathering darkness and said no more they had gone but a few hundred yards further when at the moment when the darkness of night was making ready to blot out everything they suddenly emerged into a round grassy clearing enclosed by the forest where the light was better and over which a star or two could be seen glimmering in a pale blue sky in the midst of this clearing rose a tower it was a round tower built of stone its top came scarcely to the top of the surrounding trees and it was in fact not more than two stories high it appeared with its wide girth low and squat its sides were pierced here and there with deep and narrow slits for windows and on one side was a heavy oaken door with great iron hinges and an iron lock through two or three of the upper slits in the wall glimmered a light from within it was otherwise dark and forbidding aunt amanda found ketch at her mule's head again she leaned forward and said to him is that high dudgeon no ma'am that's low dudgeon low dudgeon what do you mean by low dudgeon ketch looked at the tower and shuddered i don't like to talk about it ma'am i don't like the place it's the place where we used to live long ago before we built high dudgeon there's none of us wants to live there now we haven't lived there since ketch paused and shuddered again and evidently decided not to go on there's a light up there said aunt amanda does anybody live there no ma'am said ketch nobody lives there but there's a light said aunt amanda surely there must be somebody there there is ma'am there's thirteen of em thirteen what but ketch only shuddered again and would say no more aunt amanda noticed that instead of going straight onward past the door of low dudgeon 
the pirates led the file in a wide course away from it along the edge of the clearing as if to avoid coming near it and when the procession had thus skirted the clearing and entered the forest again on the other side leaving the low tower behind a sigh as if of relief went up from ketch and all the other pirates except however from captain lingo himself who appeared to be wholly indifferent how much further said aunt amanda to ketch about a mile ma'am said he the last mile of their journey was a long mile and it was traversed in perfect darkness the moon had not yet risen not a word was spoken and there was no sound except the pat of the mule's feet and the breaking of twigs and branches as the travellers pushed their way through the prisoners were in a state of greater nervousness and anxiety than before and as they neared the place where their lives were to be disposed of in one way or another their sense of uncertainty became almost unbearable when it seemed that they must be close to the fateful place the procession suddenly halted and at the same instant the screech of a parrot startled the silence and made each of the prisoners jump it is only the captain said ketch it's a signal immediately as if in response there came from a distance in advance the note of a cuckoo three times repeated the procession moved forward a moment or two later the whole company came forth from the forest under the stars and stood on the edge of a wide round clearing grown high with grass and weeds in the midst of this clearing rose a tower high dudgeon said ketch over his shoulder this also was a round tower built of stone but it was very tall much taller than the highest trees and from the top there must have been a view of all the surrounding country even as far as the hill within which was the treasure cave from the number of deep and narrow slits which served as windows it must have been six or seven stories high the top of the tower was flat with battlements around the rim as a fortress it seemed to be impregnable as a dwelling-house it was very dismal indeed it was totally dark the captives trembled at the thought of being imprisoned in such a place the wayfarers proceeded in their single file directly to the great iron-bound oaken door of the tower and those who were mounted got down ketch assisted aunt amanda and freddie to alight and having done so he took charge of the mules and led them away captain lingo took from his breeches pocket a small key and unlocked the door be so kind as to enter he said and made way for the captives and his men when all were within including ketch who had now returned the captain locked the door on the inside and restored the key to his pocket End of chapter seventeen Chapter 18 of The Old Tobacco Shop. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This is a recording by Peter Ryan from Melbourne, Australia. The Old Tobacco Shop by William Bowen. Chapter 18 The Society for Piratical Research. They were in a dark and narrow passageway. As they stood huddled there together, a candle glimmered at the end of the passage, held in a tremulous hand and lighting up the face of a very old woman. She advanced towards the party by the door, and holding her candle high above her head, inspected the strangers with little blinking, watery eyes. She was short and bent. She hobbled as she came forward. Her face was seamed with deep wrinkles, and the hand which held the candle was knotted and gnarled. Wisps of dirty grey hair hung over her eyes. Ah, Mother Ketch, said Captain Lingo, I wager thou did not expect us so soon. What's in the larder? We are famished. Old Mother Ketch looked at her son, the practitioner, and nodded her head at him once or twice, blinking her eyes. Then she fixed her eyes on Aunt Amanda, and seemed to forget everybody else. Well, well, said Captain Lingo impatiently, art going to keep us here all night? Come, woman, speak up directly. What's for supper, eh? Mother Ketch slowly removed her eyes from Aunt Amanda and looked at the captain steadily. There's naught but pigeons and mushrooms, said she. Good, said the captain. 
Then we will have pigeon pies, one for each, and well filled, mind you. Now, haste, be off. Mother Ketch turned and hobbled slowly down the passage, and the glimmer of her candle disappeared. Follow me, said Captain Lingo. The six pirates vanished somewhere in the darkness, and the others followed Captain Lingo up a winding stair. At the top was a heavy door, which he unlocked with his key, and locked again on the inside after his guests had passed through. He then led them down a dark passageway, and turned to the right, unlocked a door with his key, and threw it open. They were in a large dining room, on the table of which were numerous candles, which the captain lighted. In one wall was an opening for a dumbwaiter for sending up food from the kitchen below. The party seated themselves at the table, and after considerable time, Ketch entered, a napkin on his arm, and, at the same time, the dumbwaiter rose from the kitchen, and the meal commenced. Ketch waited on the table. Besides pigeon pies, there were mushrooms, a lettuce salad, hot biscuit, and excellent coffee. Ketch placed the first pigeon pie before the captain, and Aunt Amanda noticed that he examined the top of it carefully as he did so. She observed that he examined the top of each pie carefully before he placed it, until he had put one before herself, after which he put the others about without looking at them. She examined the top of her own pie herself, to see what Ketch could have been looking at. She saw in the centre of it a tiny figure made of very brown dough, and as she looked closer it seemed to have the shape of a tiny key. She glanced at the other pies, and none of them bore any mark of this kind. Everyone set to with good will, and Aunt Amanda opened her pie. She remembered Ketch's caution, and she prodded it secretly with her fork before taking a bite. At the bottom, her fork touched something hard. She immediately began to put the contents of her pie on her plate, and she did so in such a way as to leave the hard object beneath the rest. In the course of the meal, she dropped a portion of the pie to the floor, and stooped to pick it up. As she did so, she managed to take the hard object from her plate and conceal it in her lap. It was a key. When the meal was over, the captain led his guests forth to their respective bedrooms, each carrying a lighted candle from the table. At the top of the stair was a closed door, which he unlocked with his key, and locked after the others had passed through. Along the passage which ran from this door were doors at intervals in the walls, and these he opened, one after the other, showing one of the guests each time into a bedroom and leaving him there. On the stair, Aunt Amanda had whispered into Toby's ear the words, Don't go to bed. Pass it along. And these words had been passed in a whisper from one to another of the captives. Aunt Amanda, in her own room, now sat herself down to wait. She blew out her candle and sat watching the shaft of moonlight which came through the slit that served for a window. She must have fallen asleep for she came to herself with a start, and found the shaft of moonlight gone. She limped to the door, and found it locked. She took from her dress the pigeon pie key, and unlocked the door. The passageway outside was silent and dark. She felt her way along the wall to the next door, and found it locked. She quietly unlocked it with her key. Toby was sitting within, waiting. He rose without a word and followed her. They tiptoed from door to door, finding each one locked, and silently released each of the prisoners. The key fitted every lock on their way downstairs. They reached the ground floor without an accident, and there in the passage which they had first seen, they stopped to listen. They heard the click of a latch at the rear. A door there opened quietly on a crack, and a light shone through. Every heart stopped beating for a moment. The door opened wider, and a lighted candle appeared, and over it the wrinkled face of an old woman. She peered out into the passage, shading the candle with a trembling hand. The party of quaking runaways stood as still as mice, and held their breath. The old woman blinked for a moment into the darkness and blew out her candle. All was dark again, and the latch of the door clicked. The runaways lost no time. They crept silently but rapidly to the entrance door. Aunt Amanda unlocked and opened it, and they pressed out hurriedly. They were standing on the grass in a flood of moonlight. Aunt Amanda, whose lameness had been almost forgotten in her excitement, now leaned on Toby, who was holding Freddy's hand. 
and who led the way to the rim of the forest where the trail lay. There was some difficulty in finding the trail, but they did find it at last, and they filed into the forest. They had not gone more than twenty yards when Toby, who was in advance, saw a great black object directly across their path. He went forward cautiously, in spite of his alarm, and breathed a sigh of joy when he saw what it was. It was a mule, saddled and bridled and tied to a bush. Further on were other mules, all tethered. There were ten in all, of which eight were saddled, and two were laden with packs. "'Blessings on that catch!' whispered Aunt Amanda. In a moment the entire party were mounted. In another moment they were going along the trail at a fast walk. The mules knew the way, and there was now no danger of going astray in the forest. Only where were they to go, after all? If the pirates should catch them, everything would soon be over. If they should manage to elude the pirates, they would still be lost in the wilderness of this unknown island. What was to become of them, not one could tell. The future seemed dark indeed. Once or twice they paused to listen for sounds of pursuit, but they heard nothing. Not a sound disturbed the stillness, and the little moonlight which filtered here and there through the trees seemed to make the darkness more intense. They had gone about half a mile and were plodding along in drowsy silence, when suddenly, out of the tall bushes beside the trail, seven dark figures sprang upon them and seized the bridle of their mules. Ah! cried Toby. We are lost! The pirates! The mules stood stock still. It's no use, said Toby. We can't escape. They are armed and we are not. All right, Captain Lingo, don't strike. We surrender. We'll go back with you. Don't strike. I beg your pardon, said a voice which none of them had ever heard before. Are you pirates? Ain't you pirates yourself? cried Aunt Amanda. What? said the voice. Is there a lady here? In that case, you are probably not pirate. Perhaps we have been too hasty. I beg your pardon. Who are you? said Aunt Amanda. Do you admit that you are not pirates? said the voice. Admit it, said Aunt Amanda. We vow and declare it. The very idea. I'm sorry to hear it, said the voice. We are deeply disappointed. We of course cannot doubt the word of a lady, but we are almost sure we had found them. We have been searching for pirates for a long time, and we were advised that they live somewhere near here. We must have missed our way. Could you perhaps direct us? It is a place called High Dudgeon. You bet we could, said Toby. But we won't. We are running away from there, and you'd better run too. Then perhaps you happen to know the whereabouts of a place called Low Dudgeon, where the pirates formerly lived. We do, said Toby. You are about halfway between High Dudgeon and Low Dudgeon, and you'd better get out of this neighbourhood as fast as you can. This is very interesting, said the voice. I feel that you will be able to give us some valuable information. If you have no objection, we will walk behind you until we come to a place where there is more light, when we will have a few minutes' conversation on this interesting subject. The seven figures stood aside, and the mules moved onward. The seven figures walked behind. In five minutes, they reached a patch of ground where the moon shone brightly through the trees, and the riders drew in their animals and turned to look at the figures, who now marched sedately up beside them. These figures stood in a row facing the riders, and six of them turned their heads to the right, looking towards the first in the row, who was probably their leader. They were seven tall men, dressed in black frock coats and striped trousers, with pearl grey spats, but instead of high silk hats, each wore a small black skull cap, as more convenient, no doubt, for their rough life in the forest. It could be seen that they were no ordinary men. They looked like professors at college. Their faces were thoughtful and even intellectual. Each one wore spectacles. They squinted, as if from too much poring over books by lamplight. The one at the head of the row was fat, with mutton-chop whiskers, and his frock coat was buttoned tight over his round stomach. He spoke in the same voice which they had heard in the dark. I beg your pardon, said he, if you will be so kind as to direct us either to high dudgeon or low dudgeon, we will not fail to gratefully acknowledge. Aha, said one of the others in a playful tone, a split infinitive, Professor. I beg your pardon, a slight inadvertence. To acknowledge gratefully your kind. 
There's no time to talk now, said Toby. We are running away from these bloodthirsty cutthroats, and if they catch us, we are dead, as sure as you're born. I'll tell you what we will do. We'll all keep on to low dudgeon, and we'll go in there, if we can get in, and decide there what we'd better do. It looked like a strong tower, and we would certainly be as safe inside there as out of doors, if the pirate should come along. The professor looked down the line of his companions. What is the sense of the committee on this proposal? said he. Ah, very good. We are agreed. Proceed, my dear sir. One minute, said Aunt Amanda. Excuse my asking, but I should like to know who you are anyway. The professor waved a fat hand towards his companions, and looking at Aunt Amanda said, We belong to the Society of Piratical Research, under the patronage of His Gracious Majesty, the King of this island. You behold before you a committee of that society, the Committee on Doubtful and Fabulous Tales, sometimes called for the sake of brevity, from the initials of its title, the Daft Committee. As third vice-president of the Society of Piratical Research, I have the honour to be chairman of the Daft Committee. The seat of our society is far from here, in the principal city of this kingdom, the famous City of Towers. Blessed as the residence of His Gracious Majesty, the most learned and liberal of princes, our camp, which we made only late this evening, lies at no great distance from this very spot. We did not wish to delay our researches until morning, and so, as third vice-president of the Society for Piratical Research, and chairman of the DAF committee, I... Much obliged, said Toby. We've no time to listen to any more. We must get on. The DAF committee, led by the third vice-president, fell in behind the mules, and the whole party moved forward as rapidly as the mules and the committee could walk. Aunt Amanda felt far from easy at the prospect of entering low dudgeon, but she had told Toby something of Ketch's strange words and manner regarding that place, and she was glad to leave the responsibility to him. Their dark and silent progress through the forest continued, and when they had gone what they thought must have been about half a mile, they knew they must be near their destination. Every eye was watchful, and every ear was alert. A grunt from Toby in advance notified the others that they had arrived, and they filed out of the forest into the clearing and saw before them the squat tower of low dudgeon in the moonlight. The same light as before appeared from within, through the upper slits in the side of the tower. As they drew in their mules at the edge of the clearing, the daft committee came up, and the third vice-president spoke in a low voice. I presume, he said, that this is low dudgeon. I have heard of it, but I have never seen it. It was formerly, some hundred years ago, the headquarters of the pirates, but something occurred here. I do not know what, which impelled the pirates to move. They accordingly built themselves a much better residence, known as High Dudgeon, where I understand they now live. I do not believe that Low Dudgeon has been occupied since. Gentlemen, he said, turning to his companions, we are fortunate in having found this interesting place at last, after so much trouble. It is the very spot in which to begin our researches. A murmur of approval arose from the other members of the committee. I don't know whether it's occupied or not, said Aunt Amanda. Ketch told me that no one lives here, and that there's thirteen of them, and he seemed to be afraid of the place, and there's a light up there. I don't understand it. Gentlemen, said the third vice-president, is it the sense of the committee that we begin our researches in low dudgeon? Every member of the daft committee murmured his assent. If we go into the forest, said Toby, we may be caught. If we go in here, we are safe for a while anyway, and we can decide there what we had better do. Maybe these gentlemen can send for help. Anyway, let's get in there if we can. The riders dismounted from their mules and tied them to trees. In another moment, the whole party were standing before the door of the tower. Better knock, said Toby. They knocked and knocked again, and there was no answer. Aunt Amanda, said Toby, try your key. Aunt Amanda tried the key and it fitted. She turned it, and the lock snapped back. Toby thrust open the door. The company entered, and Toby took the key and locked the door behind them. They were in a dark passage, near the foot of a winding stair. We'd better go up where the light is said Toby, in a whisper. They went cautiously and noiselessly up the stair to the landing. 
There they found themselves in a hall, and at a little distance down the hall they saw a dim light shining under a closed door. There it is, said Toby. Come on. With the same breathless caution, they tiptoed to the door. It had no lock, and Toby turned the knob and slowly pushed it open. Ah! said Toby in a frightened gasp, and started back. The others crowded at his back and pushed him forward. The third vice president of the Society for Piratical Research brushed past him into the room, and the other six members followed him. A party of fugitives moved slowly in after them. In the middle of a room was a large table. In the centre of this table stood some twenty wax tapers in silver candlesticks, burning brightly. And seated around the table were thirteen men. Not one of these men moved as the party came into the room. Not a limb nor muscle stirred. The third vice president coughed aloud. Still, none of the men moved so much as a finger. The whole party came forward to the table and stood close behind the thirteen men and examined them. They were dead. They were sitting in all positions. Food was before them, as if they were in the midst of a meal. Some were leaning across the table, as if in conversation. Some were in the act of cutting meat on their plates. Some were in the act of putting forks to their mouths. Every face was ghastly white, and every eye was fixed in a vacant stare. See, said Toby in a whisper, pointing to their backs. From the back of each was sticking the handle of a knife, the blade of which was buried in the flesh to the hilt. Aunt Amanda sank on Toby's shoulder for a moment, but she soon recovered. Freddy grasped Toby's hand. Look, said Toby, they must be pirates. Each head was bound with a bright coloured kerchief, and as the horrified company examined the dead men closer, it was seen that they all wore knee breeches. A long dagger was sticking upright in the table, just under the candles. Pinned by this dagger to the table was a large sheet of white paper, and there was evidently writing on it. The third vice president had apparently little fear of the thirteen dead men. He went directly to the table, and reaching across between two of the stiff figures, drew the dagger from the table, and took from the dagger's point the sheet of paper. He adjusted his spectacles, turned his back to the candles so as to obtain a good light on the paper, and read from it aloud, Thus Captain Lingo serve all traitors. For a moment there was silence. Then Aunt Amanda spoke sharply. Wicked villain, said she. Thirteen of his men dead at once by his own hand. No wonder the six that are left are afraid of him. No wonder they don't like this place. Ah, oh, the wicked scoundrel. If I had him here, I declare I would. She paused suddenly and listened. There was a stealthy creaking on the stairs. It grew more distinct. Then it stopped. And there was silence. The thirteen in their chairs made no motion whatever but the living turned with one accord towards the open doorway of the room. They waited with bated breath. In another moment, Captain Lingo himself was standing in the doorway, a pistol in his right hand and a knife in his left. Without a word, he advanced into the room, and behind him came his six men, shrinking obviously away from the sight of their thirteen murdered friends. As Captain Lingo came to a stand before his recent prisoners, his eyes blazed, and with his right thumb he cocked his pistol. Each of his men held a pistol in his right hand and a cutlass in his left, and each cocked his pistol with his thumb. The third vice-president of the Society for Piratical Research, who seemed in no wise disconcerted, stepped forward and addressed the pirate. Captain Lingo, I presume? Aye, be quick. I must finish this business quickly. My committee and myself have long been anxious, sir, in the interest of science, to make your acquaintance. I rejoice at this opportunity. Ah, oh, indeed, said Captain Lingo dryly. Yes, sir, I assure you I am delighted. I believe I have the pleasure of speaking to a subject of King James the Second. Aye, aye, said Lingo, eyeing him suspiciously. What then? Then the records of our society are vindicated. They go back, my dear sir, some two hundred years and they contain, from various sources, an unbroken account of Captain Lingo and his exploits from the time of James the Second to the present. But the sources of our information were not always reliable. Some doubts were thrown upon our records by jealous persons outside the society, 
and as it is the special business of the committee of doubtful and fabulous tales to look into such matters the committee is here before you at the present moment in the interest of truth no member of our society has ever seen captain lingo and the jealous persons i have mentioned pretend that no such person has ever existed the chief mission of our committee is to vindicate our records by the sight of captain lingo himself thanks to you sir that has now been done our next mission is to determine for our society this most important question are you alive or dead at this the captain's brows came together in a terrible frown the scar across his cheek and chin turned very white and he glared under his eyebrows dangerously at the complacent third vice-president his lips parted showing his white teeth clenched together he started to speak through his clenched teeth and levelled his pistol straight at the third vice-president's breast but at that moment a cry from the churchwarden startled everybody bless my soul why didn't i ever think of this before these men ain't real persons at all how could they be after two hundred years they're no better than wicked spirits that's what they are wicked spirits why didn't we think of that before ah my fine friends i've got a little medicine here for you ha ha he drew forth from his back pocket a little perfume bottle and waved it over his head hurrah he cried hurrah for the odour of sanctity and with these words the church warden uncorked the bottle and sprinkled a few drops of his perfume on the floor directly at the feet of captain lingo a sharp odour instantly filled the air so sharp that it brought tears to the eyes of everyone captain lingo and his men stepped quickly backwards but it was too late a look of pained surprise crept over their faces and remained fixed there their feet stood rooted to the floor and the hands which held the cutlasses and pistols stiffened and became rigid not one of them could move an eyelash their outlines began to waver their faces began to be dim and vague as if covered with close white veils from their outsides inward they slowly faded melted dissolved nothing remained of any of them but a wraith a vapour a puff of smoke remotely in the shape of a human being and then that also vanished nothing remained the place where they had been was empty all eyes turned to the table where the thirteen murdered pirates had been sitting they were gone their chairs were vacant the church warden calmly put the stopper in his bottle and restored it to his pocket humph he said nothing like odour of sanctity never knew it to fail no harm to human persons but no wicked spirit has ever lived can stand against it and a blessed good thing the bottle didn't break as we came down the waterfall no perfumery in this world like odour of sanctity. End of chapter 18 This is a recording by Peter Ryan from Melbourne, Australia. Chapter 19 of The Old Tobacco Shop This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Old Tobacco Shop by William Bowen Chapter 19 A Knock at the Door The third vice president and his fellow members of the daft committee seated themselves in the chairs just vacated by the thirteen murdered pirates. Nothing could have persuaded any of the others to sit in those dreadful seats, but no feeling of this sort appeared to disturb the committee, and they evidently saw no reason why they should not be comfortable. The third vice president drummed on the table with his fingers, and frowned to himself in silence. One of the committee, taking his skull cap from his head and smoothing it thoughtfully with his hand, glanced up at the chairman and said, I fear, Professor, that our hopes are dashed. It is nothing less than disastrous. You are right, my dear sir, said the chairman. It is a terrible misfortune, terrible indeed. And just when we are on the point of what? exclaimed Toby in astonishment. Do you mean to say you are sorry those rascally pirates are gone? My dear sir, said the chairman very patiently, I am finding no fault. I do not wish to blame anyone. The loss of these pirates to science is one that can never be compensated. The Society for Piratical Research is now at an end. There are no other pirates on this island, and you must see for yourselves that without pirates our society must perish. It is woeful. Well, I never, said Aunt Amanda. Of all things, 
Do you dare to sit there and tell me you'd rather see us all murdered by pirates than be calm, my friends, said the third vice president placidly. I have already said that I do not wish to find fault. I desire to be generous. It is my wish. In fact, I forgive you freely. Whatever bitterness you may have caused us, we are willing to believe that it was not intentional. The daft committee forgives you freely. Let us be peaceful. It only remains to decide what steps we shall take to meet the future. I submit to you this question, whether we shall first go to the pirate's home in high dudgeon, or return at once to the city of Towers, to confess our failure and receive our... Hark! I thought I heard a knock. Everyone listened. There was indeed the sound of knocking, muffled but quite audible. The group standing about the table looked from one to another in silence. Was this some new danger? Were there other pirates to be reckoned with? The churchwarden put his hand to his back pocket to be ready with his bottle. I think it comes from within this room, said the third vice president. All eyes examined the room. The walls were unbroken except by window slits on one side, the open doorway on another, and on a third a closed door, which no one had before observed. Toby walked over to this closed door and placed his ear against it. A muffled knock sounded from within. Toby nodded his head to the others and tried the door. It was locked. "'Lend me your key, Aunt Amanda,' said he, and when she had given it to him, he inserted it in the lock and turned it and threw wide the door. Inside was a dark closet hung with cloaks. On the floor sat a man. Toby stepped back in amazement. The man sat motionless, his legs crossed, gazing out into the lighted room. After a second or two he rose and stood in the doorway, rubbing his eyes. He said not a word, but continued to rub his eyes until they evidently became used to the light and gave two or three sniffs, as if he smelt an odor and found it far from agreeable. He was a thick-set man, dressed in sailor's clothes, in no way like the clothes the pirates had worn. His eyes were small and very close together. His nose was broken and flat. His lower jaw stuck out beyond his upper, an unpleasant fellow enough, if looks were anything. In his belt he carried a long knife. His sailor collar was cut low in front, and his chest was tattooed in red and blue ink. As he hesitated in the doorway, sniffing the air uneasily and blinking his eyes, the chairman of the daft committee spoke in his calm voice. "'Come in, my good sir,' said he. "'I should like to take the liberty of asking you a few questions.' The sailor man walked slowly into the room and looked about him. "'What's that there smell in the air?' said he. "'Nothing, only my odor of sanctity,' said the churchwarden. "'I don't like it,' said the sailor man. I can't say that I like it much myself, said the third vice president, but it is too faint now to be disagreeable. Pray be seated, sir, one of the committee rose and offered the sailor man his chair. The sailor sat down and gazed at the third vice president, who went on with his speech. You need have no fear, sir. If Captain Lingo causes you any uneasiness, I may tell you that he is gone, never to return, and all his men with him even the thirteen dead men who were sitting in these chairs until a few minutes ago. What? said the sailor. Has them thirteen men been a-sitting here all these years? My dear sir, said the third vice president, I assure you we saw them with our own eyes, but you will perhaps be kind enough to tell us who you are and how you came to be locked up in that closet. Humph, said the sailor, hesitating. I don't know who you are, nor what you're doing in this here place. However, if Lingo's gone, and, oh well, I might as well tell you, by the looks of you, I ain't got much cause to be afraid. Your courtesy under the circumstances will be much appreciated, said the third vice president. Courtesy be blowed, said the sailor man. Well, here goes. I'm Matthew Speak, able-bodied seaman of the brig Cotton Mather, out of New Bedford, Reuben Higginson, master. What? cried Aunt Amanda, almost shrieking. Are you? The Cotton Mather? Reuben Higginson? Did you know him? It ain't possible. I can't believe it. It ain't nothing to me whether you believes it or not. I shipped with Reuben Higginson at New Bedford and landed here with him and his crew on this same identical island, all tight and safe, here on Correction Island, as the captain called it. What? cried Aunt Amanda again. 
Is this Correction Island? Well, I never. Here we are on Correction Island after all, and we never knew it. Are you sure? That's what he called it, believe me or not. It ain't nothing to me, but I seen it on the map I sold to Mizzen, and the captain wrote it there in his own handwrite. That's all I know. But maybe if you'd hunt up this here Lemuel Mizzen, a sailor with a patch on one eye, and... Well, of all things, exclaimed Aunt Amanda. By cracky, said Toby. I wouldn't have believed it. Lemuel Mizzen. Perhaps you will be so good as to tell us, began the third vice president. Freddy, said Aunt Amanda, have you got the map? Yes, am said Freddy, and produced it from his pocket. Aunt Amanda took it from him and spread it open on the table before Matthew speak. The sailor man glanced at it and nodded his head. That's it, said he. I don't know how you come by it, but that's it. Higginson was lost with the cotton mather in a storm on his way back to New Bedford, and a lucky chance for me I wasn't aboard. A good while afterwards, a fisherman off of this here island picked up the map at sea in a bottle, and I got it off in him. He squealed a good bit when I stuck him, but I got it right enough. And then along comes Mizzen, me being in hiding, and I sold it to him for a set of false whiskers and a tattoo needle. Yes, yes, said Freddy eagerly. Mr. Mizzen told me about it. Well, Higginson sailed away from here in the Cotton Mather. I didn't go with him. I ran away. I, a runaway sailor, that's what I am. I liked the Spanish main, and I didn't like Higginson. Nor yet he didn't like me, neither. But before he sailed, I left my mark on him, I did. Four of his teeth out, and a black eye. And I won't say but what he broke my nose for me, too, right enough. For a Quaker, he hit pretty good. And I stole this bit of writing from him. Probably it ain't no account, but Higginson, he seemed to set great store by it, so I stole it, and here it is. He took from his pocket a sheet of folded paper and laid it on the table beside the map. It was much soiled and was evidently very old. He sniffed the air once or twice and frowned. I don't like this here smell. It's no good. I say I don't like it. It makes me feel queer. Well, I guess the old man thought this here bit of writing was safe in his locker right up to the last. I expect he never missed it until he went to put it into the bottle with the map and throw it overboard. He shook the paper in his hand and dropped it again on the table. And then, he went on, I fell in with Lingo and joined his crew. Look here, said Toby. How long ago was all this? How do I know, said Speak. I've been shut up in that there cupboard so long I ain't got no account of time. But I remember just before we sailed from New Bedford, there was a lot of crazy people talking about getting up a fight with England and breaking loose from her and being free and independent and what not a great pack of foolish nonsense, and something or other about some kind of tea party in Boston. I don't know. I ain't never heard what come of it. Most likely nothing at all. I guess it must have been a good while ago. I don't know. The church warden started and put his hand to his back pocket. Are you as old as that, said he? No older nor what you be, old fat chaps, said Speak. You attend to your own age, and I'll attend to mine. Never mind, said the third vice president hastily. Pray tell us how you came to be locked up in that closet. Give me a chance, said Speak. I'd tell you if you'd give me a chance. I joined Lingo. I served him true and faithful, and many a prize we've taken together, and watched many a smart lad walk the plank, that's a fact. Well, thirteen of his men laid a plan to go to his treasure cave where all his treasure was hid, and make off with it. Steal it. Ay, ay, steal it, mind you, as bad as that. Now me, I ain't got no patience with dishonesty. I'm all for being honest, I am. So, being as I had learned about this here plan, I went and told the captain. He never winked an eye, not him, but off he sent his other six men out of the way and made a fine supper here for them thirteen and sat down with them to it. Ay, that he did. But first he gets a little white powder out of a silver box and takes it to Mother Ketch, and orders her to put it in their food. And she won't, not she, and nothing he can do can make her. So he comes to me, and being as I hates dishonesty, I puts the powder in their food, and they eats it. Only, being kind of nervous, as you might say, I spills about two-thirds of it on my way upstairs in the dark, and there ain't enough left to do the work complete. What was left I put in the food on the table, and at that minute up the stairs comes the whole thirteen with the captain at their head and I whips into that there cupboard and shuts the door, 
a trembling in my boots for fear of what the captain's going to do to me when he finds out the powder won't work only partly. I can hear them all set down to the table, laughing hearty, and the captain's voice a cracking jokes and making them feel at home. But after a bit, I don't hear nobody's voice, but only the captain's, because of the white powder acting on the others as far as it could, and them probably a setting up stiff and tongue-tied in their chairs, unable to move a hand because of the might of powder, do you see, and me a settin' quiet in the dark cupboard, a quaking all over and wondering what the captain was a going to do to me. And after a bit, I don't hear the captain's voice no more, and there ain't no sound at all, and I guess the party is over. And in another minute, I hears a key turn in the lock of my cupboard door, very soft and easy, and there I am, shut up and locked in as tight as pitch, and there I've been ever since. And serve you jolly well right, too, if you ask me, said Mr. Punch, with great disgust. It's the wickedest piece of business all round I ever heard of in my life, said Aunt Amanda, indignantly. It's my opinion you're as bad as any of them. Worse, if anything, said the church warden, whose hand was still on his back pocket. It's a pity the captain didn't knife you in the back with the rest of them, said Toby angrily. Speak's little eyes flashed fire. He drew his knife and held it out threateningly in his hand and started to rise. But he did not rise. He remained fixed in his chair, though it was easy to see that he was trying to get up. He sniffed the air, and his head remained fixed in the act of sniffing. The hand which held the knife continued to hold it out without moving. A look of alarm came into his eyes. It was evident that he had smelled the odor of sanctity, which yet lingered faintly in the room. His outline began to waver. His face became vague. His features ran together. He took on the appearance of vapor, and there in the chair by the table, in place of the thick and solid sailor man, was an almost transparent form of mist or smoke, remotely in the shape of a man. Everyone waited to see him vanish. The form still lingered. It did not disappear. It continued to sit in its chair with its hand extended, holding out a shadowy knife. The odor of sanctity had lost its full power, and what remained of it was insufficient to make him disappear. The church warden pulled out his bottle and commenced to uncork it. Stay, said the third vice president, holding up his hand. I pray you stay. Do not spill any more of that deadly fluid. There has been enough destruction here tonight. I propose that we leave the late Matthew speak as he is. He belongs to the Society for Piratical Research. He is the last of the pirates, and I beg leave to claim him for the Society. As an exhibit, he will be highly valued. We shall from time to time conduct hither parties of the learned or the curious to view the last of the pirates. Nothing could be better. Our society is now revived. I am immensely gratified. Low Dudgeon shall be known as the only museum in the world with but a single exhibit. Let the late Matthew speak repose here in his chair as a permanent relic of a bygone age, the sole exhibit in a museum all his own. The interest of such an exhibit will doubtless warrant a small charge at the door. The committee murmured in earnest approval. The church warden looked at his companions and put the bottle back into his pocket with a sigh. I thank you, said the third vice president. We will now proceed to consider our next step. I simply can't stay in this room, exclaimed Aunt Amanda, with that thing sitting in that chair. It is nothing, madam, I assure you, said the third vice president. See? He leaned over and passed his hand directly through the body in the chair, in at the breast and out at the back. Oh, cried Aunt Amanda, and her friends all gasped, but the committee only nodded their heads in token of their interest. You see it is nothing, said the third vice president. We will now look at the paper which our departed friend has left. He picked up the paper from the table where Speak had left it, adjusted his spectacles, turned his back to the candles so as to get a good light, and read the paper through to himself. He then glanced at the company and read aloud. Shiraz the Rug Merchant. Outside the gate of wanderers, six hundred paces to the right, along the wall. These shall know his shop by certain numbers, to wit, three one zero one three one zero. If he hide himself, say these words. Shagli Jamshid Shariman. These shall buy of his wares. Not that which he shall offer first, nor second, but that which he shall offer third, that thee shall buy, and for that thee shall pay whatever he shall demand. 
Thereafter thee shall do whatever he shall direct. But enter not into the city, but by the shop of Shiraz the rug merchant. There was silence for a moment. Then Aunt Amanda said, That's the way we are to get those wonderful things the map speaks of. It doesn't seem to tell us much, though. Where do you suppose is this gate of wanderers? That, dear madam, said the third vice-president, is one of the gates of our city of towers. We know it very well, of course. Then, said Aunt Amanda, as captain of my party, my orders is that we go there at once. Much good would that do, said Toby. We've got to buy something of this here Shiraz, if that's his name, and pay anything he asks, too, and there ain't a penny amongst us. How could we buy anything? The pirate's treasure, cried Freddy. The pirate's treasure in the cave. By cracky, said Toby. I clean forgot all about it. Good for you, Freddy. Talk about money to buy things with. We'll buy out that old Shiraz's whole shop. The treasure belongs to us as sure as you're born. By crickets, we're in luck. If you will pardon me, said the third vice president, we know nothing of any treasure. And if you would be so good as to... I will, said Aunt Amanda, as she quickly explained the whole matter. The daft committee, including its chairman, was much impressed. We do not wish to intrude, said the chairman, but if we could be of any service. Of course, cried Toby. You've got to help us get the treasure out of the cave and then help us to find the city of towers. And if you'll help us, why, what I say is, the committee ought to have a share of the treasure. Is that right? Toby's friends willingly agreed, and the committee gladly consented to go with them to the treasure cave and then to the city of towers. The Society for Piratical Research, said the third vice president, is coming back to life. We now have a museum with one exhibit, and we are about to acquire a fund of money. Come, my friends, it is time to depart. If you will go out first, I will remain and blow out the candles. We must remember to close the door behind us, for a draft of air would probably blow the late Mr. Matthew Speak out of the window. In a few moments, the whole party was standing in the moonlight on the grass before the deserted tower of Low Dudgeon. Not quite deserted, however, in every mind was a picture of the misty and vapory form, remotely in the shape of a man, sitting motionless in a chair beside a table in a dark and silent room. All right, said Toby. Now for the treasure cave and the city of towers. End of chapter 19「Twenty of the Old Tobacco Shop. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Old Tobacco Shop by William Bowen. Chapter 20. The City of Towers. At the Pirate's Cave, the task of getting out the treasure proved very difficult, but it was done at last. The committee's camp in the forest had supplied abundance of provisions and a great number of animals. The committee traveled in luxury. On the level ground where Mr. Hanlon had given his exhibition of headwork, the toilers were now resting in the hot sun and drying their garments, thoroughly soaked by their trips in and out of the cave, under the waterfall. They looked with intense delight on the boxes and bags which lay before them. "'What I say is,' said Toby, "'let's divide the treasure now, so we won't have to bother about it when we get to the City of Towers.' "'How beautiful is nature!' said the sly old codger. Behold that wide expanse of field and forest resting so, so, expansively beneath the orb of day, a true, true work of nature. At such a moment as this, dear friends, a warm feeling invades my heart, a feeling of, of, did I hear a suggestion to divide the treasure? The division was carefully made, and when it was done, and each person had declared himself well satisfied, each share was packed separately, and the treasure loaded on the backs of the extra mules. It was a princely fortune. Do you suppose, said the old codger with the wooden leg, that, er, I shall be able to obtain in the city of towers such a thing as a pipeful, ahem, a pipeful of tobacco? Never fear, said the third vice president. I fancy you will be able to buy there all the tobacco you can use. Wary sorry I am to ear it, said Mr. Punch. I regard the tobacco abbot as a wary reprehensible abbot, wary. Oh, you do, said Toby, glaring at him. Wary reprehensible indeed, went on Mr. Punch calmly. My conscience has troubled me for a long time, 
by reason of my position in the tobacco trade, being posted, as one may say, in a wary, advantageous position for observation, I have seen too much, entirely too much, of the sad effects of the obnoxious weed. Many a time have I wept to myself when the observer may have thought it was only rain on me cheek, to see him, young and old, going in and out of Toby Littleback's shop, knowing what would come of it sooner or later, and me a standin' there encouraging of him in, as one must say, with me packet of cigars in me and. Hoffin enough have I wished to give it up and embark on a occupation less reprehensible. Many a time have I said to myself, Ho, oh, if I could only be innocent once, just once, and now I shall put behind me all the deeds of my sinful past, and with my share of the treasure I shall open a shop for the purveying of tripe. There's a deal more harm been done by tripe than ever there was by tobacco, said Toby. There is a total absence of nicotine in tripe, said Mr. Punch loftily. At least such is my information, and I can't help hoping that my friend Littleback will reform himself now that he can afford it, and engage in some pursuit less armful to the young. If I was asked, I would suggest pinking and pleading. You ain't been asked, said Toby. I can see myself pinking and pleading. When I want advice what to do with my money, I'll ask you. Tobacco is my line, and tobacco is going to be my line to the end of the chapter, and that's flat. Pinking and pleading. Humph. It's my belief, said the church warden, after listening to what's been said, pro and con, backwards and forwards, up and down, that if we don't start for the city of Towers, we'll never get there. And what's more, said Toby, when I get back, I'm going to have an Indian outside my door instead of a tripe seller. Excuse me, said the third vice president. I am sorry to interrupt this interesting discussion, but we really ought to be going. Gentlemen, to the committee. Our steeds are waiting. To the city of Towers. The journey, which now commenced, proved to be a very long one. Day after day, the pilgrims plodded through a wilderness of forest and field, over streams, across mountains, down into deep valleys and up again, camping at night wherever they happened to find water and wood, and sleeping under the stars in blankets on beds of boughs. The moon was gone before their journey was over. One morning the trail brought them down on a mountainside to a well-paved road. This road they followed for some hours, and it brought them finally to the top of a gentle hill, covered with trees. From the top of this hill they saw a striking scene. Stretching away from the foot of the hill lay a great rolling valley, up which the road ran as straight as a ribbon. Far away, at the end of the road, against a dark wooded mountain, stood a great city, walled around with a high wall, and shining in the sun with white and gold domes and turrets and towers. The rear of the city rose along the lower slope of the mountain, and on the top of the mountain, concealing its peak, lay a cloud, black below and glittering with sunlight at the edges. It hung there motionless during the time when the watchers sat watching the scene. Directly under the cloud, on the slope where the farthest portion of the city lay, was an open space among the buildings, like a great garden or park, and in the midst of it a vast white building with a flat roof, great enough for the palace of a king. That which struck the strangers most, at their first look, was the great number of towers which rose at all points in the city. Surely so many towers had never been gotten together in one place before, and the most remarkable one of them was the tower which rose from just behind the great white building in the park. It was dull in color and doubtless of brick. It was round in shape, tapering gradually upwards. It rose to a height which none of the strangers would have thought possible had they not seen it with their own eyes. It rose straight to the cloud which hung motionless upon the mountain. It pierced the cloud, and its top was lost to view in the cloud or above it. The city of towers, said the third vice president, waving his arm in that direction. The gate of wanderers is before us at the end of the road. The party urged their animals forward down the hillside and pressed on until noon, when they halted for rest and refreshment in a wood beside the road. There they sat at their ease on the grass 
and the third vice president looked from one to another and spoke as follows. My friends, I must tell you the story of the towers. Our king, you must know, is a handsome and amiable man, in appearance about thirty years of age. When I tell you that he has been our king for more than forty years, you will be surprised. His wife was a princess of some few years less than his own, and of a beauty unequaled in the kingdom. Her wedding ring, the gift of her husband, was a single ruby in a plain gold band, and this ring she was never known to remove from her wedding finger for a single moment. She was blessed with three beautiful children, two boys and a girl, the oldest of whom was nearly nine years of age. When the prince, our present king, was thirty years old, his father the king, who was then alive, gave a great ball at the palace, and at this ball the old king declared to the assembled court that he desired to build a tower, a mighty tower, higher than any other in the world, where he might seek repose from time to time, a tower so tall that it would reach the cloud that hangs perpetually on the mountain. To him who should build such a tower in the shortest time, the king would give any reward which the fortunate bidder might ask. The old king laughed as he made his offer, and it was plain that he was only half serious. But many of the richest of his nobility desired the prize, and contended for it earnestly. One proposed to erect the tower in ten years, another in eight, and one was found who was willing to promise it in six years and a half. But these terms were all too long. The king was old, and he would not wait so long. "'Is there no one,' said the king at last, "'who will build me my tower in less than six years and a half?' "'I will build it in one night,' said a voice from the rear of the ballroom. An old man came forward and stood before the king. An old man, dressed in a short gown, tied in with a cord about the middle, with sandals on his feet, a lantern with a lighted candle in one hand, and a staff in the other. No one in that place had ever seen him before, and no one knew how he had gotten in amongst that glittering company. "'I will build your tower in one night,' said the old man. The old king laughed outright, but he accepted the offer then and there. "'In the morning,' said he, "'if we find the tower finished, you shall have any gift which may be in my power to give.' The old man bowed, and made his way slowly out of the palace. A great shout of laughter went up from the company, and in this the king himself joined heartily. But the joke was, as I must tell you, my friends, that in the morning when the king rose, there stood the tower, in fact, behind the palace, so tall that its top could not be seen in the cloud that hung upon the mountain, and there, my friends, the tower stands to this day. That evening the old man returned for his reward. He stood before the king, and on the king's right and left stood the prince and the prince's wife and children. The king asked the old man what reward he desired. I ask nothing, replied the other, with a sly smile, except the ruby ring upon the finger of the princess. The princess turned pale and hid her hand behind her. She would not give up her wedding ring. Nothing the king could say could move her. He offered the old man anything else he might demand a dozen ruby rings, a box of ruby rings, anything. But the old man would have nothing but the ring upon the princess's finger. The princess grew paler still, as if with fear, but she would not give up the ring. The old man smiled his sly smile again and went away. The next morning the princess and her three children were gone. Search was made everywhere, but they were not to be found. The king and the prince, mounting the winding stair of the tower, stopped at last when they were all but exhausted, and at that moment heard a sound of weeping from above. They climbed higher, and on the stair they found the children sitting, huddled together and weeping bitterly. Their mother was gone. They knew not where, and they did not know how they came to be in the tower. The strongest climbers in the city mounted as far as they could ascend, but the top of the tower was far beyond their reach. They found no princess. She has never been seen from that day. Soon after, the old king died, and his son came to the throne. As for him, our present king, and his three children, time stopped for them from the day on which the princess disappeared. They are no older now than when she left them. It is supposed that they are awaiting her return unchanged, in order that she may not find them old on her return, if she should still be young. 
There are those who say that she has lived all these years, and still lives, somewhere, in some strange form, perhaps far from here, bewitched by the old man, and waiting for release from her enchantment. I do not know. And what was her name? said Aunt Amanda. She was named, said the third vice president, the Princess Miranda. And what are all those other towers in the city? said Aunt Amanda. It was the fashion, after the king's tower was built, to build towers. The king, as you may suppose, sets the fashion in all things. But no more pleasure towers are built nowadays. The thing had its day and died out. There is a fashion now in pleasure domes. They are modeled after the pleasure dome built by Kublai Khan and Xanadu. Well, said Toby, I don't see what we've got to do with all this. The party I want to see is Shiraz the rug merchant. End of chapter 20. Chapter 21 of The Old Tobacco Shop. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by T. Daniels. The Old Tobacco Shop by William Bowen. Chapter 21. Shiraz the Rug Merchant. The wayfarers came to a halt before the wanderer's gate. The wall of the city stood before them and stretched away to a great distance on either hand. People were going in and out at the gate, some on foot, driving donkeys before them, some on horseback, some in wagons, and all brisk and talkative. The third vice president received a respectful greeting from several of those on horseback. He turned to his companions with a wave of the hand and said, The Wanderer's Bazaar. On each side of the open gate, at the foot of the high thick wall, was what appeared to be a fair. As far as the eye could see, the base of the wall was lined with booths each with an awning over it from the wall behind, gaily striped in orange and blue and yellow and brown. In these booths was spread out in disorderly profusion a mass of merchandise of all kinds, gold and silver ornaments, brass and copper vessels, rugs and carpets, spectacles and clocks, toys and games, herbs and ointments, fishnets and sailor's instruments, canes and crutches, ribbons and laces, perfumery, precious stones, things innumerable, even parrots and monkeys in cages. In one booth was a potter, twirling his potter's wheel, and another, a fortune teller, laying little sticks down in curious patterns on his table, and another, a man pasting on cards bits of colored feathers in the form of tiny birds and fowls most lifelike, and another, a glass blower delicately twining a thread of spun glass for the rigging of a ship. In another, a man sitting on a rug with a snake before him, whose flat head stood stiffly up from his coil and waved a little to the motion of his master's finger. In another, a man was bending over a flower pot with a wand in his hand, and as he moved the wand, a stalk grew from the pot, and at its end, a bud appeared and unfolded into a flower before the very eyes of his audience. In another, a great ape was marking down figures with chalk, as his master called them. In another, a shuttle was weaving back and forth in a loom. There seemed to be no end to the curious and diverting things to be seen in those booths. The people in them were apparently of all nations of the earth. There were brown men, and yellow men, and black men, as well as white, men with slant eyes, with round eyes, with flat noses, with beak noses, with woolly hair, with straight hair. There were turbans, and fezes, and hoods, and white gowns, and colored robes, and velvet jackets, and cotton blouses, and from all the vendors rode such a hubbub as Freddy had never in his life heard before except once in the Gaunt Street Theater at home. A lively crowd chaffered with the vendors and walked in the paved streets before their booths, it was a scene full of life and color, and Freddy was transported with delight. Oh, he said, can't we go down there and see all those sights? I should like to spend the whole day here. We've got other fish to fry just now, Freddy, said Toby. We'll have to see this some other time. It is a precious thought, said the sly old fox, that we have here with us on our mules enough treasure to buy this whole bazaar if we wish to do it. It is a beautiful thought. 
Six hundred paces to the right, said Mr. Punch. Shiraz the rug merchant, said Toby. By the looks of it, there must be about five hundred rug merchants along there. What was the number we were to find him by, said Aunt Amanda. It's three one zero three one zero one, said Toby. You are quite mistaken, said Mr. Punch. It's three zero one three one zero one. That's exactly what I said, said Toby. Excuse me, said the old codger with the wooden leg. It seems to me that it's er three one zero one three zero one. My recollection is, said the church warden, that it is three zero three one zero one zero. I'm sorry to differ, said the sly old codger, but I am perfectly sure it is three zero one three zero one zero. Why don't you look at the paper, said Aunt Amanda, in an exasperated tone. Everyone looked at everyone else to produce the paper, but no one produced it. I regret to confess it, said the third vice president, placidly, but I have a distinct recollection of having left it on the table at low dudgeon. Never mind, it is perfectly safe. Well, said Aunt Amanda, isn't that a perfect shame? Whatever are we going to do? And where's the map? Freddy, have you got the map? Freddy looked in all his pockets. Gnome, said he, it isn't here. I recall distinctly, said the third vice president, without any sign of worry, that the map was left on the table at Low Dungeon, with the other paper. Merciful feathers, exclaimed Aunt Amanda, and you've left the map behind too. I never yet see a man that had a head on him worth a... Now listen to me. Is there anyone that remembers the words the paper said we had to say to the... Ah, uh, madam, said the third vice president. There I can be of assistance, I fancy. The words are derived from the Persian, and I am accordingly familiar with them. Shagli Jamshid Shahariman. Am I right, gentlemen? The daft committee nodded their heads in assent. Then I see no reason, said the third vice president, why we should not proceed. Come on, then, said Toby. I'll get down and pace off the six hundred steps, and we'll see where we come to. The party moved slowly through the crowd, along the booths, while Toby walked beside them, carefully counting his steps. Five hundred and eighty, said he, five hundred and ninety, ninety-five, six hundred, and stopped. The procession stopped also, and all of the riders got down from their mules. Many of the passers-by gazed curiously at them, and some paused for a moment before going on. But no one seemed to take more than a passing interest. One of the committee led the mules to the open side of the street, where they would be out of the way, and stood guard over them. The others joined Toby in the front of the booth, at which he was now standing. It was not the kind of booth they were seeking at all. There were no rugs nor carpets of any kind, only clocks and watches, a great number of them, and a few sundials and hourglasses. Behind the counter stood a lad of about twenty, very dark of skin, with snapping black eyes and shining white teeth which showed as he now bowed and smiled, a white turban on his head, and a loose white robe hanging from his shoulders. He was slim and sleek, and his fingers were very long and delicate. He rubbed his hands together as the riders dismounted and commenced to chatter to them in an unknown tongue, bowing and smiling the while. His wares were displayed about him on shelves and boxes and tables, as well as on the counter, and the clocks and watches, as usual in such places, showed all hours of the twelve, a striped awning of orange and blue, fastened at the rear to the side of the city wall, shielded him and his booth from the sun. Behind him in the wall was a closed iron door. We're in the wrong shop, said Toby to his companions. Some mistake. Anyway, here goes. And addressing the young man behind the counter, he said, Good afternoon. We are looking for Mr. Shiraz, the rug merchant. This don't look much like a rug shop, but maybe you can tell us. Shiraz. That's his name. No understand, said the young man, rubbing his hands and bowing pleasantly. Shiraz, said Toby, think. Shiraz. Easy word. Shiraz. You understand? Clocks and watches, said the young man. Sundials. You buy? No, no, said Toby. We no buy. Want Shiraz. Confound it, that's an easy word, ain't it? Shiraz. 
Can't you understand that? No sell Shiraz, said the young man. Clocks and watches. Look here, said Toby. What's the number of this place? No number, said the young man, looking puzzled and shaking his head. Clocks and watches. By cracky, said Toby. We're in the wrong place, sure enough. Now, while this talk was going on, Freddy had made a discovery. He had noticed on a box at the rear, against the wall, a row of seven old clocks. They were battered and broken, and were evidently long since out of repair. Two of them had no hands. Like most of the clocks in the place, they were stopped, and had probably, from the looks of them, ceased many years before to keep time. He noted idly the time shown by each of these clocks, and started in surprise. The hour shown by the first clock at the left was three o'clock. That shown by the next was one o'clock. The next had no hands, and showed no time at all. The next showed one o'clock. The next three o'clock. The next one o'clock. And the seventh had no hands. He ran his eye over them again and the numbers which resulted were 31013103. Come along, said Toby. We might as well ask some of these other shops. There ain't no use wasting time here. He moved away, and the others followed him towards the adjoining booth. The teeth of the dark young man shone white, and he bowed politely to the departing strangers. Freddy pulled at Toby's coat and whispered in his ear. Toby listened, and without a word, led the party back to the booth. Now see here, young feller, said he, I've got your number, and I don't want no nonsense. I reckon you can understand numbers if you can't understand anything else. He fixed his eyes on the row of the old clocks at the rear. Listen to this, my young friend. Three one zero one three one zero. The smile left the young man's face. He seemed a trifle uneasy. His long fingers rested on the counter, and he leaned forward intently. No understand, said he. By crack, he said, Toby, this beats all. Where's Shiraz? We're in the right place and we want Shiraz. Out with him. Locks and watches, said the young man, but this time somewhat nervously. You buy? By nothing, cried Toby. We want to see Shiraz the rug merchant. Professor, said he, turning round. What's the words to bring out Shiraz the rug merchant? Shagli Jamshid Shahariman, said the third vice president in a loud voice. Instantly the manner of the young man changed. Crossing his arms upon his breast, he made a low salaam and spoke with the utmost deference. I trust you will pardon, said he, my seeming lack of courtesy. It is necessary to exercise a certain caution. There are wicked spirits assuming from time to time the most unlikely forms, who seek to gain access to my great-great-grandfather. His life is continually in danger, for he possesses secrets which enable him constantly to interfere with their designs. By reason of this danger, he was obliged many years ago to retire from the rug business, and he has lived ever since in deep seclusion. It is your wish to see Shiraz the Persian? You seem to speak English pretty good, said Toby. Perfectly, my lord, and twelve other tongues as well. You desire to see my great-great-grandfather? That's the exact idea, said Toby. Then I will beg your indulgence for a few moments. The young man bowed again and disappeared through the doorway in the wall, closing the door behind him. After a considerable absence, he returned. If you will follow me, said he, I will conduct you to my great-great-grandfather. We will await your return here, said the third vice-president to Toby and his companions. It is unnecessary for us to pursue this adventure further. The third vice-president and his friends returned to the mules, and the others followed the young man to the door behind him in the wall. The door was closed and locked behind them, and they found themselves in darkness. If you will come to me here, said the voice of the young man, a little in advance, I will show you the way down. When they felt themselves near him, they heard his voice again. Be good enough to step carefully forward until you feel the first step of a descending stair. Then descend cautiously if you please. Each one put out a foot, and in a moment they were all going down a stairway, of which the treads were evidently of stone, 
much worn. When they had gone down some thirty steps, they were aware the stair had ended, and that they were on a landing. You will now cross the bridge, one by one, holding on to the railing, said the voice of the young man. One by one the party stepped forward, feeling the way cautiously, and as each in turn found with his hand a slight wooden railing, a breath of fresh air blew upon his face, and the sound of rushing water came from below. Instead of the firm stone they had just been treading, they were conscious of wooden planking under their feet, and it gave beneath their pressure most uneasily. The bridge was a long one, and the sound of rushing water followed them its entire length. They walked again, however, on firm ground, and heard the young man's voice before them. Be good enough to follow the right-hand wall, it said, and turn with the wall. Each right hand touched the surface of a wall, and in a moment the wall made a turning to the right. In another moment their progress was barred by a wall in advance, and the voice of the young man spoke from their midst. You will kindly stoop as you go in, said he, and at the same moment a round opening appeared before them, dimly lit from within. It was only large enough to admit a single person stooping. The young man entered first, and the others followed one by one. When they were all on the other side of the door, the young man swung it noiselessly too on his hinges, and it was seen that it fitted accurately, so that it was impossible to distinguish it from the wall. They were in a small room, unfurnished except for a table in the center, on which burned an oil lamp of silver, in shape like a boat. The walls were bare, except for certain shelves containing bottles of colored liquids, other bottles of colored powders, mortars, retorts, gas burners, and huge dusty books. There appeared to be no outlet from the room, but the young man pressed his finger on a spot behind one of the bottles on a shelf, and a circular door, like the one by which they had entered, swung slowly open in the opposite wall. We have arrived, said the young man. Please to follow. He stooped and entered the circular doorway, and the others, one by one, followed. They had found themselves in a rich and luxurious apartment, softly lighted by a hanging lamp. In the center was a table, littered with open books and scrolls of paper, and bearing notably a great round globe of solid crystal. Beside the table, on a divan, reclined what appeared to be a dry and shriveled mummy. End of chapter 21「Chapter Twenty Two of the Old Tobacco Shop. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. The Old Tobacco Shop by William Bowen. Chapter Twenty Two Six Enchanted Souls. This is my great great grandfather, said the young man. The room in which they stood was hung about on all the walls with rare and beautiful rugs, and similar rugs covered the floor. Richly embroidered cushions and delicate silk and cashmere shawls lay on the few easy chairs that were disposed about the room. The bowl of the hanging lamp, above the table, was of bits of amber and orange and ruby glass, through which shone a subdued and mellow light. Near the ceiling were three or four small openings, covered with iron gratings, and the air in the apartment was pure, except for the odor of tobacco. The figure on the divan was smoking a pipe, a water pipe whose long, flexible stem reached to the floor where its bowl rested. Shiraz, the rug merchant, looked at his visitors with little beady black eyes. His skin was very dark and shriveled and wrinkled like the skin of a dried apple. His cheekbones seemed as if about to break through his cheeks, and his lips were stretched back from his teeth, which were black and broken. His hands were like the claws of a bird. Thin white hair straggled over his tight, dark scalp. He wore a robe of some soft material, harmoniously modeled upon a ground of maroon, and on his feet were slippers of red morocco, pointed upwards at the toes. His turban lay upon the table beside him. He was the smallest man the strangers had ever seen. After a searching look at them with his beady eyes, he rose from the divan, laid down the stem of his pipe, and stood up. He was not taller than Freddy. As he stood by the divan, looking up at his visitors, he seemed indeed a mere mummy of a man, 
likely to fall to pieces at a breath of air. "'You are welcome,' he said, in a voice surprisingly strong. "'I perceive that you have come from a great distance. "'Permit me to inquire what errand has brought you to your servant's poor habitation.' "'I reckon we want to buy something,' said Toby. "'I don't know what, exactly, but a chap by the name of Higginson, Captain Reuben Higginson, he give us the direction, as you might say.' "'Ah, yes,' said Shiraz the Persian. "'I remember him very well. I was sorry to learn of his misfortune. An excellent man, a member of some strange sect. A Quaker,' said Toby. "'The paper he left said we might buy something here.' and here we are, ready to buy. I have long since retired from the rug business, said Shiraz, but I have brought with me here, as you may see, some of my choicest treasures, as a slight solace in my seclusion. He glanced towards the rugs on the wall. I am reluctant to part with any of them, but I am willing to make an exception, in view of your having made so long a journey to see me. My son, said he to the young man, Bring hither the Omar prayer rug. The young man took from one of the walls a small rug and laid it at the feet of Shiraz. You will immediately perceive, said the Persian, the extreme beauty of this rug. It is one of my rarest treasures. It is a prayer rug from the mosque of Omar of Isfahan, a caliche of cut pile fabric, with a senna knot, as I need not tell you, made in Kurdistan three hundred years ago. Observe, if you please, the delicacy of the design and the harmony of the coloring. Its possession is as a spring of water to the desert Bedouin, as a palm with dates on the road to Mecca, as a word to the believer from the mouth of the prophet. Its price, to those who have journeyed across the sea to buy it, is twelve copper pennies. The sly old fox stooped down and examined it. His eyes lit up with pleasure. Beautiful, said he. I have never seen a rug more beautiful. It is a real work of... of... I will take it. At twelve pennies, it is mine. No, no, said Aunt Amanda. You'll do nothing of the kind. It is certainly the finest piece of carpet I have ever seen, and the price is low enough, in all conscience. But we are not going to buy it. I am sorry, sir, but we can't buy your rug. Show us something else." Shiraz displayed his teeth more plainly than ever in a sly smile. "'Your servant is desolated,' he replied. "'I crave your pardon for showing a trifle so far beneath your notice. "'My son, take it away. "'If your excellencies will deign to overlook my error, "'I will produce an article more worthy of your attention. "'This time I promise myself the ecstasy of your approval.' "'Pretty good line of talk,' whispered Toby in Mr. Punch's ear. My son, continued Shiraz, bring hither the wishing rug. The young man took away the prayer rug and brought another from the wall, a much larger one, large enough, indeed, for twenty people to stand on. It was dingy and frayed and in no way beautiful like the other. A rug of the tomb of Rustam, said Shiraz, gained by the hero in battle from the genie Aknavid. It is the last of the wishing rugs. Its property is that it will transport to the farthest regions of the earth, in the twinkling of an eye, those who sit upon it and but name aloud the place of their desire. Excellencies, he said, addressing his visitors very earnestly, if it is your wish to return home, the moment has arrived. You have only to sit upon this rug and wish yourselves at home, and you will find yourselves there, safe and sound, before the words shall have well left your lips and the price is only twenty pennies. Every one of the party hesitated. A vision of the old tobacco shop entered each mind. It had never seemed so cozy, so quiet, so secure as at that moment. How or when they would ever get there, in the natural course of events, no one knew. If they did not seize this opportunity, they might be lost forever. It was a chance such as they could scarcely have hoped for. "'Could we take our belongings with us?' said the sly old fox. "'All that can be piled on the rug,' said Shiraz. "'Then I will buy it,' said the sly old codger. "'I do not consider twenty pennies too much for such a rug. "'The rug is mine.' 
"'It's nothing of the sort,' said Aunt Amanda, waking from deep thought. "'Nobody's going to buy the rug. I'm captain of this expedition, and my orders is to wait and see what's going to happen next. I'm sorry, sir, but the rug ain't exactly what we want. You must show us something else.' The rug merchant appeared greatly mortified. "'I do not know how I could have made such a mistake,' he said. "'I should have known that these little trifles could not interest you. "'I trust you will believe that I meant no offense. "'I fear there is nothing in my poor collection which merits your notice. "'Permit me to wish you a safe journey. "'Do you intend to remain long in the City of Towers?' "'That won't do,' said Toby. "'You must show us something else.' The rug merchant looked intently at Aunt Amanda. "'You command it?' said he. "'I do,' said she. "'To hear is to obey,' said Shiraz. "'I tremble to think how contemptible are the baubles I shall now offer you, "'but I trust you will not be angry with your servant.' He turned to the young man and spoke to him in an unknown tongue. "'Be not offended, Excellencies,' he went on, "'by your poor servant's ignorance in the art of pleasing.' The young man disappeared behind one of the hanging rugs, and in a moment returned with certain small objects, which he stood upon the table in a row. They were eight hourglasses of a very ordinary kind, much like those already seen in the booth outside. The sand in each one was wholly in the upper glass, and was just beginning to trickle down into the lower. The strangers were obviously disappointed. "'I fear your displeasure,' said Shiraz, but apart from my trifling rugs, these are all I have to offer. And what, said the sly old fox, what may be the price of these interesting objects? The price, said Shiraz, fixing his beady eyes on Aunt Amanda, the price is this and nothing less. Your treasure on the mules outside, your share of the treasure on the mules. Everyone gasped. The treasure which they had gone through so many perils to secure for these indifferent trinkets? A life of ease and plenty for an hourglass? Ahem, said the old codger with a wooden leg. Excuse me for saying it, but the, er, uh, price appears to be a little bit high. It is too high for me, said the sly old fox positively. I regret to say it, but I am compelled to withdraw. I cannot go on at such a figure. Please consider me out of it. And, er, me too, said the old codger with a wooden leg. Well, said Toby, doubtfully, it's a blamed hard thing to give up all that treasure for one of these here little toys. I don't see my way clear to doing it. What do you say, Aunt Amanda? I'll do it, said Aunt Amanda, looking at Shiraz, whose eyes were still on her. I've come all this way to do it, and I'll do it. I ain't going to back out now at the last minute. My mind's made up. Mr. Shiraz, I'll buy an hourglass. Buy Cracky, said Toby. Then I will, too. What about you, Freddy? Oh, yes, indeed, said Freddy. I'll have one myself, said Mr. Punch. After due consideration, said the church warden, I think I will buy one also. Mr. Hanlon nodded a vigorous assent. The two old codgers, however were firm in their refusal. They could not be persuaded. They retired from the enterprise then and there. Under the conduct of the young man, the two old codgers left the room and returned to the committee who were waiting with the mules outside, and with them went Toby and Mr. Punch and Mr. Hanlon to bring back that portion of the treasure which was to pay for the six hourglasses. This was a work of much difficulty and occupied a great deal of time. While it was going on, the rug merchant, having first asked permission, reclined again on the divan and resumed his pipe, while Aunt Amanda, Freddy, and the church warden seated themselves at his invitation and watched him in silence. The treasure was at length piled, complete, in a corner of the room. Toby, Mr. Punch, and Mr. Hanlon returned for the last time, and without the great-great-grandson of the rug merchant. The others will wait outside for an hour, said Toby. If we don't come back by that time, they'll go on into the city without us. Shiraz the rug merchant laid down the stem of his pipe, 
and rising, bowed to Anna Amanda with great deference. "'Permit me, most gracious lady,' said he, "'to see the fingers of your left hand.' He took in his own right hand the third finger of Aunt Amanda's left, and bent his eyes close over it. He straightened himself up with a long breath, and crossing his arms upon his breast, made a low salam. "'It is as I thought,' said he. "'The mark is here, on the third finger of the left hand.' Highness, said he, bowing lower, I pray you accept your servant's salutation on your return, and raising her hand to his lips, he kissed it in a very courtly manner. Goodness alive, said Aunt Amanda, turning as red as a rose, you make me feel too foolish for anything. You have been away a long time, said Shiraz, but you have returned. Happy am I to be the first to greet you on your return. You and the others have all been enchanted. You are six enchanted souls, and in your present shapes not one of you is himself. I suppose you do not know that you are enchanted. You think that you are yourselves. Is it not so? I assure you it is a mistake, but I can put you in the way of correcting your errors and restoring yourselves to your true shapes, if you desire it. Madam, said he, bowing again to Aunt Amanda, I await your commands. I reckon we all want to be corrected, said Aunt Amanda. It's what we've come here for. We've come a long way to this island, and for nothing on earth but to be corrected, if there's any way to do it. If you can do it, go ahead. Hearing is obedience, said Shiraz. Please to take the hourglasses. Each one took up an hourglass from the table and held it in his hand. It is necessary, said Shiraz, to destroy the sands in the glasses. If they can be destroyed, the enchantment will be over. There is no power on earth which can destroy the sands but one, and that is the white fire of the preserver. Will you risk the fire? I will, said Aunt Amanda, now somewhat pale, and the others nodded assent. Then I will give you the white robes, said Shiraz, Without them, you cannot withstand the fire. He went to a wall and drew from behind the hangings a box, which he opened on the table. From this box he took six white linen gowns, and at his direction each put on one of the gowns. Freddy's was much too long, and he was obliged to hold it up. Well, said Toby, I always did look ridiculous in a nightgown, but this beats... Peace, said Jaraz. The fire will not harm you now. Two things only are necessary, to fear nothing and to hold tight to the hourglasses. With these words he clapped his hands, and from behind the hangings on the rear wall stepped a black man clad in a robe similar to the others. To this man the Persian spoke in some strange tongue, and the man bowed. Now, said Shiraz, you will follow my servant. Farewell. And peace be with you. End of chapter 22. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Chapter 23 of The Old Tobacco Shop. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Old Tobacco Shop by William Bowen. Chapter 23. From the Fire Back to the Frying Pan. The white-robed figures, having left the room by a small circular door behind the hangings, followed the black servant along a pitch-dark passage, and in a few moments came to a bridge, similar to the one they had crossed before. As they felt their way over it cautiously, one by one, the sound of rushing water came to them from below, and a cold breeze fanned their cheeks. A little further on they touched the first step of a stair, and began to ascend its worn stone treads. They mounted some thirty steps, and touching the wall with their hands, moved onward along a passage. This passage made an abrupt turn to the left, and when they had cleared the corner they saw in its sides before them a gleam of light here and there. The master's workrooms, said the black servant, pleased to follow. They passed now and then beneath a lighted window, too high to be seen through, and at the end of the passage the servant paused before a closed iron door. He opened this door with a key and led them forth. Before them was a garden, the most beautiful that any of them had ever seen. High over it was a dome of pale green and amber glass, 
through which the sunlight streamed in mild and party-coloured rays. The walls which supported the dome were so high that it was impossible to see beyond. In the centre was a fountain, dropping in a sparkling shower into a marble basin. Around it spread a well-ordered carpet of flowers, of all the colours, as it seemed, of the rainbow. Along the walls were cocoa palms, banana trees, and the feathery bamboo. White cockatoos sailed across from palm to palm. The air was heavy with a warm odour of moist earth and blossoms. The whole party drew a deep breath of pleasure. The dark place from which they had come seemed to fade away like a dream before the soft beauty of the garden. The servant led them to the opposite side and unlocked a door in the wall, making way for them to pass in before him. They entered and heard the door locked behind them. The servant was no longer with them. They were alone in a small square room of stone walls and an earthen floor. There was no opening, but in the opposite wall was a closed door. A pale light pervaded the place, from what source they could not discover. In the earthen floor, from wall to wall, grew a thicket of stiff stalks, higher than Freddy's head, and clustered closely around each stalk from bottom to top were flowers of a waxen whiteness. It seems a real pity, said Aunt Amanda, to break those pretty plants, but I reckon we've got to wade into them. I'm mighty curious to see what's on the other side of that door. Probably the fire the old man was talking about. Oh dear, I don't like fire, but we've got to get to that door, so come along. The whole party moved in a body into the thicket of waxen stalks. As they stepped in, the stalks broke around them with sharp reports. They moved on again, and the reports, as the stalks broke, became louder and louder. And now each one felt the hourglass in his hand being tugged at, and found that wherever his hand touched a flower, the petals flattened themselves on the hand and the glass, and clung so tight that it took a hard jerk to get them loose. There was danger of losing the glasses, and with one accord they held the glasses high above their heads. The moment they did so, the conduct of the stalks became terrifying indeed. As if in anger, the broken stalks spouted forth, with a hiss and a rush, blinding jets of liquid white fire, which tore at the ceiling angrily and roared and crackled. From the broken stalks it spread to the others, and in a moment jets of liquid white fire were blazing and crackling upward from all the stalks in the room, and the terrified captives were in the very midst of it. It ran up their robes and showered on them from the ceiling. It became denser and angrier. It was all but unbearable, though they felt it in only a tiny fraction of its real strength. In another instant the frail white gowns must surely be consumed, but in some strange way the gowns shed off the liquid fire and remained unscorched. For a moment the sufferers were stupefied. They were unable to move. Freddy tried to scream, but he could make no sound. He almost fainted away. But he felt, through it all, the sturdy arm of Mr. Toby tight about him. They pushed on in a close body and passed the centre of the room. The white glare became more blinding, the roar and crackle more deafening. They were surrounded, cut off, in the midst of destruction. They were bewildered. They stopped again. There was no use in going back. They must get forward through the furnace at any cost. They made a new start, and in a frenzy of terror, their hands before their eyes, with a rush, they gained the door. They crowded against it. They pushed and beat upon it. It gave way before them. They rushed through, and it closed behind them of its own accord. They were standing in broad daylight on the sidewalk of a city street, under a high blank wall, with shops on the opposite side, each with an hourglass, empty of sand, in his right hand, and each clad only in a long white nightgown. End of chapter 23「and in it was no sign of a door. They looked across the street. It was a narrow street, paved with cobblestones. On the opposite side, where a row of little low shops stretched away on either hand, a few people were going in and out at the doors, and a few others were walking at some distance before the shop windows. An ox cart was coming slowly down the street. 
Freddy had sometimes dreamed of being out among people in broad daylight in his nightgown, and he now felt the same terror he had felt in those dreams. He looked anxiously at the shops for a place in which to hide. No one appeared to observe them yet, but they would soon be seen, and it would be dreadful, unless they could find shelter without a moment's delay. "'We had better run into one of those shops,' said he, breathlessly, "'and ask them to hide us until we can get some clothes.' "'Ah, no,' said a soft voice beside him, at his right. "'It is not a shop that I must go to now. "'I must hurry home.' "'Freddy looked around at his right for Aunt Amanda. "'There was no Aunt Amanda. "'In her place, holding an empty hourglass in her right hand, "'was a lady, the fairest whom Freddy had ever seen. "'She was young. "'Her eyes were of the blue of summer skies. "'Her hair was golden yellow.' On her soft white cheek was a tinge of pink. Two heavy braids of hair hung almost to her knees. Her eyes were sparkling with happiness, and a tender and wistful smile curved her lips. As Freddy gazed at her, he thought that there could not be in the world another so radiantly beautiful. She looked about her as one who sees familiar things after a long absence. Freddy's eyes fell to the hand which was nearest him, her left, on the third finger of her left hand was a ruby ring. "'Are you,' he faltered, "'are you Aunt Amanda?' "'I think,' she said, smiling on him. "'I think I was, once. "'I think I can remember that name. "'And you are... "'Let me see. "'What was your name?' "'Ah, yes, your name was Freddy. "'But we must hurry. "'We must not keep them waiting.' Freddy turned and saw beside him four strange men, all gazing at the beautiful lady in amazement. In the right hand of each was an empty hourglass. Freddy looked down on the two men who stood nearest him. He looked down on them. He was suddenly aware that he was not looking up. They were short, for full-grown men, and of precisely the same height. Their faces were square, their cheekbones prominent, and their noses hooked. The head of one was bald, and the hair of the other's head lay flat down on his forehead where it curved back like a hairpin. Except for their heads, they were in all respects twins. There was no hump on the back of either of them. "'Mr. Punch and Mr. Toby,' said Freddy. "'The wary same,' said the bald-headed one. "'That's me,' said the other. Behind Mr. Toby stood a lean man in spectacles." His nightgown hung upon him very loosely, and he was very spare indeed. His smooth-shaven cheeks were somewhat hollow. His eyes behind his glasses were deep and solemn. His frame was the frame of one who subdues the flesh by fasting. Snow-white hair, curling inward at the back of his neck, made a kind of aureola around his thin face. He looked for all the world as he stood barefoot in his long white gown, like one of those saints you see in painted glass windows in a church. Is it? said Freddy, hesitating. Is it the church warden? I have reason to believe, said the saintly-looking man, that I have been known by that name. But I am in reality, and always have been, in reality, something far more lowly than a church warden. I am, and always have been, at heart, a meek and humble follower of the holy Thomas a Kempis, whose life of serene and cloistered sanctity I have always wished to imitate. Now that I am myself, it is my ambition to be known, if it is not too presumptuous to say so, as Thomas the Inferior, Pax Bobiscum. I ain't got the least idea what that means, said Toby, but anyway, it's the church warden's voice, whether he calls himself Thomas the Inferior or Daniel the Deleterious. You're heartily welcome, Warden, and I hope you won't mind my saying that a good meal wouldn't do you any harm from the looks of you. I'm pretty near starved to death myself. Mr. Punch, we've got rid of our humps, as sure as you're born. We're as straight in our bodies as we've always been in our minds, and that's as straight as a string." By cracky, I never felt so fine in my life. Blamed if I couldn't lick my weight in wildcats. I have no wish to do so, said Mr. Punch. I do not desire to engage in any conflict whatever. 
I should regard such conduct as wary reprehensible. Wary, but one cannot but admit, after one's back has been so long out of correct proportion, as one may say, that one enjoys a wary pronounced satisfaction when one feels one's self-restored to one's rightful position as a upright person, in common with one's fellow... "'What about Mr. Hanlon?' said Toby, turning around. "'Michael Hanlon! Present!' said a cheerful voice. Behind the inferior Thomas stood a tall and handsome man, the picture of an athlete in the prime of condition. Short curling black hair clustered on his head. His eyes were of a humorous dark blue. His cheeks were like red apples. His shoulders were muscular, his back was straight, his figure slim and he wore his nightgown as a Greek runner in ancient times might have worn his robe after the games. "'What?' said Freddy. "'Can you talk?' "'Faith,' said Mr. Hanlon, "'I've a tongue in me head that can wag with any that ever come off the Blarney Stone, and it's no lies, I'm telling ye. For an Irish gentleman to have to listen and listen, and keep his tongue still in his head, and say never a word at all, at all,' "'Tis a hard life, me friends, a hard life, "'and it's pleased I am to be meself at last, "'and the gnat bit a tongue doing his duty "'like a true son of Aaron. "'I could tell ye a sweet little story that comes to me mind "'of a dumb Irishman that could not spake at all, "'at all, and the deaf wife of him that could not hear, "'and their twelve pigs all lying down in the mud, "'with one of them standing up and crying out "'that the wolf was coming in through the gate.' and the good wife unable to hear, and the good man unable to speak. "'I reckon you've got your tongue all right,' said Toby. "'I wish we had time to hear that story, but we haven't. "'Now, Freddy, what do you think we'd better—' "'Why, Freddy, what's that you've got on your lip?' Freddy put his hand to his upper lip. What he felt there was a tiny silken mustache. He blushed. "'And he's taller than any of us except Mr. Anlin.' exclaimed Mr. Punch. My word! Freddy looked down at Mr. Punch and realized his own height. He looked at his hands, and they were almost as large as Mr. Hanlon's. His nightgown came to his ankles, and he realized that he was no longer holding it up. Why, he said, I must be grown up. Grown up is the word, said Toby, but I'd have known you anywhere. Twenty-one years old, I should say. Twenty-two, said Mr. Punch. Everyone now fell silent. The young and lovely lady, who had said nothing during their talk, was smiling from one to another. She seemed to feel no embarrassment nor concern, nor anything indeed but happiness. She looked at Toby with a smile, and all the men looked at her. Do you know me? she said to Toby. You are changed, said he, that's a fact. But I always knew that Aunt Amanda was like that, down deep inside of her. If she could only have looked like what she was, that's the way she would have looked, and I always knew it. I'm glad you've come to look like yourself at last. Ah, said the beautiful lady, I am glad you don't feel that I am strange to you. I know you all now, better than I have ever known you. You have been with me a long while, under disguise. I don't seem to remember very well what your disguises were, for I seem to have known you always as you are. My loyal knight, turning to Freddy. My bodyguard, turning to Mr. Toby and Mr. Punch. My confessor, turning to Thomas the inferior. And my courier, turning to Mr. Hanlon. In my exile you have been with me, and in my homecoming you shall be with me still. We hope to be with you always, said the tall young knight who used to be Freddy. But we are beginning to be noticed. I have seen one or two people stare from the shop windows. We had better hurry to one of those shops and seek refuge until we can find proper clothes. Ah, no, said the lady with a radiant smile. I must hasten home. They have been waiting a long time, and I must not lose a moment. I know the way. This street has changed since I was here, but I know it. I know the way. Come with me. I am going home. She placed her empty hourglass in Freddy's hands and led the way up the street. Her bare feet trod the pavement swiftly. She walked as if she had never known what it was to be lame. She went swimmingly with a motion of infinite grace. 
The others looked about them, uneasily, as they followed, but she seemed to care nothing for the eyes of the people. The ox-cart stopped as it came to them, and the driver who was walking beside it stopped also, and gazed at them with his mouth open. Faces appeared at shop windows as they went by, and figures appeared at shop doors. Two or three foot passengers passed them, and after they had gone, went to the nearest shop door and stood there for a moment in talk with the shopkeeper. Then they began to follow the strange white-clad group up the street. In a few moments others joined them. Freddy looked behind and wished to run, but the lady who was leading paid no attention. A little further on she turned a corner, and the party found themselves in a much busier street. The sidewalks were alive with people. In a moment there was a great silence. When the six figures first appeared, some of the people began to laugh. Then they looked at the face of the lady who swept along in advance of her attendants, and they laughed no more. They began to whisper one to another. They fell apart and made way for her and her attendants. They stopped. They forgot their own affairs. Some ran into the shops and called out the persons who were within. They gaped and whispered and nodded and held up their hands and with one accord began to follow. Further on, heads appeared from the windows of pleasure towers and pleasure domes. Doors opened. All who could walk joined themselves to the crowd which was following the wondrous lady and her five strange companions. Deeper and deeper into the city, on past the region of shops into the region of gardens and mansions, up by gradual ascent to the place of the largest and tallest towers and domes. On they went, the six white-gowned and barefooted figures before, and the crowd behind, and the further they went, the greater became the crowd, and still there was no sound from the people, except the sound of an awestruck whispering. The dark cloud on the mountain top was now plainly in view before them, between the towers and domes, and they could see the great mass of the king's tower, where it rose to the cloud and lost itself within it. At the end of the street, which they were now following, a majestic gateway could be seen, and beyond it, a park. Behind them, the street was choked from wall to wall with a vast multitude. From every house, as the multitude passed, its people poured forth and joined the throng. Business was forgotten. Shops and houses were deserted. It seemed as if the whole city was in the street, following the lady and her five attendants. She looked not behind her once. She seemed to be unaware of anything in the world about her. Her eyes shone like stars. She had forgotten even her companions. She spoke not a word, but looked forward to the stately gateway and the park beyond. Still no sound came from the multitude, except a sound of whispering. They reached the gateway. On each side was a great stone pillar, supporting a gate of massive bronze. The gates were open. Without an instant's hesitation she led the way within, and as she did so placed her left hand on her heart. The throng seemed to waver a moment, and then, as the six barefoot and white gowned figures moved swiftly up the driveway into the park, it flowed in silently between the gates, and followed at a respectful distance. Before them, at a distance, on a knoll from which terraces of velvet grass descended, stood the palace of the king, white and broad and flat-roofed. Passing a grove of trees, the lady left the roadway and stepped into the smooth grass of a lawn and sped across it directly towards the terraces, before the palace of the king. She mounted the gentle slope, her five friends following her, and the vast throng, filling the park to the gates, came on behind. She reached the first terrace, her hand was still on her heart, a dog barked. Windows in the palace front began to go up, and faces to appear. From an archway sprang a pack of beautiful, tall, white, curly-haired dogs, and rushed on the lady, barking. Freddy made as if to protect her, but she waved him back with a smile. The dogs sprang up as if to devour her, but they did no harm. They barked as if their throats would burst. They leaped and gambolled about her. They thrust their noses into her hand. They almost spoke, and in the midst of it there appeared upon the wide steps before the palace door a noble-looking man, and beside him three children. 
At sight of this man and the children, the lady covered her eyes for an instant with her hands and gave a sob. But she quickly looked up and sped on more swiftly than before, her hands hanging beside her and a bright, misty look in her eyes. The man upon the palace steps shaded his eyes with his hands and gazed upon her and the multitude spread out across the park behind her. One of the children, a tiny boy, he took by the hand, and another, a girl a little older, he grasped with his other hand. And with the third, a boy of something over nine, beside them, they all four came down the steps and crossed the terrace to meet the radiant lady. On the next terrace they met. He dropped his children's hands and stopped. He was a man of some thirty years, richly clad, and handsome beyond measure. As he stopped, the multitude found its voice. A mighty shout went up. Long live the king! Long live the king! He paid no attention. His eyes were on the fair lady before him. A cry from the oldest boy rang out clear and sharp in the silence. Mother! The king held out his arms. My darling! he cried. At last! At last! Beloved, she cried, and rushed into his arms and buried her face in his shoulder. The children clung to her, weeping, and with one arm she pressed them close against her side. The multitude found its voice again. Long live Queen Miranda! Long live Queen Miranda! End of chapter 24 Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona Chapter 25 of the Old Tobacco Shop. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. The Old Tobacco Shop by William Bowen. Chapter 25 The Old Man of the Mountain. There is an old man, said Robert to Freddy. He lives on the mountain. I saw him once. They were sitting on the palace lawn, looking up at the mountain which rose behind the king's tower. The sun was directly overhead, and was accordingly hidden by the cloud. The lower slopes of the mountain were easy and gradual, but they grew steeper as they ascended, and at the point where the mountain entered the cloud it was a straight and smooth wall of granite, plainly impossible to climb. The king's eldest child fixed his big eyes on the tall young man beside him. I like you, said he. I wish you would take me up the mountain some time for blackberries. Will you? If the queen permits, said Freddy, we will go tomorrow. A long time had passed since the queen's return. A happy time, during which the five who had come with the queen were made to feel as if they had lived all their lives in a palace. The two old codgers were found by Toby, comfortably established in a double shop of their own, on one side of which the old codger with the wooden leg sold tobacco, and on the other side of which the sly old fox sold jewelry, each of them entirely contented with his fortune, and settled down for life. The third vice-president had paid his respects at the palace, and was unable to talk of anything but his museum, for which he was devising many plans, including a method whereby the late Mr. Matthew Speak might be assured against ever being blown out of the window. The saintly person who had once been the church warden was occupied nowadays in a little room in the basement of the palace in copying in beautiful letters an ancient book belonging to the king. Mr. Punch and Mr. Toby spent their time in exploring the city, arm in arm, very inquisitive, very talkative, and making friends with everybody. Mr. Hanlon's work in life was, it appeared, the climbing of the king's tower, Every day he disappeared within, and every day he declared that he would mount to the top before he finished. But he had not yet got to the top, and there did not seem much prospect of his ever doing so. As for Freddy, not that he was called Freddy now, the king had given him a high-sounding name, the Chevalier Frederick, and by that name he was spoken of by everybody, except that Toby sometimes forgot and called him the Chandelier. As for the Chevalier Frederick, his interest was mainly in the Queen's three children, Robert, Genevieve, and James, and at the present moment the oldest, 
Robert, was sitting with the Chevalier on the palace lawn, gossiping. "'We will go tomorrow,' the Chevalier was saying. And then the little boy Robert went on about the old man he had seen on the mountain. "'I saw him once,' said Robert, just before Mother went away. I ran away from home, I did, and I was gone all day. Mother was terribly worried. I ran away to the mountain, and I was muddy all over when I got back, and it was dark, too. Mother was terribly worried. I was gone all day, I was, and I didn't get back until after dark. I didn't, and I was muddy all over. Oh, but it was dark. Mother, she was terribly worried. He stopped to think it over and then went on again. There wasn't any tower then. It was just before the old chap came and built the tower in a night. You know about that, don't you? I ran away and didn't come home until after dark. I didn't. Mother was worried. And Jenny, I never call her Genevieve because Jenny's shorter. And Jenny wouldn't go because she was afraid. And James was too little. So I went all by myself. And it was getting pretty dark. And I was starting home down the mountain because I knew Mother would be worried, and I saw the old man coming down the mountain, and he didn't see me, and he had a pack on his back and a long stick in his hand, and a gown belted in about the middle, and he was kind of fat and bald-headed, and he didn't see me, but I saw him, and pretty soon he went down into a gully, and I didn't see him any more, and I came on home, because it was getting dark, and I knew Mother would be worried. Then perhaps we had better not go up there, said Freddy. "'Oh, no,' said Robert. "'It's a grand place to climb and gather berries and flowers. "'And I'd like to see the old man again. "'Will you take me there today?' "'Tomorrow,' said Freddy, "'if the Queen will permit.' "'At this moment Mr. Hanlon appeared, "'somewhat out of breath, "'and he and Freddy went into the palace together. "'He was quite jubilant. "'Faith,' said he, "'tis a tower indeed, that tower, "'and a sweet little bit of a journey to the top of it.' if there's ever a top at all. But it's Michael Hanlon will do it, by the bones of St. Patrick, and don't ye forget what I'm telling ye, me boy. I've been up there this day, so high, so high. I'll never tell ye how high. It's coming better. Me wind and me legs are better. In a wake, or two wakes, tis meself will be fit for the grand ascent, and then there'll be news from the top, and a proud look in the eye of Michael Hanlon, Esquire. "'Wait and see, me boy.' "'The next morning, Queen Miranda having given her consent, "'Freddy and Robert left the palace for their day on the mountain. "'All day they wandered up the trails, and in the afternoon, "'when their luncheon was all gone and they were tired, "'they began to descend. "'It was growing dark. "'They had had a glorious day, and they were sorry it would soon be over. "'They stretched themselves on the ground beneath a mountain oak, "'and looked below them, past the tower, across the roof of the palace to the city. There was no living thing in sight, except a bird which sailed across their view and disappeared. "'Well, Robert,' said Freddy, "'I suppose the old man who used to be here is gone. Come, we must go. Your mother will be worried.' They got to their feet. As they did so, a kind of groan startled them. They listened. It came again, from some point nearby." Freddy thought he could make out a weak human voice, trying to call for help. Drawing Robert after him, he climbed over a number of boulders and mounted to the top of a rise in the ground, and looked down into a deep gully, covered on its sides with rocks and bushes. What he saw there gave him a start of alarm. At the bottom was an old man lying on his back, with one leg doubled under him, his face up to the sky. From his lips came a groan, followed by a faint cry for help. His head was bald, he was rather stout, he wore a long white beard, and he was clad in a short dark gown belted about the middle. His legs were bare, and on the foot, which was visible, he wore a sandal. Robert looked over Freddy's shoulder and whispered in his ear, "'That's him! He's fallen down and hurt himself!' It was true. The old man had evidently fallen, and he was plainly suffering." Freddy clambered down to him and knelt beside him. The old man looked into the young man's eyes and said in a feeble whisper, My leg, broken, help me home. Freddy assisted him into a sitting position and then lifted him up and held him. 
I cannot walk, said the old man. Unless you can carry me, I must die here. Freddy was properly proud of his new strength, and he believed that he could carry the old man. Where do you live? said he. Up the mountain. I will show you. I beg you to carry me home. I will do my best, said Freddy. He turned his back to the old man, and supporting him at the same time, put the old man's arms about his neck, and by a great effort got the poor creature on his back. Carrying him thus, he began to go haltingly up the side of the gully. The little boy watched him wonderingly. It was a terrible journey. The old man directed Freddy from moment to moment, and the way led steadily up the mountain, by a course which Freddy had not seen that day. The burden on Freddy's back became heavier and heavier. He panted harder and harder under it. He stumbled from time to time, and every instant told himself that he could go no further. The old man seemed to think of nothing but of getting home. The little boy followed, staring with big eyes. Freddy had gone but a short way up the mountainside, when he felt through all his back, where it touched the old man, a chill. His shoulders and throat, where the arms of the old man touched them, became cold. As he struggled on, the chill increased. He felt as if he were hugging to his back a burden of ice. "'Are we nearly there?' he asked, trying to wipe a cold perspiration from his forehead. "'No, no,' said the old man. "'Go on, a long way yet. You can't be tired so soon.' The cold upon Freddy's back and shoulders and throat became a dead numbness. He was too cold to shiver. His arms, too, were now becoming numb, and he felt that he could hold his burden no longer. He stopped. "'I must put you down,' he said. "'I must rest a moment. I don't know what makes me so cold.' "'No, no,' said the old man. "'Too soon, too soon. Keep on.' "'I cannot,' said Freddy. I am freezing. My strength is gone. I must rest. With these words he let the old man carefully down and laid him on the ground. He stood there panting and rubbing his frozen hands together. Stupid weakling, said the old man, staring up at him. Go and search upon the mountainside and bring me hither seeds of the fennel, which you will there find, and be quick, for I perish. Freddy and the little boy hastened away together and at a distance on the mountainside found, after a long search, a few plants of the fennel, with which they hurried back to the old man. He was gone. They looked far and near. They examined every nook and cranny. The mountain was steep at this point, and difficult for any sound man. For an old man, crippled, it seemed impossible, but he was nowhere to be found. He was gone. Freddy and Robert turned homeward, and made hard work of it. The little boy became extremely heated with his labor, but Freddy remained as cold as ever. It is true that he perspired, but the beads upon his forehead were like the beads upon ice-cold glass. His hands were so numb that when he cut them slightly on a rock he felt no pain. His back, where the old man had clung to it with his body, was coldest of all. He was so stiff that he could scarcely bend his arms or body. Many times the little boy had to help him down. The chill spread. At the foot of the mountain his legs were nearly as cold as his arms. When they passed the tower his knees were as if frozen and would not bend. The little boy put his arm about him and tried to help him walk. He began to lose knowledge of his whereabouts. He held out a stiff arm before him like a blind man and dragged one foot after the other like a man whose legs are made of stone. The little boy, weeping to himself, took his icy outstretched hand and led him home. The palace door was thrown open. The little boy rushed in with a cry and turned around to his companion. The white-faced, rigid creature which was Freddy stood in the doorway, staring vacantly, and fell slowly forward on its face upon the floor. End of chapter 25, recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Chapter 26 of The Old Tobacco Shop. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. The Old Tobacco Shop by William Bowen. Chapter 26. The King's Tower. Freddy was very ill. He was so ill that after a week the king gave up all hope and believed he would die. The queen wept bitterly. She scarcely left his side. At night she did not sleep for weeping, and by day she sat by his bed and watched his cold white face. His friends were not allowed to see him, and of these it appeared that Mr. Hanlon had been gone for some days of the tower. All that the best doctors in the city could do had been done, but the chevalier was no better. He lay under the blankets, cold as ice and motionless as stone, and his eyes, big, round eyes, like the eyes of a child, stared up strangely out of deep sockets. They looked up at the king, who was bending down over the bed and smiling encouragingly. The queen and her three children, Robert, Genevieve, and James, were standing close by, but they could not smile. "'Come, Chevalier,' said the king. "'You will be well soon, I am sure.' A faint voice came from the pale lips. Not the voice of a grown man, but the voice of a child. "'That isn't my name,' it said. "'My name is... Freddy.' The king went away and took his children with him, and after they had gone the queen heard the childish voice again from the bed. "'I want to see Aunt Amanda.' The queen went to him, and stood beside the bed. He looked up at her. "'You aren't Aunt Amanda,' he said. "'I want to see Aunt Amanda.' "'I think that was my name once,' said the queen. "'Will you talk to me?' He looked at her again, and she saw that he did not know her. "'My father sent me,' he said. "'Mr. Toby has gone to the barber shop, "'and my father he wants a pound of cage roach Michener. "'Mr. Toby is here in the palace now.' and I'm sure he... I don't know about any palace. I can't wait long. My father told me to hurry. The queen said no more, and Freddy appeared to go to sleep. The night came on, and the queen still sat by his side. It grew very late. Her children had long since gone to bed, and even the king was asleep in his own apartments. The palace was silent, and there was scarcely a light anywhere in the great palace except the light of a taper on a table in Freddy's room. The queen was bending forward, watching the face on the pillow. The eyes were closed, the lips were together, and there was no sign of breathing. She knew that it could not be much longer. She buried her face in her hands and wept bitterly. A gentle tap upon the door aroused her. She rose and admitted Mr. Toby and Mr. Punch, Thomas the Inferior, and Mr. Hanlon. Quick, ma'am, said Mr. Hanlon, there's not a minute to be lost. If you please, I'll ask ye to put on your bonnet in a hurry, ma'am. We're off on a journey, and the poor sick young lad's coming along with us. If you'll just be in a hurry with the bonnet, ma'am. The queen, scarcely realizing what she was doing, left the room and went first to the nursery, where she bent over her three sleeping children and kissed them each and murmured a loving good-bye above them, as if she were going to leave them, and for a long, long time she gazed at each rosy face, as if to fix it in her memory forever. When she returned to the room, wearing a shawl over her head and shoulders, she was startled to see that the sick youth was sitting upright in a chair, thickly wrapped in blankets. His round, childlike eyes were wide open, and to her surprise a faint smile seemed to hover about his lips. She looked at the others, each held in his hand an empty hourglass. "'Please to get your hourglass, ma'am,' said Mr. Hanlon, "'and Freddy's, too.' Freddy's hourglass was soon found in a drawer in the same room, the queen's she brought in a moment from another room. Mr. Hanlon picked up from the floor where he had previously laid it a small canvas bag and placed it on the table under the candle. All of the empty hourglasses he placed upon the table— and unscrewed the part of each by which it was designed to receive its load of sand. He lifted his bag, and out of it poured into each glass a quantity of fine white sand. A little more or less won't matter a mite, said he, when he had filled them all. A fine time I've had getting the sand, to sure, but it's the true article, straight from the hand of the old creature himself, 
and tis him we're going to this very minute, and the young lad with us. By the sand in the hourglasses we'll get back to the old creature in one-tenth the time it took me to find him without it, and by the same we'll get him to save for us the poor lad's life, or me name's not Michael. Each now took his hourglass in his hand. They were the same hourglasses they had bought of Shiraz the Persian, and the sand which was now in them was the same sort of fine white sand which had been in them before their ordeal in the fire. Mr. Punch and Mr. Toby lifted the sick youth from his chair and carried him between them in a sitting position towards the door. Mr. Hanlon looked at him anxiously and commanded haste. In a moment the whole party were in the hall, and in a few moments more they were crossing the lawn towards King's Tower. It was a clear night, and the sky was spangled with stars. Mr. Hanlon opened the door of the tower, and when they were all within, closed it again. "'Madam and gentlemen,' said he, "'we are going to the top of the tower. I have been there myself, and there's one at the top who can bring back our young friend to life if he's a mind to do it. Oh, gasped the queen in terror, I must not go to the top of this tower. Ah, she stopped suddenly and went on in a determined voice. I will, though. If it is to be, then it must be. Our young chevalier came here for me, and I will go with him. If my strength holds out, I will go even to the top of the tower, whatever evil may befall me there. Tis not strength that's needed, madame, said Mr. Hanlon for the old creature that gave me the sand was willing to help us up to him, and the sand will make the traveling easy, or else the old haven has much deceived me. T'was all I could do to get to the top, believe me, and ye'd never do it without the sand in the glasses, let alone carry up the young lad in your arms besides. Now, we'll be going up the stairs, and if the old creature didn't deceive me, you're to hold your hourglasses in your hands and see what happens." Mr. Hanlon went up first, then came the Queen, and after her Mr. Punch and Mr. Toby, bearing between them in an upright position the stiff, cold form of the young Chevalier, and last of all came Thomas the Inferior, in his long brown gown and sandals. Each climbed slowly, but the steps appeared to flow downward under their feet with great rapidity. They were not conscious of selecting any particular tread to step on, but while a foot was rising from one step to the next, it seemed as if a thousand steps were passing downward, until the foot came down and found itself on a perfectly motionless tread. Undoubtedly they were mounting, without unusual exertion, a thousand steps at a time. Even at that rate of progress, the journey upward seemed an endless one. They paused sometimes to go into one of the rooms on a landing for a moment's rest, and at those times they looked out of a window. It was not long before they were so high that on looking out, the city's lights were no more than a glowing blur. At the last window on their upward progress, they looked up at the cloud. It was immediately above their heads. After that there were no more windows. They went on upward in silence, aware in the darkness of the swift flow of steps downward under them as they raised their feet. Each observed that as he raised his foot, the sand in his hourglass flowed downward a thousand times more rapidly, as if time were suddenly running faster than it was used to running. The walls of the tower were by this time coming closer together, and the stair was even steeper than before. They were panting for breath, and Mr. Punch and Mr. Toby seemed to be all but exhausted. "'We are almost at the top,' said Mr. Hamlin. "'Keep on. Don't give up.' It was now, because there were no more rooms nor windows, completely dark. The face of the sick youth could not be seen, and no one knew whether he was still living. Even the sand in their hourglasses they were now unable to see. "'We are almost there,' said Mr. Hanlon. "'Only another minute or two. "'Tis easy work to what I had in coming up alone.' Mr. Punch gave a groan. "'I can't go another step,' said he. I'm completely... At this moment Mr. Hanlon stopped upon a landing. It had been a long while since there had been a landing, and they were all glad to rest upon it. They crowded about Mr. Hanlon in the dark. The door is over there, said he. Keep close to me. He walked a few feet forward across the level floor and came to a stop again. 
"'Tis the top of the tower,' said he. "'I hope we're not too late to save the young lad's life. "'Stand close behind me.' He moved forward again and stopped. He was evidently feeling the wall with his hands. "'Ah,' said he, "'tis the door itself. "'Now, then, we'll see.' He knocked upon the door with his knuckles. There was no response. He knocked again. There was a sound upon the other side of the door, as of the rattling of a chain and the sliding of a bolt. A slit of light appeared up and down in the dark wall. It became wider. It was apparent that the door was opening. And in another moment the door was flung wide, and in the doorway stood an old man, holding up in his right hand a lantern, in which glimmered a candle. End of chapter 26 Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona Chapter 27 of The Old Tobacco Shop This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. The Old Tobacco Shop by William Bowen. Chapter 27. The Sorcerer's Den. He was an old man, rather stout, dressed in a short gown tied in with a cord about the middle, and wearing sandals on his feet. He stooped somewhat. A white beard hung to his waist. His head was bald, except for a forelock of white hair which drooped over his forehead towards his eyes. There was a humorous twinkle in his eye, and a smile overspread his broad, brown face. "'Tis the old party who will cure the chevalier,' said Mr. Hanlon, behind his hand. "'It's the old man of the mountain,' whispered Toby. "'It's the magician who built the tower,' whispered Queen Miranda, in alarm. "'It's me own father, as ever was,' cried Mr. Punch, aloud. "'Greetings, old dear,' "'Here's a surprise. What? However did you come here? "'I'm snowing glad to see you, and the last person I should have thought to see in this. "'My word! What a lark!' "'Come in, Punch,' said the old gentleman affably, "'and your friends, too. I'm very glad to see you, my boy. "'I've had some trouble in getting you here, but here you are at last, "'thanks to my good friend Hanlon, and you are now well out of the hands of Shiraz.' Put the little boy down in that chair, and we'll see what we can do for him. To speak of a grown youth with a mustache as a little boy seemed hardly respectful, but Freddy did not seem to mind it. Indeed, his big, round, childlike eyes dwelt fondly on the old man, and there was something like a smile about his lips. He was seated gently in a chair within the room, and while Mr. Punch's father set down his lantern on a table, the others looked about them. They were in a small square room with a low ceiling. By the dim light of the candle they could see that it was bare and dusty. Cobwebs hung in all the corners. There seemed to be no windows, but set upright in one wall was what looked like the back of a clock, as tall as a man. Opposite the door by which they had entered was another door. Around the walls were shelves, from floor to ceiling, crowded with hourglasses of all sizes. The old gentleman observed the look which Toby cast at the shelves. "'One of my storerooms,' said he. "'I've got a good many of them, all told. "'And, in fact, you'll find a storeroom of mine "'in the top of nearly every clock tower in the world. "'It takes a deal of space to keep all the hourglasses in, I can tell you. "'If you'll give me yours, I'll put them away for you. "'Shiraz got them away from me once, but he won't do it again. "'He manages to steal one now and then, when I'm away.' but I usually get him back, sooner or later. He collected the hourglasses from his visitors and put them away on a shelf. Look here, parent, said Mr. Punch. If I didn't know better, I'd say as I'd seen this room before. There's the back of the clock, and the door over there looks like... You've a sharp eye, Punch, my boy, said the old gentleman. Quite a detective you are, my son. Now then, we'd better get busy. Aunt Amanda... Do you want me to cast off your enchantment? Why do you call me that? asked Queen Miranda. Because that's your name. Don't you know who you are? I know I was enchanted once under the name of Aunt Amanda. No, no. 
You're enchanted now, under the name of Queen Miranda. But Shiraz, the Persian, told us he would disenchant us, and he did. No, no, you were yourselves before, and now you are enchanted. My brain is in a whirl, said Queen Miranda. Are we ourselves now, or were we ourselves before? By cracky, said Toby, it's too much for me, and I give it up. Anyway, what we want to know is, can you cure the chevalier? I can and I will, said the old man. There's nothing the matter with him except that he isn't himself. As soon as he's himself again, he'll be well. He was given the chance once before, but he didn't know how to use it. He made a great mistake. What mistake, said Toby? He made the mistake of carrying the old man of the mountain on his back. If he had only lifted him up in his arms before him, the old man would have been as light as a feather, and Freddy would have been himself again in a flash. But of course he didn't know. We've got to correct his mistake. Well, by cricket, said Toby, this is Correction Island, right enough. Blamed if I know which is the mistake and which is the correction. It looks to me as if it was a mistake to be corrected, and we've got to correct the correction back again. Something like that, said the old man, smiling. I'm going to undo the correction of each one of you, and then you'll all be yourselves once more, instead of these false things you are now. Queen Miranda looked at the ruby ring on her finger, and wept quietly to herself. As for Freddy, his eyes never left the face of the old man. The old man stooped over Freddy, and laid his cheek against the young chevalier's pale forehead, and then against the young man's cheeks. He then threw aside the blankets and sat himself down on Freddy's knees. His body pressed the young man's breast, and his cheek touched the young man's cheeks one after the other. It was some moments before there was any change. The others watched anxiously. A red glow began to appear in Freddy's cheeks, and his eyes became brighter. He raised his hands. He moved his head. He looked about him. He smiled into the face of the old man. "'You are better?' said the old man. "'I'm very well,' said Freddy, in a clear voice. "'But I think I must have been sick. "'Have I been sick?' "'Rather,' said the old man. "'But you are going to be yourself again in another minute. "'Now, then, put your arms around me and lift me off. "'Can you do that?' "'Easily,' said Freddy, "'and he lifted the old man in his arms, "'and rising to his feet at the same time, "'tossed the old man off with an easy gesture. "'As the old man touched the floor, "'there was no longer any chevalier. "'Freddy was standing before the chair in his own person. "'The little boy once more, "'with sparkling eyes and rosy cheeks. "'He looked around in surprise. "'Where are Aunt Amanda and the others?' said the little boy. "'Wait just a minute, Freddy,' said the old man. "'Now, madam,' he said to Queen Miranda, if you will be kind enough to lift me up and toss me away. Queen Miranda looked at him doubtfully. He was a solid-looking person, and it seemed absurd to think of lifting him. But she did as he directed, and placing her hands under his arms, she found that he weighed no more than a baby. She held him up off the floor. Now cast me off, said he. She tossed him away with an easy gesture, and he alighted on his feet with a bound. "'Aunt Amanda!' cried Freddy, and rushed into her arms. "'Land sakes!' said she. "'I thought you were never coming. "'Where are all the others? "'I'm glad there's nobody but this old man to see me in this bedraggled bonnet. "'Why don't that Toby Littleback come? "'Now ain't it like him to keep me waiting here all night? "'I never see such an exasperating. "'Wait just one moment, Aunt Amanda,' said the old man. "'I'll have him here immediately.' He stood before Toby and directed him what to do. Toby seized him in his strong hands and lifted him up over his head like a feather pillow. And such a toss did Toby give him as sent him flying across the room, almost to the wall. The old man came down on his feet with a bound. "'You, Toby Littleback,' said Aunt Amanda, "'ain't it just like you to keep me and Freddy waiting here all night while—' "'And where's Mr. Punch and all the rest of them?' Toby stood before her, with his hands in his pockets. His hump was on his back in its rightful place, and he looked exactly as he had looked the first time Freddy had seen him, standing in the doorway of the old tobacco shop. 
"'I ain't been nowhere, Aunt Amanda,' said Toby. "'And I don't know where Mr. Punch is, neither. "'I ain't his guardian, anyway. "'The last I seen of him, as far as I remember, "'was in Shiraz's garden, looking round at the flowers. "'By cracky, if he can't take care of himself, "'I ain't a-goin' to do it for him. "'Maybe the old gentleman here can tell you, if you want to know.' "'Wait just a moment,' said the old man. "'I'll have him here immediately.' Mr. Punch laughed immoderately as he picked up his own father and tossed him in the air and hurled him across the room. The old man did not seem to mind it a bit, but joined in the laugh as he came down on his feet with a bounce. Mr. Punch was immediately himself again. His hump was on his back, his breath stuck out, his long-tailed coat and knee breeches were as before, and he looked as if he might just have stepped down from his wooden box beside the tobacco shop's door. "'Wery glad,' said he, "'to make your acquaintance with me, old parent, "'and a wery good parent, too, if—' "'That's enough, Punch,' said his father. "'Now we'll bring on the church warden.' "'In another moment the thin and saintly-looking Thomas the inferior was gone, "'and in his place was the fat and comfortable church warden, "'blinking at his friends through his round spectacles. "'I have been considering,' said he, "'that it would be highly desirable—' after all I have passed through lately, to sit in my chair on the pavement against the wall of my church with a pipe and a newspaper, and I have concluded that... We will now call Mr. Hamlin, said the old man. From the time Mr. Hamlin placed his hands under the old man's arms, his tongue was rattling on at a prodigious speed, and as he tossed the old man lightly away like a doll, he was saying... And never once did the speechless man and the deaf wife have any words except once, and twas then that. But he spoke no more. He was himself again. He was dumb. Toby greeted him warmly, but he only nodded his head vigorously, and smiled his old time cheerful smile. That's all, said the old man. But the tool codgers, began Toby. They will not be here, said the old man. No use waiting. They made their choice some time ago. They are as much themselves now as they ever were, and they will remain where they are in perfect contentment. No need to bother about them. All that remains now is to bid you farewell, and wish you a pleasant journey. Have we far to go? said Toby. You'll see, said the old gentleman, going to the door that was opposite the one by which they had entered, and throwing it open. He stood aside as they passed, and smiled upon each with a kind and fatherly smile. He placed his hand on Freddy's head, and turned the little boy's face up so that he could look down into his eyes. Remember, he said, never carry the old man of the mountain on your back. Carry him before you in your hands, and he will be as light as a feather. Now farewell. He gently pushed them out and closed the door behind them, and they went slowly down a dark stair. Toby held Freddy's hand, and Mr. Punch helped Aunt Amanda. They could see very little, and they knew very little where they were, until they found themselves, after a time, on a level floor, and feeling the wall with their hands came to a pair of swinging doors. Through these doors they passed, and Toby knocked his knee against something in the dark. "'It's a long bench,' said Toby, "'and here's a side of other long benches. Blamed if they don't seem like pews in a church!' A dim light, as of tall windows, was visible at some distance on their left. The church warden pushed forward and walked swiftly here and there, with the step of one who knows the way. In a moment he returned. "'It's a church,' he said calmly. "'It's my church. This way, madam and gentlemen.' He led the way to the left. Under a great round window, which could be dimly seen in the wall, was a wide door, before which they all paused. As captain of this party, said Aunt Amanda, my orders is that we open the door and see what will happen next. Aye, aye, ma'am, said the church warden, and opened the door. In a moment they were standing under the stars on a brick pavement before a church, and on the pavement against the church wall was an empty chair. Ah, said the church warden, and sat down in the chair. Mercy on us, cried Aunt Amanda. We're home. "'Blamed if we ain't,' said Toby. "'It's our own street, and I can almost see the tobacco shop from here.' 
After a life of adventure, said Mr. Punch, one will find it very pleasant to stand quietly on one's little perch at rest one's legs, and see one's old friends go in and out at the old tobacco shop once more, watching for the ends of the clock to come together for a bit of relaxation with one's... All right, young feller, cried Toby to Freddy. Come with me. Mr. Punch, take Aunt Amanda home. I'll be with you as soon as I've got Freddy safe. Aunt Amanda and Mr. Punch went off together towards the old tobacco shop. Mr. Hanlon, after shaking hands all around, departed for the Gaunt Street Theater, where he would be no longer troubled by the imps, who had long since been destroyed by the odor of sanctity. The church warden preferred to enjoy for a while the comfort of his old chair by the church wall, and Toby and Freddy left him there, his hands folded placidly across his stomach. Freddy and Toby crossed the streetcar track, hand in hand together. The horse had gone to bed for the night, and there was no danger. All the houses were dark. It was very late. No light was to be seen anywhere, except a gas lamp at the next corner. The streets were silent and deserted. Freddy yawned. Freddy's house was dark, like all the rest. A narrow brick passageway followed a fence to the rear, between this house and the next and a gate opened from the sidewalk into this passage. Freddy and Toby went through this gate and crept quietly to the backyard of Freddy's house. The kitchen door was locked, but Toby found a window which was unfastened. He raised it noiselessly and helped Freddy to climb in. With a whispered good night, the little boy left his friend and tiptoed into the house and up the back stairs in the dark to his own room. His bed was there in its old place, and the covers were turned down. He did not stop to say his prayers. He yawned and stretched his arms. He wanted nothing now but to lie snug and safe under the cool sheets. He threw off his clothes and left them on the floor. He knew where his nightgown was. He crept into bed. He pulled the covers up to his ears. He nestled his head into the pillow and breathed a deep sigh. End of chapter 27 Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen Gilbert, Arizona. Chapter 28 of the Old Tobacco Shop. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. The Old Tobacco Shop by William Bowen. Chapter 28. THE OLD TOBACCO SHOP The next morning, when Freddy awoke, his mother and father were standing over his bed. "'I think he had better not go there any more,' his father was saying. "'Oh, I don't think it will do him any harm now,' said his mother. "'It all comes of his staying away so long,' said his father. "'I always told him to hurry back, and just see how long he stayed this time. "'If he can't come back in less than six months, or six years, or heaven knows how long,' He'd better not go at all. Oh, said his mother, I'm sure he'll come back promptly after this. I couldn't, said Freddy. It took such a long time to get to the island, and there was all the trouble with the pirates, and it was a terrible long journey before we got to the palace, and of course we couldn't run away from the queen after we'd gone all that long way with her, and the queen's children didn't want me to go anyway, and there wasn't any way to get back, except for finding out how to get to the top of the tower, and maybe I wouldn't have got back at all if I hadn't met the old man of the mountain, and got sick and cured again by Mr. Punch's father, and I might have got drowned when the ship disappeared, or I might have had my head cut off by the pirates, and then you wouldn't have seen me any more, and you'd have been sorry. His father looked at his mother and nodded his head. He'd better stay in bed today, said he. We won't talk to him about it until tomorrow. Yes, said his mother, that will be much better. Poor little Freddy. Freddy did not know why he should be called poor, but he was still tired from the adventurous life he had recently lived, and he was very glad to remain in bed all day. The next morning, after his father had said goodbye for the day, his mother allowed him to get up, and a little later to go out into the sunshine. He strolled down the street, enjoying the familiar sights after his long absence. He found his legs a little weak, 
He must have been very ill indeed at the king's palace, and he could not expect to get over it in one day. He crossed the streetcar track, and on the pavement before the church he saw a well-known figure. The church warden was sitting in his chair, tilted back against the wall, smoking a long pipe and reading a newspaper. As Freddy approached, he put down his paper and looked at him over his spectacles. "'Good morning,' said he. "'I'm glad to see you back again. I hear you've been away.' And he winked his eye at Freddy in a very knowing manner. "'Yes, sir,' said Freddy. "'I guess I must have been pretty sick.' "'No doubt about it, my son. "'But, of course, I knew all the time you'd pull through.' "'Freddy did not believe it for a moment. "'Obviously the church warden was bragging. "'The street looks pretty good,' said Freddy, "'after being away so long. "'Would you rather sit here on the pavement than do anything else?' "'I believe you, son. "'I'd rather sit here on a sunny day with a pipe and a newspaper "'than have all the treasure of the Incas.' Freda was glad to hear that the church warden did not regret the loss of his share of the treasure, though whether Captain Lingo belonged to the Incas he did not know. "'I don't care anything about the treasure myself,' said he. "'I'm too glad to be well again and back in our own street.' "'I'm glad I'm here myself, son, and if you happen to see Toby Little back this morning, tell him I'm alive and resting well, considering.' "'Yes, sir,' said Freddy, and continued his stroll." The old tobacco shop, when he arrived, looked as it had looked on the fateful day when he had last seen it. He paused before the door and gazed at Mr. Punch. He half expected the little man to step down and shake hands with him, but Mr. Punch did not move a muscle. He did not even look at Freddy. He held out in one hand a packet of black cigars, and his wooden face, if it expressed anything at all, showed the great calm he must have felt when he got back to his little perch. Freddy looked up at the clock in the tower, with some thought that the hands might be together. But it was a quarter past ten, and anyway Mr. Punch's father was probably by this time far away in some other of his storerooms about the world. Freddy entered the shop. Mr. Toby was behind the counter, opening a package of tobacco. "'Aha, young feller!' he cried. "'Back again, sure enough. "'Blamed if it don't seem as if you'd been away from here for a year. "'And a mighty sick chap you were, that's a fact. "'I reckon we all thought you were going to die, maybe. "'By cracky, I never seen anyone so pale in my life. "'Are you all right now?' "'Yes, sir,' said Freddy, "'and I'm glad to be back. "'Are you glad to be here in the shop, the same as ever?' "'Me? You bet I am. "'You couldn't buy me to leave this shop.' "'not if you offered me all the money that Captain Kidd ever buried. "'No, sir. "'And look here, young man. "'I reckon you ain't surprised to see that the Chinaman's head is gone, eh?' "'Freddy looked at the shelf behind Toby, "'and sure enough, the Chinaman's head was gone. "'He knew, of course, that it was lying at the bottom of the ocean. "'I kind of lost it one day,' said Toby, winking his eye. "'Mislaid it, you know, or lost it. "'One or the other. I don't know which.' But, anyway, I reckon it won't never be found. It's gone. I hope you don't mind it now, do you? No, sir, said Freddy. He was glad to know that Mr. Toby was not still feeling disturbed because he had left it on board the sieve. All right, then, said Toby. You'd better go in and see Aunt Amanda. Freddy opened the door at the rear of the shop and went into the back room. Aunt Amanda was sitting by the table, sewing. On the table were the wax flowers in the album and the double glasses through which you looked at the twin pictures. The room was just as if they had never left it. "'Is you all right?' said Aunt Amanda, taking a handful of pins from her mouth. "'Bless your dear little heart. I'm glad you're back again. Are you well? Sit down on the hassock.' Freddy took his customary place on the hassock at her feet. He looked up at her and wondered if she were sorry she had been a queen once and was a queen no more. Yes, am said he. I'm all well now. And glad to be back here in the shop again? Yes, am I certainly am. Ah, yes, said Aunt Amanda. There's no place like the old tobacco shop, after all. I wouldn't exchange it for a palace if you'd give it to me. Wouldn't you? said Freddy, a little surprised at this. 
I should say not. I wouldn't be myself in a palace. I'm pretty well satisfied here. But what about the children, said Freddy. The children? asked Aunt Amanda. Yes, Robert and Jenny and James. You know. Aunt Amanda looked at him for a moment and then nodded her head and sighed. Yes, she said. You know about them, don't you? I forgot that you knew. Yes, I miss them a good deal, and I suppose I even cry sometimes because I haven't got them. But I love to think about them. I'm happy thinking about them, even if I can't have them. James was the littlest, said Freddy. Yes, said Aunt Amanda, nodding her head to herself as if at a gentle memory. He was too little to go out much with the others, said Freddy. Yes, said Aunt Amanda. He was too little. And Jenny, said Freddy, she wouldn't go with Robert the day he ran away. He wanted her to, but she wouldn't. No, said Aunt Amanda, she wouldn't. He was gone all day, said Freddy. Yes, said Aunt Amanda. He was gone all day, and he didn't get back until after dark. I didn't know where he was. When he got back, it was dark and he was muddy all over. I was terribly worried. End of chapter 28 Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona End of the Old Tobacco Shop by William Bowen